Good morning. The programme will begin in three minutes. Please take your seats now and silence all personal electronic devices. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, will you please take your seats as the keynote session is about to commence. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Titus. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jason, and I lead the developer product group at Google. I'm so excited to be here with all of you at Google Developer Days Europe. This region is an amazing one for technology, with startup hubs blossoming across the continent from London to Paris, to Berlin and Warsaw. The talent here is incredible. In fact, a few years ago, when I was the CEO at Shazam in London, we would hire from across the continent. Some of our best developers came from Spain and Greece, from Germany and Lithuania, and Poland. And fast forward to today, and Europe has more developers than the United States and Canada combined. <laughs> Which is why it's really exciting to have Google Developer Days here so that we can meet and work with all of you. We want to give you what you need to turn your ideas into reality, whether you're building a mobile app or using new technologies like AR or machine learning. We want to enable you to focus on the problems you're trying to solve and minimize the pain points of building a product. And in addition to building products to help you succeed, we're also working on building out trainings to deepen your technical, technical capabilities year round. Today, I'm happy to share that we've opened our mobile web certification that will enable you to further expand your web skills. And on the ground, our team is working in over 130 countries. And within Europe, we've reached over 185,000 developers just this year through local events and programs. 
We have in Europe over 200 developer experts, many of whom are in this room today, who are sharing their expertise, and we're continuing to expand the developer ecosystem through programs such as Women Tech Makers, the Google Developer Agency program, and our Google Developer Groups. Last year, we started our Launchpad Accelerator program, which connects top startups with mentors and brings them to Silicon Valley to meet with Google product leads. In our fourth class, we had our first startup from Poland. These three entrepreneurs recognized the need to provide therapy for, at scale for autistic children. In response, they created Dr. Omnibus, an app-based learning platform that provides games for children with special education needs. The game allows students to learn behavior patterns and responses to real-life scenarios, and their teachers and therapists can review their progress. The best part is that students can play these games on their own, allowing them to get therapy every day, rather than once a week, which makes an incredible impact long term. This is just one of many stories of how the European development community is making a big impact. Now I'd like to bring up some of my colleagues to share updates across our developer platforms. And let's start with how we're making the Android development process easier. Please welcome Dan. Thank you, Jason. It is the best time ever to be an Android developer. Now, I've been developing for Android for almost nine years, and I've spent seven of those years at Google, but I've never seen anything like what we have now, this incredible confluence of meaningful developer changes. We're seeing ever more powerful tooling, a clear path forward for app design, a new programming language, and fundamental improvements to the distribution model. And much of this change derives from listening to all of you in the developer community. And all of this is happening amidst the incredible momentum that Android continues to have. I mean, we're seeing 2 billion active devices on Android and 82 billion apps installed from play. And what's even more amazing is how this momentum is making so many developers successful. The number of developers with over a million installs grew 35% in the past year. Now, to leverage this distribution to build great businesses, we expanded direct carrier billing to reach 900 million devices with over 140 operators. And altogether, the number of people buying on Play grew by almost 30% this past year. But that's not enough. We know that we can make distribution even better by removing the friction from app installs and making the entire experience more dynamic. So Instant Apps is one of our big bets in bringing more users to your apps, and our early partners are seeing great results. OneFootball, based in Berlin, saw that the number of users who read news and shared content increased 55% in their Instant App, while Vimeo increased their session durations by 130%. Jet found that the conversion rate in their shopping app increased by 27%, and there are many more stories like these. At I.O., we opened up Android Instant Apps to all Android developers, which means anyone can now build and publish an Instant App. Since then, we've made Instant Apps available to more than 500 million Android devices across countries where Google Play operates. Your Instant App is downloaded as needed, feature by feature, and you enable this by organizing your project into feature modules. And then you can use that exact same code in both your Instant App and your installable app. We're easing the process of refactoring your app into these feature modules by using the new Modularize refactoring action. And Modularize helps you move code and resources between modules. We've also included optimization tools, from space shaving shared libraries to more efficient asset delivery to on-the-wire compression. So when you're ready, you just upload your Instant App APKs together with your installable APK in the Play Console. To get started building an Instant App today, visit g.co slash Instant Apps. All right. So since you're here, you probably heard our exciting news from I.O. And that, of course, is that we're now offering first class support for the Kotlin programming language in Android. And Kotlin support is now built into Android Studio. So. 
So, you know, obviously I don't have to tell you this, why Kotlin? And that's because the community really wanted it. Kotlin is a mature, production-ready -le language that has been around for five years, and so we investigated. And uh, people that are investigating <laughs> became uh, Kotlin champions. As developers, languages are the tools that we use to express our thoughts, and with Kotlin, there's just so much less syntactic noise between what I want to say and how I say it. And since our announcement at Google I.O., Kotlin has been growing like crazy. It's really a fantastic programming language, and it's great to see so many of you out there adopting it. But to be clear, we have added Kotlin as an additional language. We're not replacing the Java programming language or C++, and we support building apps with as much Kotlin as you want, from 0 to 100%. And in fact, it operates 100% with the Java programming language. That means you can keep every line of code that you have in your existing code base, and you can seamlessly call from Kotlin into the Java programming language and back. And you can get started by adding as little as a single Kotlin class. And JetBrains, who we partnered with to provide Kotlin support for Android, are here and giving a talk on Kotlin today. So please swing by to learn more, if you haven't already. Now, minimizing install friction with instant apps and the support of the Kotlin programming language are just two of the ways in which we've listened to your feedback. We've also learned you want faster, easier development with better tools and libraries. So Android Studio is our official IDE, purpose-built for Android, and we keep increasing our investment. At Google I.O., we launched the preview for Android Studio 3.0, focusing on speed and smarts and platform support, plus new libraries for app architecture. And this is going to migrate to stable release soon. <laughs> and based on your feedback, you can see all of the speed and smarts updates we've made to Android Studio behind me. But I do want to call out one thing in particular. Your feedback has made driving down sync and build time our number one priority. So benchmarking with a real life 100 module project since 2.2, build config time dropped from three minutes to two seconds. And we're continuing to work on build performance. And for me, super exciting on the emulators, we added the Play Store for end to end testing. So next, we'll talk about Android platform support. We recently unveiled our latest dessert name for Android, and you'll find awesome features for Android Oreo in Android Studio, like end-to-end -end instant app support, Oreo system images, improved profilers, and tons of Oreo helper tools, like a tool to make building adaptive icons easy. And to download Android dependencies for your build, you don't have to go to the SDK manager anymore. We're now distributing through our own Maven repository. Finally, You've asked us to make Android frameworks easier, like providing an opinionated guide for best practices and a better solution for life cycles. So at I.O., we launched a preview of new architecture components, libraries for common tasks. And this starts with libraries for the view model pattern, data storage, and managing activity and fragment life cycles. And soon, we'll be announcing support for paging, which will make it easier to use Recycler View, which is awesome. Um, app quality, yeah. Very excited about that. So app quality is an essential piece to growing a successful business. And we took a sample of apps, and we analyzed the correlation between app quality and business success. And what we learned is when apps move from average to good quality, we see a six-fold increase in spend and a seven-fold increase in retention. Quality is queen. Your, now, your app quality might differ depending on the type of device it's running on. So to help you ensure that you're targeting devices that work best for your app, you can now target specific devices in the Play Console. You can browse a detailed device ca Yeah, isn't this us? It's awesome. I've been waiting for that forever. You can browse a detailed device catalog, and if you need a certain amount of RAM or if you have issues with a particular system-on-system -system chip, you can set targeting rules to address this as well. And prior to excluding devices, you can even see your installs, your ratings, and your revenue details per device. Now, we've got Android Vitals dashboards in the Play Console. So you can see aggregate data about your app to help you pinpoint common issues like excessive crash rates, ANR rates, frozen frames, slow rendering, excessive wake-ups, and more. And these are enhanced by improved profilers in Android Studio and new instrumentation in the platform. Speaking of the platform, Android O adds so much for developers, such as vastly improved font support, an auto-sizing text view, notification channels, and a new native Pro Audio API. We've made massive improvements in the runtime, including a concurrent copying collector and a series of optimizations to make your apps run smoother than ever. 
We've introduced adaptive icons to improve the launcher experience and continue to harden Android security with Google Play Protect now enabled on every device with Google Play. We've improved accessibility, added support for autofill and smart text selection, added support for wide gamut color and extra long screens, and improved multi-display support. And I'll be diving into all of this and much more in detail later today. But let's talk about some of the ways we're extending the Android platform. Last week, we announced and, la and launched AR Core. Now, AR Core is a platform for building augmented reality apps on Android, and it uses three key technologies to integrate virtual content with the real world as seen through your phone's camera. So we've got motion tracking to allow the phone to understand and track its position relative to the world. We've got environmental understanding, which allows the phone to detect the size and location of flat horizontal surfaces like the ground or a coffee table. And light estimation allows the phone to estimate the environment's current lighting conditions. Now, this is being offered as an early preview, so you can start experimenting with and building new AR experiences. And this is also an opportunity for you to give feedback on an early version of the API. And this preview is the first step in a journey to enabling AR capabilities across the entire Android ecosystem. So check out the documentation pages to learn more. All right, switch gears literally to Android Auto. Uh, it's still early days, but we're seeing incredible growth. We continue to expand the number of Android Auto compatible cars through great partnerships with over 50 car brands. And there are over 300 Android Auto compatible models and aftermarket systems available today. And that's triple the number from one year ago. And it's well on its way to becoming a standard feature in every new car. And we've also made Android Auto available to all Android users with a standalone phone app, opening up the platform and ecosystem to many millions of drivers, no matter what kind of car they're driving. Whether you're looking to stay connected with WhatsApp or Allo, pass the time with a player.fm podcast or the latest album releases on Spotify, we've got great apps on Android Auto. And its usage is growing rapidly as well, but this is just the beginning. We're working with two European partners in automotive electronics and infotainment, Audi and Volvo, on vehicle infotainment systems powered by Android. And we're really excited to partner with them to usher in the future of connected cars. Now, voice input is critical in the car for safety reasons, and the Google Assistant can provide that intelligent and conversational voice as we move from a mobile-first world to an AI-first world. And we want it to be the best co-pilot for the user in the car. So on your road, your assistant can tell you about traffic ahead, or show you gas stations along the way, or play your favorite song. And many of these experiences are only possible because developers like you are implementing the right APIs. So thank you for helping us create a great user experience on Android Auto. All right, let's go to the living room. Android TV is seeing amazing device growth. Our strong partnerships with pay TV operators and hardware manufacturers allowed us to double the number of activated devices in 2016, and we expect that trend to continue and further increase. We're seeing this both apart across partners in the set-top box and in the smart TV form factors, including the many European solutions powered by Android TV. And we've expanded our international footprint to 70 countries, and there are now more than 3,000 apps in the Android TV Play Store. But the real Android TV story is the way we've redefined the experience. This new home screen is channel-based and content-first. It's divided into channel rows, each created by a media app to display a window of program content relevant to you. And selecting that program takes you right into that content in the app. You can see what on-demand shows you need to finish binge-watching, what's on your DVR, and what movies you might want to rent all in the same view. We've also updated the setup experience to allow you to easily transition media apps from other Android devices. And we've made big updates to the leanback library, such as the, the playback element, which adds detailed seek thumbnails. And of course, we've integrated the Google Assistant, which allows you to search, launch video content, and then uh, dim the lights when you want to watch, all using your voice. All right, let's switch to uh, <clears throat> something a little bit closer. Um, Android Wear. During the holiday period last year, Android Wear saw 72% growth. And that was before we launched Android Wear 2.0. The number of brands supporting Android Wear doubled from 12 last year to 24. And the choice of Android Wear watches doubled from 23 last year to 46. And Wear is enabling fashionable watches from European partners, such as the connected modular 45 from Tag Heuer, the Mont Blanc Summit, and the Louis Vuitton Tambour Horizon. And along with a multitude of styles, like from partners across many price points and brands, 
And apps are taking advantage of Android Wear 2.0 and its standalone functionality. So this app from our partner Telegram works the same if you're connected to an Android phone or an iPhone, or if your watch has a cellular connection without the phone at all. Sending stickers to your friends has never been easier. Another feature we added to Android Wear 2.0, Complications, allows watch faces to display extra information without needing code for getting the underlying data. Users select the watch face that they want with the most important information they really care about, and it's available at a glance throughout the day. So here, Robinhood, the financial investment app, is showing you your overall portfolio's value. Tapping on it then takes you to your watch list, and you can tap on individual stocks to see their values. Finally, as part of the Android Wear 2.0 launch, we announced the Google Assistant is now on your wrist, enhancing Wear's voice capabilities. So going, far to, apart, going forward, apart from notifications, watch faces, and native apps, you will have another option to bring the service to Android Wear when we enable actions on Google for Wear. And we're excited about the new capabilities this will bring. All right. With so many ways for people to interact with Android, the strong communities that are supporting Android development, the improvements that we've made in the platform, tooling, language, and in the distribution of Google Play, it really is the best time ever to be an Android developer. So please check out the sessions, the trainings, and the code labs here to learn how we're helping developers make Android great. Now, all of the Android form factors are tapping into the power of the Google Assistant. So it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague Tilka to the stage to talk about what the Google Assistant means to developers. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. As you just heard, the Google Assistant is now available across many devices, from your phone to your car to your watch and TV. It is also available on Google Home and all the, uh, the devices powered by the Google Assistant SDK. Tomorrow, you'll hear more about these from my colleague Bishad, who will talk about the improvements on the Assistant on these devices. But today, I want to focus on what you, as developers, can do to bring the power of the Assistant to your own apps. With the Assistant now available across devices, you have the opportunity to grow your user base in a new way. But more importantly, you can build apps for entirely new assistive use cases, things that previously weren't suited for the voice-only interface of Google Home, like shopping for clothes, or ordering food from a lengthy menu. With UI elements like image carousels, lists, and suggestion chips, users can see more details. They can also seamlessly transition between voice, typing, or taps in a single conversation to easily get things done with your app. We also want to make help, help you grow your business by making it easy to complete purchases through the Google Assistant. We designed the transactions experience to be easy and lightweight for users and developers alike. For payments, available in Europe soon, you can choose Google facilitated payments. They are easy to integrate and allow you to leverage cards that, Google's, that users have already stored with Google for free. Or you can use a payment method the user has already provided you. You can use seamless account linking to enable users to sign into an existing account, or even create a new account with just two taps. But a, transition, a transaction isn't over when the user pays. The users may want to check on, modify, or reorder an item, which they can do from the transaction history view accessible in the Google Assistant. Finally, we built a new order updates feature that we're currently testing in the US to make it easier for users to re-engage with your app. You'll be able to send status updates to users asynchronously, like when a car arrives to pick them up or their food is delivered. But none of this really matters if people can't discover your app. At I.O., we began rolling out a new app directory that will come to Europe along with the Google Assistant. Accessible from within the Assistant, it not only has categories and user ratings, it also allows users to try your app directly from the directory page. Users can create a shortcut for your app 
for an easy way to invoke it. For example, instead of saying, OK, Google, ask forecaster Joe what's the surf report for the Outer Banks, you can just say, OK, Google, is the surf up? And to make finding your app easier, the assistant is also learning from the directory and from the information provided by you, the developer. Thanks to these signals, the assistant can often respond to general requests like play a game with a few different options from third parties. Improving discovery is very important for us. So you can expect ongoing investment and improvements in this area. It is also important to us that the developer process is smooth. That's why at I.O. we launched a new developer console. The Actions console helps your, you work as a team and collect data on your app's usage, performance, and user discovery patterns. It is integrated with the Firebase and Google Cloud consoles so that you can share your data within your apps. In addition to the console, we're also providing you with access to developer tools that allow you to quickly and easily build apps for the assistant. Since the launch of our platform, we've worked with an expanding number of developer tool companies to make their solutions compatible with actions on Google. We've also expanded the capabilities of API, API.ai, our own conversation building tool, launching new features such as follow-up intents, pre-built agents, and in-dialogue analytics. While we are still in the early days of the platform, we are focused on making it more robust and expanding its reach and its capabilities. We recently launched in UK and Australian English, and we'll launch the platform in French, German, and other languages following this year. We're super excited for the road ahead, and we want more of you to join us by developing for the platform. With an addressable audience of more than 100 million devices, new capabilities like transactions, and an improved developer experience, we think this is an incredible opportunity for all of us. Now, the magic of the assistant is enabled by Google's deep investment in AI and the cloud. So to tell you more about how you can use it directly, please welcome Sarah. Thanks, Tilka. I'm incredibly excited to tell you everything we're working on related to machine learning. My name is Sarah Robinson. I'm a developer advocate on Google's cloud platform team focused on big data and machine learning. In today's world, anytime we see the words ML on a slide, it always gets a lot of people's attention. But before we dive into the details, I want to talk about what machine learning actually is. At a high level, Machine learning involves teaching computers to recognize patterns in the same way that our brains do. Over time, as machine learning models are given more examples and experience, they can improve and start to generalize on examples that they haven't seen before. With more data, they're able to generate better predictions. Does anybody remember how they learned their first language? Your parents probably didn't give you a dictionary and a bunch of grammar books. That would be weird. Instead. You learned over time after being exposed to many examples. So for example, if you had pierogies for dinner, since we're in Poland, you saw them on your plate, you heard your parents identify them, and over time, this strengthened certain pathways in your brain so that the next time you had them for dinner, it triggered the part of your brain that told you, that's a pierogi. And that's roughly how machine learning works too. To summarize, machine learning is loosely based on how the human brain learns with mathematical neurons that mimic the neurons in our brain. These neurons take a vector as input, transform those values, and then output new values. And machine learning models let you solve problems without requiring you to know exactly what the solution might be. And again, as I mentioned before, with more and more data, these systems are able to generate better predictions. Now, many people see the term machine learning and immediately think it's something solely for experts. If we take a look back 60 years ago, this was definitely the case. This is a picture of the perceptron, the first neural network invented in 1957. It was an electronic device that demonstrated the ability to identify shapes. Back then, 
If you wanted to work on machine learning, you needed access to extensive academic and computing resources. Let's fast forward to today. At Google, even just since 2012, the number of products using machine learning has grown dramatically. But at Google, we don't think machine learning should be something just for experts. We want to put machine learning into the hands of every developer and data scientist, that's all of you, with a computer and a machine learning problem they want to solve. On Google Cloud Platform, we've got two ways to help you integrate ML into your own applications. First, if you're new to machine learning, we have six pre-trained APIs to give you access to machine learning models with a single REST API request. And second, if you want to use your own data to build and train a model from scratch, we have a variety of tools to help you do that as well. Let's start with these pre-trained APIs. We have a growing number of models that have already been trained and are continuously being updated using Google's own domain expertise and data sets. For example, the Speech API lets developers implement speech-to-text transcription functionality into their own applications, similar to OK Google. I'm going to talk about all of these APIs in detail later today during my breakout session. So for now, I want to give you a demo of just one of them. I'm going to pick one at random. I'm going to go with the Vision API, which lets developers better understand their images. You can try out all of our machine learning APIs directly in the browser using your own images, text, or video content. So here I can upload an image and see what the Vision API responds. So if I click on this, I'm going to choose a selfie that I took yesterday in Krakow. It's a little silly. We're going to see what the Vision API responds. So we can see that it's able to identify landmarks. Landmark detection is one of the features of the Vision API. It knows the name of the building I'm standing in front of, and it also is able to identify main market square. The face detection endpoint identifies my face in the image, and it's also able to identify the emotions, joy, and surprise. I won't go over all of the response types in the browser, um, but you can all try this out with your own images if you go to cloud.google.com slash vision. So we've seen the machine learning APIs used across a variety of industries to accomplish common machine learning tasks, like classifying images, identifying inappropriate content, extracting subjects from a text document, and more. But many of you may have use cases that go beyond these common machine learning tasks. If you want to build ML models trained on your own data to perform custom tasks, we've got products to help you do that as well. We know that data is at the core of any machine learning problem, and you need a foundation of good data to get started. So in order to help you prepare your data, we have tools to help ingest, transform, clean, and store your data on Google Cloud Platform. Once your data is ready, you can train, deploy, and serve your models at scale on managed Google infrastructure. In addition to all of this, the Google Brain team has provided an open source library called TensorFlow. From the beginning, we wanted to let everyone in the industry benefit, so we made TensorFlow an open source project on GitHub. And the uptake has been phenomenal. TensorFlow is the most popular ML project on GitHub, with over 68,000 GitHub stars and contributions coming from many different companies, not just Google. To give you a taste of what's possible with TensorFlow, I want to show you TensorFlow Playground, a visualization of a neural network in the browser. So the data set we're working with here is called Double Spiral. And the data here could really be anything. We're just classifying it into one of two categories. So let's say here we're working with email data that we're classifying as either spam or not spam. So the orange dots would indicate spam. The blue dots would indicate not spam. And as humans, if we take a new data point, let's say we have a data point right here, we can almost immediately classify that as spam, as an orange dot. But it's much more difficult to teach a computer these underlying patterns. And before we start training, our neural network's predictions don't make too much sense. The background color here indicates the output or the prediction of the network. So we can see here that most orange dots are being classified as blue. So if we start training, we can see that slowly our loss or error of our model is decreasing, and it's able to identify some complex patterns in our data set. If we look at each individual neuron, we see that they're performing very simple classification tasks. But as we move through the network, it's slowly able to identify complex patterns in our data set. And with more and more training, 
we can see that it's able to identify this double spiral pattern. So we see that as we went through training, our loss decreased, the accuracy of our model increased, and now it's able to classify almost all of the points in our data set correctly. I encourage all of you to try this out at playground.tensorflow.org. And in addition to being a powerful framework, TensorFlow is designed to be able to run anywhere. You can not only run TensorFlow models on our fully managed Cloud ML engine, you can run them on your own servers, in your own data centers, on VMs and other cloud providers, and you can even compile them down to ARM code and run them on mobile devices. If you want to utilize Google's infrastructure to ingest data, train your model, and run predictions at scale, we have Cloud Machine Learning Engine. To use it, all you need to do is prepare your training data in Google Cloud Storage or BigQuery, write your TensorFlow code locally, and then use the Google Cloud CLI to run training and prediction jobs on ML Engine. And for compute expensive tasks like training a model, ML Engine supports GPUs, which lets you significantly accelerate your machine learning workloads. You can go to this URL to learn more about ML Engine. And there's one more thing I'd like to share with you. One thing we know to be true at Google is that great software shines brightest with great hardware underneath. That's why we started a project at Google several years ago to see what we could accomplish with our own custom accelerators for machine learning applications. And the result was a Tensor Processing Unit, or TPU, which we announced earlier this year at Google I.O. The TPU is a custom chip we built specifically for machine learning and tailored for TensorFlow. We've been running TPUs inside our data centers for more than a year, and we found them to deliver an order of magnitude better performance per watt for machine learning. TPUs are currently in alpha. If you want to sign up, you can head over to cloud.google.com slash TPU. And finally, if you remember just one thing from this presentation, remember that our goal on Google Cloud Platform is to democratize machine learning. We want to make it accessible not only to ML experts, but to developers and data scientists. That's all of you. Thank you. Now I'd like to hand it over to Tal to talk about the latest in mobile web. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Tal from the Chrome team, and I'm excited to tell you about some of the great improvements we've made on the web over the last year. The web is big. With over 2 billion instances of Chrome, we know that the web has tremendous reach. But one of the true strengths of the web is that it's bigger than a single browser. So regardless of whether a device is a smartphone or a laptop or a desktop, they all have a browser. So any web-based experience is available on these billions of devices today. And we've seen this have a real impact on how many users web apps are reaching. We've all seen how quickly mobile has been growing. And native apps have been growing at an incredible pace with it. But what's really remarkable is that even with the web's large initial reach, we've seen the average monthly web audience growing even faster. And because of this growth, we're seeing the web expand into new areas with experiences like WebVR being built on the web platform. And the web continues to pop up in more and more places, even some you might not expect. We now see the web popping up on watches, TVs, or even fridges. So with the web pretty much everywhere, we're constantly trying to push the boundaries on what it can actually do. Over the past year, we've shipped hundreds of additional APIs that cover a range of capabilities. That from making it easy to integrate payments into your web experience to making it possible to build fully capable offline media experiences directly on the web. And with all of these new experiences, we've seen a massive growth in experiences built on the web. Accelerated Mobile Pages, or AMP, allows publishers to easily create fast articles. And since launch, we've seen this grow to over 2 billion AMP pages across 900,000 domains. And beyond AMP pages, the modern mobile web also allows developers to build rich mobile experiences with something that we call progressive web apps, or PWAs. PWAs are about helping web developers leverage the web's reach 
with new capabilities to build high-class immersive experiences. They can load quickly, they work offline, and they can even send notifications to users. And we've seen a number of amazing experiences taking advantage of these new capabilities. As just one example, Twitter recently launched a new web experience. Here, they have a polished, fast, immersive experience that works on any connection and can send users notifications. And since it's built completely on the web platform, it's already accessible on billions of devices. And with an immersive experience like this, we also want to make sure that it's really easy for users to get back to it. Add to Home Screen has existed for some time and allows users to add any experience to their Android home screen. But with our improved Add to Home Screen flow, when you add a PWA to your home screen, it's fully integrated into the platform. So that it, to users, it feels just like any other app experience on their device. It'll appear in the Android launcher alongside your other apps. And it'll even appear in Android settings. But since it's a PWA, it's inherently small so users are able to get an immersive experience without requiring additional storage space. And this fast, integrated, improved Add to Home Screen experience is available now. With all of these new capabilities, we've also been working to make sure that it's super easy for web developers to build these experiences. We'll be going into a lot more detail about PWAs throughout the web track over the next two days. But no matter how you're building your web app, Lighthouse is a tool that can show you how to improve your experience. Lighthouse is a Chrome extension and command line tool that quickly audits your site to identify how you can improve your app's performance, accessibility, and progressive web appiness. And we're excited to announce that as of M60, Lighthouse is now integrated into Chrome DevTools. So now you can quickly see how your website is doing and what to do next directly in Chrome. With all of these tools, we've seen just how easy it can be for companies to take advantage of these new capabilities for their web experience. To give one example, there's Trivago, a popular hotel comparison site that recently built a very polished PWA. It's an experience built directly on the web, so users can get to it easily. And with our new Add to Home Screen flow, it can be easily accessed from the app launcher or the Android home screen. And when you open it, you get a high-class, immersive experience that can even work if you're offline, and is built to be resilient against different network conditions, so you get a seamless experience when you go back online. But what's really incredible is that in this entire PWA experience was built by three core engineers in just a couple of months. And this is just one example of many. Leveraging the modern mobile web is now the norm around the world. Whether you're building a PWA from scratch or leveraging the latest capabilities on your existing web experience, companies everywhere are seeing a tangible impact on their key metrics. With the modern mobile web, it's possible to easily build immersive, fully capable experiences that can reach billions of people around the world today. And now, let's turn our focus to what we're doing to make it easier to develop apps and grow your business. Please welcome Francis. Hi, I'm Francis, and I lead the Firebase product team. Our mission is to help developers build a better app and grow a successful business. Since I.O. 2016, we've expanded Firebase from a set of backend services to a broad mobile platform to help solve many of the common problems you face across the lifecycle of an app, from helping you build faster and easier with products like real-time database and cloud storage to helping you better understand and grow your app with tools like analytics and cloud messaging. Whether you're starting something new or looking to extend an existing app, we're here to help you so that you can channel more of your time and energy towards creating value for your users. And we deliver all of this in a single, easy-to-use SDK available across platforms. To date, there are over 1 million developers using Firebase and we're humbled so many of you have taken this journey with us. We're deeply committed to Firebase, and we're doubling down on our efforts to help developers succeed. On that note, earlier this year, we're excited to have the Fabric team join us at Google. Since launching Crashlytics in 2011, our teams have shared a very similar mission. And now we're working together to integrate our two platforms 
and bring you the best of both in a thoughtful way. One of the first steps we're taking is to bring Crashlytics to Firebase to make that our flagship crash reporting product. If you're an existing customer of Fabric or Firebase, we're going to be paving a smooth transition path for you over the coming months. We've also been working closely with the Digits team to bring the next evolution of phone number sign-in to Firebase authentication. With it, you can extend your app, enable users to sign in with a phone number. They just need to do a one-time verification, and they're in. With Firebase Auth, we also provide a headless API so that you can have full control and customize the UI to fit the look and feel of your app. In addition to integrating with Fabric, we've also made many updates over the last year. And I'd like to highlight a few of these for you. One of our goals for Firebase is to save you from managing servers so that you can focus on building great apps. And to help with this, we've released Cloud Functions for Firebase. With Cloud Functions, you can deploy JavaScript code to the cloud and have that triggered based on an HTTP request or with other events happening across Firebase. For example, you can set up a function with Firebase Auth to automatically send a push notification through FCM when a new user signs up. Or say, set up a function with storage so that you can do some server-side processing like machine learning when a new image is uploaded. Or you can also use functions with hosting to create a fully dynamic website without managing any servers. Functions is a great way to extend your app and enables true serverless development. So we just talked about how Firebase helps you build more easily. Let's switch gears to talk about how it can help you build better and really focus on your app quality. Now, as developers, we spend a lot of time optimizing and testing our apps. But when we release our apps in the wild, sometimes end users experience something entirely different based on the diversity of devices or network conditions. And when our apps don't perform well, it's frustrating for everyone. And that's why we've released Firebase Performance Monitoring. You can add performance monitoring with one line of code, and it will automatically measure your app's startup time and network latency. You can then also add additional custom traces to measure the timing across the different points in your app. You can drill in deeper to filter your data based on the country, app version, or device type to get a sense of how users are really experiencing your app and not just on your office Wi-Fi. Performance monitoring is a nice complement to Crashlytics and Analytics to help you better understand and find those bottlenecks that could be impacting your user engagement or even your business bottom line. Speaking of analytics, we've also made a number of updates on this front. Earlier in the year, we released StreamView to give you a real-time view of how users are interacting with your app across the world. We've also added custom parameter reporting to give you the next level of insights in addition to the events that you log. For example, let's say that you, you log the events that are happening when a user passes around in your game. Now you can also get reports to the custom parameters like the type of game that was played or the average number of coins that were awarded. We've also worked with the AdMob team to give you insights to which ad on which screen are earning you the most so that you can really optimize both your ad revenue along with your user engagement with the broader analytics insights that you get. We've also enhanced our experience with BigQuery, where you can export your analytics events in raw, join it with custom data sets, and perform ad hoc analysis. It's super powerful. With BigQuery, you can also use it with Data Studio to create your own custom visualizations and reports. Essentially, you can build your own analytics UI the way you need. In addition to building features, we've also recently launched a Firebase Alpha program that gives access to unreleased products. And this is a great opportunity to provide early feedback and help shape Firebase. Incorporating customer feedback is a key part of our product development process, and we look forward to hearing from developers like you. Just sign up at the URL. Now, we just share some of the updates we've made since last year. To learn even more and hear what we've been up to, we'll be hosting the Firebase Dev Summit in Amsterdam at the end of October. You can learn more about the event at firebase.google.com. And I look forward to seeing many of you there. I look forward to hearing your feedback and continue to work hard to help you build a better app and grow a more successful business. Thank you.
Now I'd like to bring Jason back on. Thanks, Francis. As you can see, we're continuing to work hard to improve the developer experience for Google's products. Tomorrow morning, you'll hear more about the products our engineering teams at Google are building here in Europe. Whether it's our compression team in Switzerland, amazing, in comp amazing compiler and language work in Denmark, or our cloud team in Poland that's scaling the cloud, you'll also have the opportunity to dive deep into a number of our products covering Android to Firebase to the mobile web. We'll have sandboxes to help you experience products firsthand, instructor-led trainings and code labs to get you trained and running our latest, on our latest APIs today. In addition to all of this, we have a large number of Googlers who are available for one-on-one -on -one consultations through office hours. Not only can they help you understand our products, but more importantly, they're here to get your feedback. I do have one other thing to mention before you head out to the breakout sessions today. Last year, we partnered with Udacity to provide 10,000 Android scholarships to European developers. And we were overwhelmed by the demand for the scholarship, and we're truly amazed by some of the stories that came out of it. Let's take a look at Adiko's story, a former literature teacher turned coder. Play the video. Fekete Jedikó vagyok, két gyermekes anyuka. Magyar tanárként végeztem, és mostanában kódolással foglalkozom. Az első gyermekemet vártam, amikor komplikációk léptek föl, és az orvos azt mondta, hogy tanácsosabb lenne otthon maradnom. Így úgy döntöttem, hogy ott hagyom a munkahelyemet. Nem szerettem volna ezt az időt tétlenül tölteni. Később el is költöztünk a párommal az ő munkája miatt. Rengeteg kihívás elé állított ez minket. Szembesültem azzal, hogy nem fogok tudni a régi munkámhoz visszatérni. Böngészés közben találkoztam a lehetőséggel, hogy a Google jó voltából a Udacity honlapján tanulhatok. Nagyon megtetszett, és jelentkeztem. A tanulói program alatt megtanultunk Android készülékre applikációkat készíteni, elkészíteni a layoutokat és a javakódot egyaránt. Nagyon élveztem azt a hátteret, amit ezúttal a Udacity számomra biztosított. A Greenfield applikáció, amit készítettem, kiszámolja az ökológiai lábnyomunkat. Amikor a gyerekeim megszülettek, észrevettem, hogy hihetetlen mértékben megnőtt a szemét termelésünk. Nem gondoltam, hogy valaha képes leszek saját applikációt készíteni, ami a természetvédelemmel kapcsolatos, és tényleg számít, hatással lehet emberekre. Azt hiszem, hogy a, a programozás az, az lehetővé teszi, hogy bármit elkészítsünk. Coding mannak lenni nehéz, de szuper. Bízom benne, hogy a Udacity tanulói program keretében végzett tanulmányaim miatt könnyebb lesz majd munkát találnom a gyerekek mellett. So Adiko's story is just one of many that motivates us to continue programs like this. That's why today I'm excited to announce that we're extending our partnership with Udacity to begin the Udacity Scholarship Challenge, this time with enough space for 60,000 aspiring developers across Europe and select parts of EMEA. And we're also expanding the scope to include both Android and mobile web development. So please visit the website to sign up and learn more. So as you heard from the speakers today, we're really excited about the possibilities for developers to build some truly amazing things. We're looking forward to getting to know you over the next two days and hear what's on your mind. Thank you and have fun. Welcome to Google Developer Days Europe. We're happy that you'll be joining us for two days of talks, demos, hands-on training, and more. By now, you've checked into registration on level zero to receive your badge. Your badge must be visibly worn at all times. And don't forget, you'll need it for the after-party reception at the end of the day. The Google Help Desk is also located on level zero. If you have any questions or are in need of assistance, feel free to stop by. All talks and sessions will be taking place in either the auditorium hall or the theater hall and are accessible on levels zero through two.
For hands-on trainings and code labs, be sure to visit the S3.1 and S3.2 Training Chamber Hall and S4 Code Labs Conference Hall Complex on Level 3, where instructors will teach you how to use the latest Google technologies, or you can work at your own pace to execute different coding challenges. This is also where you'll be able to meet with product teams for office hours and ask them questions or visit a review clinic to get feedback on an app that you might have created. No Google event would be complete without showcasing the newest products and technologies, so we invite you to explore the different sandbox demos that are located throughout the venue on all levels. Be sure to check out the Community Lounge and Google Developers and Cloud Certification Lounge located on Level 2. There will be scheduled meetups, fun activities, and engagement opportunities, as well as places to just sit and relax and meet with your peers. This is an inclusive community. No matter your experience or background, you're welcome here. We encourage you to be excellent to each other by saying hi to new faces, building on one another's ideas, and reporting any uncomfortable experiences. We have a zero tolerance policy for harassment of any kind. This policy is posted on large signs around the venue and our full community guidelines are on the event website. Please share your positive and constructive feedback with staff and speakers. Staff and speakers can be identified by their staff or speaker badges or shirts. Let's make this the best developer event ever by creating an excellent experience at this year's Google Developer Days. Thanks. If you've been working in web development, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Mobile Web Specialist Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can demonstrate the skills of an advanced level mobile web developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or if you're ready to take the exam. You can reference our study guide and training is available online. When you're ready, sign up and take the exam. As part of the sign up, you'll pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you'll pay 6,500 rupees. If you live outside of India, you'll pay 99 US dollars. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you'll receive a voucher that you can use to schedule the exam. The exam is a timed, performance-based assessment in which you'll write code to solve challenges and demonstrate your skills in mobile web development. You'll have four hours to finish, after which you will submit the exam and respond to a set of exit interview questions. If after grading you're successful, you'll receive a digital badge from Google and join our community of Google-certified mobile web specialists. Once you're certified, you can share your badge on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. Ready to start your journey? software development and you don't exercise your design skills, just practice, just do it. Do it even though you know that it's bad. If you want to improve the quality of your site but don't know where to start, the new audits panel is a great place to get some inspiration. This is a quick web series about solving web problems with standards. Let's go. I'll be right here to tell you what's new in Chrome. That's a uh, Webpack performance. One day I'll get around to learning it. You could just watch this video. Knowing what is and what is not visible can be very useful information. I can change these properties in DevTools to find the ideal value for my layout. It's Rob Dotson. Welcome back to the Alley Cash Show. I want to show you what just landed in Chrome DevTools version 60. So follow me over here to the laptop. If you want the latest news and ideas in web development, subscribe to the Google Chrome Developers YouTube channel.
With the instant access of the web, there's no place that I can't reach. The impact of the web on the newsroom was monumental. It's now more the reader telling the newsroom, this is important to me. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With a progressive web app, there's a link, tap it, install it with no friction. The PWA is on their phone, done. And once that is installed, we are able to alert you to, hey, we got some more information for you. If you're interested in whatever areas that you are, you can install that subject, that topic, and we're going to serve you the content that you want. And that's going to change our business in a big way. The technology has enabled us to make our new PWA faster than their current mobile site. We're now able to deliver visuals faster. And if you can start to deliver visuals faster, then you can start to change the formats you do. People are willing to stay longer. If they stay longer, they see more advertising. The PWA is going to result in more personalization. Personalization will yield more engagement. The web has made me realize there's an audience out there, and there's an audience that's knowledgeable, and there's an audience that needs to be understood. With the instant access of the web, there's no place that I can't reach. The impact of the web on the newsroom was monumental. It's now more the reader telling the newsroom, this is important to me. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With a progressive web app, there's a link, tap it, install it with no friction. The PWA is on their phone, done. And once that is installed, we are able to alert you to, hey, we got some more information for you. If you're interested in whatever areas that you are, you can install that subject, that topic, and we're going to serve you the content that you want. And that's going to change our business in a big way. The technology has enabled us to make our new PWA faster than their current mobile site. We're now able to deliver visuals faster. And if you can start to deliver visuals faster, then you can start to change the formats you do. People are willing to stay longer. If they stay longer, they see more advertising. The PWA is going to result in more personalization. Personalization will yield more engagement. The web has made me realize there's an audience out there, and there's an audience that's knowledgeable, and there's an audience that needs to be understood. Banking should be painless, easy, fast, and it should just assist you in doing whatever you want to do. So actually, it's our strategy to empower people to take a step ahead in life and in business. If you look at our company, we have all this different IT landscape in all the countries. Still, we want to be able to share. And that's when we started to look at web components, and web components solve that for us. Because when we use Polymer and web components as the standard underneath, we can suddenly create components which will work in any country. So you can just take that components and start delivering a feature. So now when I'm in that shop looking at that bike, I'm not only checking my balance, I'm also pressing the button, let's look ahead. And what it will tell me, next month your mortgage will be deducted from your account. So maybe this is not the best time to buy that bike. And that's what we're doing it for, for features and not for the UI part. We are starting to see this all developer community, which is moving to one technology, and we are seeing more and more people working together from all the countries. When this translates to results, anything can happen.
Whether you're just starting out on your journey toward a career in Android development, or you've been working as an Android developer for some time, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Associate Android Developer Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can display the skills of an entry-level Android developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or are ready to take the exam. Training is available online as well as in person. You 大家都能在这片土地上和睦共处这是最值得骄傲的一点这也是马来西亚的特色老一辈的都慢慢开始会使用网页使用iPad用电话上网 因为现在很多在做web development的 都是从学校毕业出来 其中一个很大的挑战你学到的东西并不是和你在领域上面需要的东西是一样的在他们学习的当中他们必须要令他们自己精修所以我觉得必须要做的是要有一些课程要去一些学校里面跟他们说其实现在这些就是最新的科技发
去教导一些科技之类的知识，所以我觉得这是一个方法去 gather 女性在同一个 community 里面，就更加方便交流。当你有你们有交流的时候，你就知道别人其他的女性到底在这个领域上面遇到什么问题。Our whole objective is to get more females to pick up coding. It's more or less the same problem in any male-dominated industry. Yeah, yeah. For the first project, you you just can't fail. You need to prove yourself. So after that, <laughs> everything will just go just fine. So I think we as a community is the place where we provide the platform for people to yeah to start from ground zero. When we um go. organize 这种 workshop event 的时候，因为在马马来西亚就很少类似的 session。如果我把四十张票放上网的话，如果我们没有啊、嗯、控制的话，可能三十张票就会给男性直接 sign up 了。当然，我们也不是说要特别特别去。碰到男性去参加这个这个 event， 因为我们是无门虎口嘛，我是希望更多的女性参加这个这个 workshop， 所以现在我们做的就是，可能把大概七八十八千的位置先保留给给女性。Okay. 在传统华人而言呢，父亲是扮演一个比较严厉的角色。父亲通常不会说一些说你令他骄傲的话，只是从别人口中就会听到，就是从他巴沙里的朋友口中就会听得到。一开始我是觉得惊讶，因为他从来没跟我说，这惊讶比较多。惊讶过后就有点窃喜，因为他算满意我的成绩。我觉得呢，网页是无法被代替的，只是有什么事我们可以做，令可以令网页更加 popular， 更加多人使用的。学习网页、学习开发这一部分，在马来西亚还是比较缺少的。我觉得我个人的经历是有影响到我如何去 mentor 新的人去，去去领导他们怎么学习网页。我希望我是其中一个推动网页发展。我希望做到的是，让这种知识更普及，更多人知道如何开发网页。
If you've been working in web development, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Mobile Web Specialist Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can demonstrate the skills of an advanced level mobile web developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or if you're ready to take the exam. You can reference our study guide and training is available online. When you're ready, sign up and take the exam. As part of the sign up, you'll pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you'll pay 6,500 rupees. If you live outside of India, you'll pay 99 US dollars. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you'll receive a voucher that you can use to schedule the exam. The exam is a timed, performance-based assessment in which you'll write code to solve challenges and demonstrate your skills in mobile web development. You'll have four hours to finish, after which you will submit the exam and respond to a set of exit interview questions. If after grading you're successful, you'll receive a digital badge from Google and join our community of Google certified mobile web specialists. Once you're certified, you can share your badge on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. Ready to start your journey? software development and you don't exercise your design skills just practice just do it do it even though you know that it's bad if you want to improve the quality of your site but don't know where to start the new audits panel is a great place to get some inspiration this is a quick web series about solving web problems with standards let's go i'll be right here to tell you what's new in chrome that's a uh, webpack performance one day I'll get around to learning it. You could just watch this video. Knowing what is and what is not visible can be very useful information. I can change these properties in DevTools to find the ideal value for my layout. It's Rob Dotson. Welcome back to the Alley Cash Show. I want to show you what just landed in Chrome DevTools version 60. So follow me over here to the laptop. If you want the latest news and ideas in web development, subscribe to the Google Chrome Developers YouTube channel. With the instant access of the web, there's no place that I can't reach. The impact of the web on the newsroom was monumental. It's now more the reader telling the newsroom, this is important to me. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With a progressive web app, there's a link. Tap it, install it with no friction. The PWA is on their phone, done. And once that is installed, we are able to alert you to, hey, we got some more information for you. If you're interested in whatever areas that you are, you can install that subject, that topic, and we're going to serve you the content that you want. And that's going to change our business in a big way. The technology has enabled us to make our new PWA faster than their current mobile site. We're now able to deliver visuals faster. And if you can start to deliver visuals faster, then you can start to change the formats you do. People are willing to stay longer. If they stay longer, they see more advertising. The PWA is going to result in more personalization. Personalization will yield more engagement. The web has made me realize there's an audience out there, and there's an audience that's knowledgeable, and there's an audience that needs to be understood.
Hey, hello and uh, welcome to Krakow. Uh, for those of you from Krakow, you know, thank you for welcoming us to your, you know, beautiful city. Um, here is actually a photograph from the last time I was in Krakow when the temperature was like minus 20 degrees Celsius. So, you know, we've been really happy to see some sunshine uh, in Krakow. Anyway, uh, my name is Sam Dutton. Uh, I'm a developer advocate for the web. I work for Google based in London. Uh, I'm here today and tomorrow with a, a bunch of other Googlers who like people working on Chrome and, and some really brilliant web developers. Um, so please, if you have questions, come and chat to us in the web area. Come and check out Lighthouse and all the other stuff that we've got. Um, I wanted to cover some of the stuff uh, from the keynote in a little more detail and really give an overview of the web today. Um, you know, I want to give a high level overview, but uh, also some of the business reasons why I think it makes sense to build progressive web apps. Um, so we're going to go into that now, and there will be sessions later with more technical detail about building for the web. <coughs> so, you know, like you heard earlier, uh, in a word, the web is big. There are like now over five billion devices out there that can access web content. This is incredible, I think. You know, you get this instant broad reach with the web. Um, and this didn't happen, you know, because of luck. Yeah, the, the web is this open, decentralized platform. There are no gatekeepers. Um, you know, websites get uh, massive reach and users get, I don't know, like low friction which is great. And I think, uh, you know, we've all seen charts like this. Mobile computing is at the heart of uh, this revolution. There's been this explosion of computing on mobile. And, uh, you know, we now use more mobile devices uh, than desktop computers and so on. And this is a really interesting challenge for uh, developers. We've also reached this point now, you know, particularly noticed this in, in some regions, uh, where a lot of users coming online are actually, you know, mobile only. Uh, they, they never use a desktop or a laptop device. And again, this is a really interesting challenge for the web. Of course, on mobile, most users spend most of their time in native apps, yeah, rather than the web. Um, you know, apps are seen to be more, I don't know, predictable. They have great re-engagement features. Um, you know, all this good stuff in native apps. You, you think, well, like, I could cut my presentation short right now and say, well, you know, go and build native, uh, we could all go home. Um, there is a flip side to this, though, and uh, I'm sure you understand this, uh, particularly app developers in the audience here. You know, app usage is highly concentrated. Users tend to only use a few apps. They see native apps, like, as a, you know, a big commitment to device space and time and cost, uh, native apps are engaging, but uh, only a few are worth installing. Now, based on a recent study, uh, something like, you know, the average user is, is installing, like, zero apps per month. Um, this certainly does not mean that uh, users are not using native apps. But, you know, by contrast from our own data, something like uh, the average mobile user visits, like, around 100 sites per month. Um, you know, this is the, the power of URLs and uh, the ephemerality of the web, particularly to meet, you know, like one-off needs. I think one way to think of the difference between native and web apps is on the capability access. Uh, you know, native apps start up quickly and uh, reliably when you tap the icon, they tend to work offline. So, you know, who here, like, when do you ever open a web browser when you know you're offline? You know, that's just not what people do. Um, you know, native apps can use uh, push notifications, sync in the background, and so on. And they've had, you know, access for some time to device sensors like microphones, cameras, and so on. Um, by contrast, the web has been seen to be, I don't know, like safer, more respectful of privacy maybe, but it hasn't had those capabilities. I think, you know, what if we could add those capabilities and the web could get that engagement and meet those UX expectations. You know, we could have the best of both worlds. And, uh, you know, this is what progressive web apps represent. Um, a user experience that's good enough, like integrated enough, so it can actually earn a place on the home screen. And the notification tray, without having to give up that reach to get that. 
this is really the core point. Uh, progressive web apps is really just a term for, you know, like radically improving the quality of the end-to-end -end user experience. We, we want to learn from native apps. We want to take what's best from native apps and bring that to the web. And, and this requires being really honest about what matters to users. So in order to do that, I think we need to focus on four things. Uh, we need to make the web fast. We need to make web experiences better integrated with device, you know, hardware platforms and other apps. Uh, we need to make sure that web experiences are reliable and we need to keep users engaged. So I want to look at each of those properties in a little more detail. Now, from a really good native app, you know, users do not expect janky scrolling or slow load performance. And, you know, the web has had a bad name for slow performance, I think, particularly on mobile. And by performance, I mean, like, in-page, you know, performance like scrolling and so on, as well as load performance. And in, in a sense, um, an app has to be kind of invisible. You know, sh users should not be aware that they're actually loading an app. It should just work. And we want to see that on the web. And this isn't just a kind of abstract goal. You know, we all know that time is money on the web. Um, this data from uh, Soatza, you know, shows just how much that is true. After only like a little more than three seconds, something like 20% of your users will abandon the experience. Um, and you know, there's evidence that, uh, that users are getting shorter attention spans, that this is getting tighter every year. So a couple of other numbers, you know, it takes the average web page on mobile 19 seconds to load on a 3G connection. You know, that's really bad for everyone. Um, for every one second delay in page load, we calculate that uh, sites lose something like 7% uh, of conversions. You know, that's really bad for business. Um, you know, we really need to fix this. And one of the, I think one of the side effects, you know, thinking about this on the web, uh, of the reach of the web, is that you do not have control where users start in your experience, like which page they hit first on your site. You know, you can't dictate like you can with a native app where users start. So we've been working to make sure that uh, wherever someone starts, they start fast. Uh, you know, pages need to be reliable and fast from the first time that users load them. And to fix this, last year we started working on a project, Accelerated Mobile Pages, known as AMP. Uh, this is an open source project to create super fast web pages. You know, we all know that uh, accessing pages on the mobile web can be, can be painful, and AMP is a framework to ensure that content loads reliably. We've been able to prove this over the last year. Uh, AMP pages load, on average, in less than a second. On average, they use less, like 10% less data than compared to non-AMP pages. This is particularly important for users, you know, where data is expensive, where people are really constrained by their use of data. Uh, a good example of this, doing great work actually, the, the Weather Channel, they've seen like a, a four times increase in click-through rates. It's fantastic on their AMP articles and into their main site. Um, you know, that's up from something like 21 to like 90% click-through rate, which is great since launching the beginning of this year. So, you know, instant access to information is, is really valuable, like, you know, this example of these giant hailstones, you know. Weather.com, they, they get that, and uh, I think, you know, AMP is really paying off for them. Now, AMP was originally focused on publishers and static content. The format has been constantly evolving to support, you know, really critical new features uh, and verticals like, uh, like e-commerce. Um, merchants can now use AMP to build really interactive and uh, engaging pages. And a, and a lot of uh, e-commerce e partners have really started to, uh, to do that. Uh, last summer, eBay launched all their product listing pages on AMP. Over 15 million pages reliably load in less than a second. Um, and now they're launching product pages worldwide on AMP. Uh, and that means that you know, users can go from searching on Google to actually buying something on eBay in like milliseconds. Uh, so in total for AMP, since launch, there have been over 2 billion AMP pages, 900,000 domains. And yeah, every second, 58 AMP pages released into the wild. That's incredible. Um, if, you wanna, if you wanna learn more about AMP, uh, check out Ben Morse's presentation uh, after lunch today. We have an AMP training session tomorrow afternoon as well. 
And you'll find out like AMP and Progressive Web Apps, now they work really well. The, the two attitudes to building for the web work really well together. Now to build sites that, you know, as the slogan goes, to start fast and stay fast. So as well as speed, users expect this app-like integration with their device hardware, the operating system, and other apps. Um, you know that feeling when you use a really great native app, you get that tight connection right from the start. You can focus on you want, what you want to achieve, and you kind of forget that you're using an app. Um, I think that users shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't have to feel like they're reaching through a browser tab in order to access your app. In fact, the user shouldn't have to think about the fact they're on the web. They're just, you know, using their phone or their tablet or desktop to complete whatever is their task. So just one example of this, this is like dear to my heart because I've worked on this stuff, is uh, media. You know, in the past, it's been really difficult uh, to get media working well on the web. Um, and people have felt like they had to consume media in an app. Uh, this just isn't the case anymore. Um, you know, we work really hard across platforms to make media more effective. Um, and also, you know, just to ensure that uh, video, audio content can be included in the page. And it just works. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, great new APIs to build robust, you know, secure, efficient uh, media experiences um, that can even work offline. Um, this is a particularly important problem to solve, you know. Um, over 70% of internet traffic now is uh, actually video. That number's increasing. It's incredible. Um, you know, we need, the, all the browsers need to ensure that we can get this, you know, really complete solution across different browsers for the mobile web, for media. So we have these, uh, these new APIs that are improving uh, capability for media on the web. I would really recommend checking out, uh, this is Paul Lewis's fantastic progressive web app for media publishing. It's at uh, bit.ly slash PWA media. Uh, it gives you like uh, adaptive streaming, pre-caching for faster load. You know, orientation chain give, change gives you like instant uh, full screen, you get uh, custom controls, thumbnails, and so on. And you know, for me, th I mean, this is amazing. This is amazing to see this happening on the web. It's a beautiful app, I really recommend that. So the technology is uh, opening up the web to even more platforms, even more experiences. Uh, with Web VR API, we get this incredible expressive power on the web. Uh, this is enabling companies, you know, like within to uh, bring this these really incredible experiences from VR creators, creators from around the world, you know, directly to the browser. We have companies like Sketchfab bringing these amazing VR scenes. I believe they have like 1.5 million of these that you can explore. Um, this would look really wonderful if everyone here had a VR headset. Uh, would also look a bit weird, I guess. But anyway, you get, you know, you get a sense of what is possible. And, you know, looking forward uh, to the advent of uh, augmented reality, uh, this idea of connecting information, data, uh, with the physical world. You know, we think the web is going to play a pivotal, a pivotal role there as, uh, as well. I uh, think about integration. I just wanted to touch on uh, new capabilities also for e-commerce. Um, you know, mobile commerce is a huge deal. Uh, last year, mobile commerce was worth, just in the US, was worth something like $123 billion. Uh, you can imagine what the figure is for Europe. This is actually a fundamental challenge for the web. So the web has gone mobile, but conversions are, we calculate, something like one third lower on uh, mobile than desktop. And then, you know, this makes sense. Um, it's hard to enter data on a phone. And we need better integration, you know, because e-commerce is, is really all about removing friction. So browsers have worked to, you know, uh, improve this with autofill, and that's great. Today on Chrome, we have something like, you know, nine billion forms and passwords, which are autofilled each month. This is good, but, you know, it's not enough. The payment request API goes a step further than this. This is a W3C standard for browsers to present a, you know, a standardized interface for users to enter payment and shipping data. So the users get you know, a consistent, secure experience, and you know, developers don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And you know, this works from like a tiny boutique right up to you know, some e-commerce giant. Uh, sites can call the payment request API, like in the screencast here. 
the browser, you know, then securely can store email shipping credit card data on file for the user. So the, the browser can provide a merchant with all this in one form, you know, pre-populated, you know, again, to reduce friction. So you can see that the, uh, the web has become this, you know, highly capable platform. It's tightly integrated with uh, underlying operating system, hardware capabilities. Um, users need better reliability as well. You know, at present, users like have not come to expect the web to work without a network connection, yeah? And like most of us don't even bother to try when connectivity is slow or intermittent. We really need to change that perception. Web apps must be reliable. When a user taps like on a home screen icon, they expect it to load instantly and reliably. You know, launched from the home screen, apps should never, ever show the dinosaur. Um, thinking back to the 90s, you know, when the web was growing up, does anyone know what this actually is? Maybe not, maybe a few people. <laughs> you know, for those who've never seen it, this, this is like how we got online, probably from some, you know, monolithic desktop machine somewhere in the house in the basement or something, you know, with this modem, you had to put the whole house into like online mode. I remember like back in the day, you know, 56K to me would have been really exciting because, you know, we'd grown up on like 14K. And, you know, what you have to do is like yell to the whole house, like don't pick up the phone or that would like kill the connection, you know, in the middle of a download or whatever. And of course, in those days, you know, we knew that we were online because nothing else was happening. Now, we think of the internet uh, and connectivity kind of more like a utility, you know, like gas or electricity, almost like oxygen, you know. Users are coming to expect connectivity to be available all the time. And, you know, we've become used to this. And uh, this means that, uh, you know, seeing this dinosaur is just not an option. You imagine if you go to, went to a native app and you got some kind of system generated error message, you know, when the device was offline. You know, you just think, what? This is crazy. But we've become used to this on the web. We have to deal with this. We have to solve this. The other problem is that, uh, as we know, mobile phones, you know, they're not just online or offline. It's not a binary state. Uh, they exist in this kind of Schrodinger's cat state, you know. Is it on? Is it off? Um, you know, we get these problems with cell connectivity, like, you know, you've got four bars here, but it turns out you do not have a working connection. So it's not just no connection that breaks our experience, it's slow or it intermittent connections that can really uh, be worse for users. And like I say, mobile apps should, how you know, much as I love the cute little dinosaur, you know, they should never show him. Um, no other app, you know, will show this. And so, you know, in order for web apps to, to really earn their place on the home screen, you know, we need to make them reliable even when the network is not reliable. And this is where service workers come in. Um, I just wanted to ask who has heard of service workers and you know, feels like they have a pretty good idea of why they're game changing for the web? Oh, that's great actually, hooray. <laughs> that's really good to see. You know, the, for those of you who don't know about service worker, the traditional web model has been like, you know, you type in a URL or you click on a link or a bookmark or whatever, and the browser goes to the network, looks up the web server and uh, retrieves the resources required for a page. Um, now, the browser, of course, has an HTTP cache, um, but, you know, if the network is down, you know, you get a visit from uh, our friend, the dinosaur. Um, and the user experience, obviously, can be even worse with uh, flaky connectivity. So, a service worker is a client-side proxy, acts as an intermediary between your app and the outside world. Uh, you write a service worker in JavaScript in a separate file, kind of like a web worker. And after the first visit, the service worker is installed. And after that, it can intercept, respond to events like network requests. Um, and, you know, the service worker then can use the cache API to cache resources and work with storage uh, features like IndexedDB for data and so on. And that enables you, the developer, the, the, you know, the site owner, to decide when to use the cache and when to go to the network. This is extremely powerful. Um, like I said, you know, service workers are acting like a proxy between your app and the outside world. Now, this means that they can also handle like incoming events as well as outgoing requests. 
Uh, push notifications are a great example of this. Uh, push messages are received by, you know, by the operating system, via whatever push service uh, it uses, and then passed on to the browser. The uh, push event from the browser then wakes up the relevant service worker that subscribed to it, and then that can call a push handler. The really nice thing is here that the browser does not even need to be open. You know, this is fantastic for reducing usage of you know, memory, CPU, battery, and so on. I think you know, this kind of, I don't know, capability for engagement, re-engagement is where progressive web apps are, you know, are really coming alive. So, of course, a truly engaging app needs to kind of go beyond being you know, just functional and reliable and ensure that like, the whole experience is delightful and it makes it easier you know, for the user to do what they need to do. Really good experiences on the web, they need to have the right capabilities, use them at the right time in a you know, beautiful way. Uh, Twitter is a great example of this. Uh, they launched a progressive web app in spring this year. They'd noticed like their web traffic was growing and yet you know, the experience wasn't great. Uh, so they set out to redesign their mobile web experiences at PWA. Uh, and this is a great place to look to see what can be done on the web. They had three goals in mind. They you know, needed to cope with slow or flaky networks and they had to consume less data. This is critically important for a, a global service for all their users. And you know, Twitter needs to work well for a huge variety of smartphones uh, from high end to low end, you know, some of which have tiny levels of storage and limited CPU and so on. Um, for those of you who have got a phone in your hand, you can check this out right now, mobile.twitter.com. You'll see how like, fast and smooth the scrolling is. Now, performance is a huge priority for Twitter. Um, they can you know, access uh, photos and, and videos for upload. You can see a tweet going on here. And of course, the web can now send uh, push notifications. Uh, you know, on Android, these appear alongside native web app notifications. And th this is a fantastic re-engagement tool. I believe uh, Twitter are now sending out something like uh, 10 million push notifications per day, which is incredible. Uh, what I really love, though, is that Twitter can deliver this experience at a fraction of the size compared to native. Uh, you know, you can see here the difference that a progressive web app can make. Um, so how can a PWA be so small? Um, well, you know, when you download an app, you download everything that the app needs, which is why you get those data sizes. But the PWA can leverage the resources of the browser and then you know, progressively install more assets and data as required. And again, this is a huge deal for, like, we need to remember that, like, for a lot of users in, in many regions, uh, their constraint is actually from data cost uh, as well as connectivity. So you need to remember that and bear that in mind. So, as you might expect, you know, Twitter is getting great metrics for their PWA compared to their previous mobile experience. And they're getting something like a million daily visits, uh, users coming from the home screen icon, which is great. I've seen the same from a company called Ola. This is like India's uh, largest ride hailing service. It's interesting, that, you know, their mission was uh, to build mobility for a billion you know, Indians. It's an incredible scale. Like they started just like six years ago, the co-founders, they would actually drive customers if a cab didn't show up. Um, and now they're up to like a million rides a day, something like that. Um, but you know, that was not enough when their target was like, you know, billions of users. What they needed to do was to target tier two and tier three cities. These are like smaller cities, 20 to maybe 100K in size. A lot of users in those cities uh, get flaky connectivity and uh, are using, uh, you know, uh, cheaper smartphones. And it makes sense for those people not to actually install apps because of limited storage and the cost of data. So with Ola, you know, their progressive web app, you get smooth navigation, which is great. You get this fantastic, robust UX and, you know, great functionality even on low bandwidth. So since launch, what they've seen is that things are going well for them in, in the tier two cities, but uh, what's really nice is that they're seeing great conversions uh, up in the tier three cities, up like 
Uh, this is a fundamental point that progressive web apps are allowing them to address new audiences, new market. One stat I really like from them actually is that like 20% of their progressive web app bookings are actually from users who had previously uninstalled the app. You know, this is fantastic. It's worth remembering that a lot of users, you know, for because of device memory constraints, whatever, are regularly uninstalling apps. And you know, you don't get that on the web. Um, if you want to find out more about like what Ola and Twitter have done, uh, check out their case studies on web fundamentals. I'll be sharing a link with that at the end of the, of the uh, presentation. Just briefly getting back to the topic of engagement, um, you know, when a user visits your site, you can now prompt them to add the site to their home screen. Great example of doing this really well is Trivago, the travel site. Uh, they have like progressive web app for something like 55 domains globally, it's incredible. And uh, yeah, as you can see, the add to home screen process here works really, really well. And then it's, you know, this app is now like tightly integrated with the Android device. It's displayed in the app launcher, just like other apps, and it's part of Android settings, which is great. Um, now, but given, you know, this focus on Android, you might be wondering, well, is this progressive web app thing, you know, like is this a Google thing? And the answer is no. A, a big part of what makes progressive web apps so successful is that multiple browsers are committed to them. You know, developer adoption is obviously growing, but so is browser support. Uh, Opera, Samsung, Microsoft, Mozilla are on board with the features I've discussed. And of course, you might have also heard that, you know, like service workers are in development for Safari, which is great. But progressive web apps are, you know, are really about that attitude to building web experiences that work well for all your users, you know, so you can count on reaching users that are important to you. The word progressive is, you know, it's in progressive web apps. It's not there by accident. Um, we need to focus on this end-to-end -end user experience, and that can give a, you know, a really dramatic impact to your business. Um, even with users, you know, who can't experience the full power of progressive web apps because they're using a device that does not support some particular feature. Uh, a great example of this, the, the luxury cosmetics brand, like Longcom, uh, they built this great PWA, yeah? But I, I want to call this out because uh, something like 65% of their users are actually on iOS. Um, what they found was that when they built their progressive web app and used the kind of techniques that we're advocating and you can learn more about today, uh, that they were getting much higher engagement. Um, and this is fantastic, you know, th it just means that uh, this is a good investment for you no matter what the browser mix is that, that uh, you're targeting. Gartner has recently published a report advocating that uh, PWAs should be part of a mobile development strategy and, you know, this idea that uh, progressive web apps will begin to replace general purpose apps. So, I know this, you know, this sounds great, uh, but I also know that reality sinks in, you know, you go back to your day job and you think about building a progressive web app and it could seem like this uh, huge undertaking. Um, but implementing these techniques need not be this monolithic refactoring task. I want to talk about some ways to get started. Um, first and foremost, you need security, yeah? HTTPS is table stakes for progressive web apps to keep your users and your business safe. Uh, this is not just for sites that work with sensitive data. You know, any site can be a target that's vulnerable for attack. And the green lock, you know, indicates that uh, that site is secure, and is a secure connection between your users and your site. And this means three things. Uh, the user must be able to trust that the site is actually you, not a scammer or a fisher. They must be assured that no one can tamper with the content. And then they need to be assured that no one is listening to the interaction between them and your site. You know, the, the web has this tremendous reach and lack of friction, but you know, keeping users safe is absolutely paramount. And for this reason, uh, HTTPS is mandatory for many of the uh, APIs now on the web, you know, including service worker, geolocation, uh, camera access, WebRTC APIs, and so on. So once you've moved to a secure domain, three, di three approaches to moving to a progressive web app. Uh, you know, you, you can build from the ground up, you can start with a simple version, or you could focus on a single feature. I just want to have a quick look at these. So 
you know, starting from the ground up makes sense when you're going through a redesign. If you're starting from scratch, well, you can build that aptness right in from the start using service workers and so on. OLX is a great example of this. Uh, they launched their site uh, for classified ads in India, you know, providing communities with these great markets, and uh, they've seen, you know, fantastic improvement in time to interactive, drops in bounce rates, and so on. And they wanted to re-engage with their users, yeah, and uh, including their mobile app users, and they've had fantastic results with that. And again, they, they built this right from scratch. But of course, not everyone can do this. You know, starting from scratch is not realistic. Uh, an example of a, a different approach is Air Berlin. They uh, built this post check-in uh, app where you can get all the details for your flight. You know, they weren't able to just start everything from scratch. Check out their stuff. Uh, they've done a beautiful job of this. And uh, you know, you can get your boarding pass, all those details, even when the app is then offline. Um, now, the final strategy is, you know, just to define, is to, to pick on one particular strategy. Um, Weather.com have done a great job with this, with notifications. Um, I would really, really recommend, they've rolled this out in like 60 languages. Um, if you're looking at UX for notifications, I would really recommend you look at what they've done. They've done a beautiful job of this within a PWA experience. And they've seen, you know, great results from this. Uh, a million opt-ins within a month and so on. So check out their work, I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend that. Um, so, you know, I would look at these different approaches if you're thinking of building a progressive web app. Uh, come along to Ava's talk uh, about how to get started with uh, moving from website to PWA later. It's an excellent talk and she'll talk more about how you can get started with that stuff. So we're seeing great momentum, different verticals. You know, uh, with uh, travel companies on the web, we've seen uh, like publishers, partners like Forbes. Forbes has seen like uh, double in user engagement since the launch of their PWA, which is fantastic. And in e-commerce sites as well, Fandango, Alibaba, um, Rakuten and so on, they've all invested really successfully in progressive web apps. And also like newer services like ride sharing companies. Um, you know, this is just a sample of some of the people who are actively working with PWAs and new web APIs. Check out their work. They've done beautiful work on, you know, building great sites. And they're just finding, like, ways to start down this path, investing in, uh, I don't know, the mobile web and getting down this path of building progressive web apps. So I think, you know, progressive web apps for these companies, it's giving them, you know, reach and capability, the ability to target new audiences and new markets, which is, you know, incredibly exciting on the web. Um, if you want to learn more about this, we have some great sessions coming up, uh, some good presentations today and tomorrow. We'll have, like I say, a lot of expert web Googlers on hand to answer your questions, solve your problems. I'd also strongly recommend the training sessions from Sarah Clark and her team. These are really, really good and really good people running those uh, sessions. And uh, if you want to find out more, please check out Web Fundamentals, like case studies, resources at developers.google.com slash web. Uh, most of all, please feel free to come and talk to us, any of the Googlers. There's a bunch of web Googlers here. You know, we're here to learn what you're doing on the web, what we can do to make the web better and to help you, you know, build better experiences for all your users. Thank you very much, and we'll see you around. Thank you.
If you've been working in web development, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Mobile Web Specialist Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can demonstrate the skills of an advanced level mobile web developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or if you're ready to take the exam. You can reference our study guide and training is available online. When you're ready, sign up and take the exam. As part of the sign up, you'll pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you'll pay 6,500 rupees. If you live outside of India, you'll pay 99 US dollars. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you'll receive a voucher that you can use to schedule the exam. The exam is a timed, performance-based assessment in which you'll write code to solve challenges and demonstrate your skills in mobile web development. You'll have four hours to finish, after which you will submit the exam and respond to a set of exit interview questions. If after grading you're successful, you'll receive a digital badge from Google and join our community of Google-certified mobile web specialists. Once you're certified, you can share your badge on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. Ready to start your journey? Hey, Polycasters, and welcome to a surprise edition of the Meownica Show. So if you work in software development, and you don't exercise your design skills, just practice, just do it. Do it even though you know that it's bad. If you want to improve the quality of your site but don't know where to start, the new audits panel is a great place to get some inspiration. This is a quick web series about solving web problems with standards. Let's go. I'll be right here to tell you what's new in Chrome. That's a Webpack performance. One day I'll get around to learning it. You could just watch this video. Knowing what is and what is not visible can be very useful information. I can change these properties in DevTools to find the ideal value for my layout. It's Rob Dotson. Welcome back to the Alley Cash Show. I want to show you what just landed in Chrome DevTools version 60. So follow me over here to the laptop. If you want the latest news and ideas in web development, subscribe to the Google Chrome Developers YouTube channel.
Hello everyone, my name is Rebecca Franks and today I'm gonna to be speaking to you about Android Things and why I think it is the IoT platform for everyone. So what is Android Things? Android Things is an extension of the Android platform for IoT and embedded devices. We've come to know Android on our phones for many years, but Android has also been available for us on our watches, on our TVs with Android TV, and also in our cars with Android Auto. Now, with Android Things, you can have Android on any device that you can imagine. So Android Things is ideal for powerful, intelligent devices that need to be secure. Some examples of where Android Things would really work well is in the retail industry for things such as interactive ads or vending machines powered by Android. Also in the business industry, with things such as cameras, smart access meters, anything of that sort. In the logistics industry, you could think of using Android things in some, some form of application of asset tracking or predictive service. But Android things is also very suitable for home automation. So a smart doorbell or an energy, energy monitoring system would also do well with Android things. So a question that you're probably wondering is, how similar is Android development to Android things? And the answer is, it's very, very similar. So when you're developing for Android things, you're using the Android SDK. So all the APIs and all the different things you've learned as an Android developer are similar for you to do with Android things. You're also using Android Studio. So you're just building an Android app and using it and putting it on your Android Things device. You can also use the Play services, so something like the Nearby API or the Vision API you can use on Android Things. And because it's just Android as well, you can use the Firebase SDKs and re leverage the real-time database or most of the other Firebase options. You can also use the cloud platform, so things such as the Google Cloud IoT Core or any of the PubSub Stuff like that you can use with Android things. And the best part is because it's just an Android app that you're building, you can use any other Android library that you've been used to. So if you like developing your apps in Kotlin, or you're a big fan of RxJava, you can do that with Android things as well. So now we've seen how similar Android things is to Android development, but there's a, a couple of differences that you have to keep in mind when developing for Android things. So the first big one is that there's no Play Store that you're shipping your apps onto. So your app is the only one that runs on the device, and there's no such thing as a Play Store where, the where users can go and install other apps from. There's also a subset of APIs that are available for you. So things such as your notifications aren't available anymore because displays are optional with Android things. Also, when you're developing for Android things, you're using custom hardware. So this is probably the biggest difference when you're developing for Android versus Android things. So the custom hardware that you build is what you ship to your clients. So we're used to shipping our apps, building uh, on the Play Store, and having people download it from the App Store. But this is people building their own hardware, shipping the hardware and the software together. So it's also useful and it's used as a single purpose device. And what I mean by that is that your app and your stuff that runs on this device is the only thing that will be there. There's nothing else, so the users aren't installing anything else on the device. And then because there's no Play Store, you're deploying OTAs to your clients and not app updates like you used to. So this is the typical software stack of a traditional Android mobile device. Kernels and libraries are primarily focused on enabling hardware driver support. Application frameworks provide a rich set of APIs for our apps to use. And applications provide user-facing general use for general use cases, such as our launches, our phones, and our messaging apps. Now with Android Things, we remove a couple of these, these different APIs and applications that have been typically available for you as an Android developer. So the default user-facing apps have been removed, so you no longer have the launcher or the phone or messaging capabilities on Android things. 
optional displays also mean that some APIs have some modified behavior. So things such as your notifications or your system UI have been removed with Android Things. Now, when you're developing for Android Things, you get the Android Things support library as part of your development. So some things such as the peripheral I.O. and device management come bundled with Android Things SDK. We'll go into a little bit more detail around those later. So Android Things uses a system on module architecture, so, or a SOM architecture. So the system is designed around a core computing module that is located on a bigger breakout board during prototyping and development. And then when you move into production, this smaller system on module chip is used and built on a custom breakout board that you would ship to your clients. This reduces costs and simplifies hardware development because of the complex hardware design that is encapsulated within the SOM. The Google Managed Board Support Package creates a stable la software layer for developers to rely on. So this means if your hardware design should change, you don't need to worry as much because the Board Support Package will support it. So SOM-based designs make production certification testing a lot easier to do. So all electronics in the market must undergo some kinds of certification before you ship them to your clients. And this process can be very, very costly. And when you're using the SOM architecture design, it's a lot, it simplifies this cost and Google handles all the complexity for you. So when you're developing with Android things, there's a couple of things that are managed by Google and things that are managed by you. So when uh, Google manages the Android framework, the hardware libraries, and the Linux kernel. So you don't need to worry about that. And then you as a developer will need to manage the apps and user drivers that you'll ship onto your devices. No, you no longer need to worry about sending security updates or making, maintaining an OS. Uh, Android Things maintains that for you. So the Android Things console is what you would use as a developer to ship OTA updates to your devices. So you manage your Android IoT product on this Android Things console. You can download and install the latest version of Android Things system images on this, IoT con this Android Things console. And you can also build factory images that contain the OEM applications along with the system images. On this console itself, you can also push OTA updates to your different clients. And if you head over to partner.android.com forward slash things that forward slash console, you can head and see this, this console. Taking a quick look at the console though, this is what you would typically see if you're developing your app. So this is, I've created, it's a candy dispenser. And on this, I set that I want to include the Google Play services with it. But this is where you would, what you would typically see when you're managing your own product. If you head to the factory images tab on the Android Things console, you can see exactly where you would need to upload your applications that you're shipping. So it's what we call a bundle. And this is what, it's a, just a zip file that contains your APKs that you want to ship, as well as possibly a boot animation if you want to change that. You can then choose the version of Android Things that you want to be building your, uh, your firmware version for. And then you can download this factory image and flash this on the devices that you're using. If you've already got devices out in, in production, you can then ship OTA updates by doing the same process, selecting the bundle and the factory image, and then doing a push update. Cool, so we've got a little bit of background on how Android Things works and what it is. So I'm gonna take a quick look at how we can develop for Android Things. So to get started with Android Things, you would need to purchase or obtain a developer kit. So there are two that I particularly like, the NXP IMX 7D or the Raspberry Pi 3. And these, what you would typically do is, with the Raspberry Pi, you would download the factory image and flash it on the SD card like you would normally do with any other operating system for Raspberry Pi. You would then start up the device and you would have Android things running on it. From this point on, you can connect to it over Wi-Fi or via the USB cable. I particularly like the NXP a lot more than the Raspberry Pi because it's a lot easier to debug. So when you're developing, you can just develop over the USB cable and you don't need to worry about Wi-Fi. 
So because we're developing custom apps, we can use custom hardware with our devices. And in order to access these different hardware peripherals that we might include on our devices, there are different, different options for you to do. So I like to think of it as two different ways, one being the difficult way and one being the easy way. And the peripheral I.O. extension is what I like to think of as a bit more of a difficult way. But basically what this gives you is access to all the different protocols that you might be used to if you have done any kind of IoT development before. So things such as your GPIO or your uh, PWM protocol, you can get access to those using the peripheral I.O. manager. But this does sound a little bit tricky, so if this is not your thing, you can head to the peripheral Java library on GitHub, and this gives you access to a whole bunch of pre-built drivers that you can use within your Android Things application. So things such as a GPS or a button or a server motor are all available for you if you head to that link down below. So I like to think of it as if you don't really know what you're doing with Android things, you can do the GitHub library, versus if you don't know, if you're more into getting low-level access, you can use the standard protocols. Okay, so we're gonna try quickly build an app, and this is basically what we have on screen here is a breadboard with a button and an LED. So this seems really simple. I mean, why do we need Android Things involved? But we're just gonna have Android Things control the LED when the button is pressed. So what we're gonna do is we have two, uh, two pins that we're using in this case, and this is what I like to refer to as the pinout diagram. So this might be a little bit confusing, but if you have these devices, you'll see there's about 40 or so pins on a Raspberry Pi or on the other kits. And because they look the same, doesn't necessarily mean they do the same thing. So what you wanna do now is we're gonna be using BCM6 for the button and BCM21 for the LED. Okay, so what we would do is in Android Studio, we would head to creating a new application. So we can just, in Android Studio 3.0, we create a new project and we would select the Android things as an option that we want to build for. We can then choose to have an empty activity that we're using, and then automatically the app adds the compile-only dependency into your app-level build.gradle. Now at the moment, the latest version is 0.5.1 dev preview, but this is constantly being updated, so make sure to check out the latest version. So automatically in your Android manifest file, we've added the user's library tag, which indicates that you need to use the Android Things library, that the device requires this library to be installed. Then, on that activity that we created, we have added an intent filter automatically. So this means that when the device reboots, it'll automatically boot into this activity that we've created. You would need to add this stuff yourself if you haven't gone through the Create New Android Things project from scratch. You would need to do these all yourself. Now in our example, we had a button that we were using in order to get pressed events. So what I'm gonna do is use the button from the GitHub support library that we saw earlier. So I'm just using it within Gradle, putting it in my uh, build.gradle file, and now I get access to a button. So I would create a new button by saying new uh, equals new button, and I give it the pin that we were talking about earlier. In this case, BCM6 pin. Now you must just remember that this button is not the same as the android.widget.button. It is a different one from the Android Things support libraries. Now, what you can do is set an on-click listener on the button, and this will get fired whenever we receive a physical button press. And all we're gonna do in this case is set the value of our LED GPR open to true or false. Now this might be a little bit confusing first, but we'll get into the LED GPIO pin next. The next thing we need to do is make sure that we close the button access that we have. This just frees up any resources that we were using before. So to get access to the LED that we have, we would just get access to the peripheral manager service uh, API. 
So what this is, is it's provided by the Android support library, and you can just use it by importing and using that compile dependency. So we would just then say service.opengpio with the pin number that we used previously, and then we would set the direction of the pin to out initially low. And then we can access that pin and set it to true or false if we need to. Now, in our, that's where we would do in the button. We would set it to true when the button is pressed, and we get the button event false when the user lifts up their, their finger. We would also need to then just close up this, this pin as well. So in our on destroy method, we would then typically go LED GPIO.close. And there we have a blinking LED powered by Android Things. So now that we've seen how to build a simple Android Things project, there's a couple of examples that I want to go through that you can have a look at if you head to hacks.io forward slash Google. So the first example is by Dave Smith, and this is what we call the Edison candle. Now you might think it's a bit silly to have a candle powered by Android Things, but this example is for you to understand how to go from a prototype all the way into production and all the different things you would need in order to get there. So be sure to check out that project on Hackster. The next project that I want to highlight is what they call the Piano Hero. This one is actually on display if you go head up to the Android Things stand. And this one is basically just using a keyboard powered by Android Things, and you can sort of play something like Guitar Hero, but for a piano. And this was built by the team at Novoda. And then one other one that I'd like to talk about is my own one, and this is what I call an electricity monitoring app. Now, where I'm from in South Africa, we suffer quite regularly from power outages. And I had this problem where I didn't know when I had power at home versus when I didn't. So I built this app using Android Things and the Firebase SDKs. And all the app does is runs on my, on my Pi at home with no other peripherals connected. And when I don't have power at home, I get a notification on my phone to say the power is off or the power has come back on. It also keeps track of how long I've had power for at my house, which is really useful. So how I did that using Firebase, a quick little code dive. Basically, with Firebase, you get a really nice SDK called the info.connected. And this tells you if you are connected to the internet or not. So technically, my electricity monitoring is actually just a network monitor, but my network's a lot more reliable than my power. So for me, it's, it serves me fine. So what we would do here is we'd just get access to if I'm online or not, and then we add a value event listener on this. And then for this part, we would then check on the data snapshot, am I online or not? And if I am, set the value on the server to true, and add what we call the on disconnect listener. So this is where it becomes super powerful, because the on disconnect listener says when this client disconnects from the server, on the server, set a certain value to true or false. And then on my server, I'm using the Firebase cloud functions to determine if I should send a notification or not. I'm monitoring this node, and if anything changes, a push notification gets sent down to the device. Another cool project that I actually built myself is what we call an AI candy dispenser. So this one has been built by Alvaro Vibrance, and you can find this one on Hackster as well. But this one, what's really cool about it is it's using the TensorFlow API uh, offline on the device. So how it works is when you press the button, it asks you, you play a game with it. So it asks you, please show me a photo of a cat or a lion or something like that. And you have to quickly go search for one on the internet, or maybe you have some of those objects lying around. And then show this, this image to the device. And it uses TensorFlow to try and classify the image that it has on the device. And then it says, yes or no, it's a cat, it's a lion, you've got it right. And then it dispenses candy. And this is all powered using Android Things and the TensorFlow libraries. So I encourage you to add your project to Hackster.io, and you can head to Hackster.io forward slash Google. So if you've built anything with Android Things, please be sure to add it there, as it will be really valuable for everyone else to see. So why Android Things? 
Well, it's the power of Android in your own hands on these devices. Google manages the complexity of automatic and secure updates. And it's a lot easier for you as a developer to manage these things. So if you're still curious about learning more, at one o'clock there's an instructor-led training by Renato on hands-on learning with Android things, and you can actually create your own IoT device there. I'll be available in the, uh, in the office hours upstairs on floor three if you have any questions. And if you're on your way out, there will be IoT cards that you can get your own IoT device at this conference itself. So thank you very much. Cool. With the instant access of the web, there's no place that I can't reach. The impact of the web on the newsroom was monumental. It's now more the reader telling the newsroom, this is important to me. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With the Progressive Web app, there's a link, tap it, install it with no friction. The PWA is on their phone, done. And once that is installed, we are able to alert you to, hey, we got some more information for you. If you're interested in whatever areas that you are, you can install that subject, that topic, and we're going to serve you the content that you want. And that's going to change our business in a big way. The technology has enabled us to make our new PWA faster than their current mobile site. We're now able to deliver visuals faster. And if you can start to deliver visuals faster, then you can start to change the formats you do. People are willing to stay longer. If they stay longer, they see more advertising. The PWA is going to result in more personalization. Personalization will yield more engagement. The web has made me realize there's an audience out there. There's an audience that's knowledgeable, and there's an audience that needs to be understood. With the instant access of the web, there's no place that I can't reach. The impact of the web on the newsroom was monumental. It's now more the reader telling the newsroom, this is important to me. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With the Progressive Web app, there's a link, tap it, install it with no friction. The PWA is on their phone, done. And once that is installed, we are able to alert you to, hey, we got some more information for you. If you're interested in whatever areas that you are, you can install that subject, that topic, and we're going to serve you the content that you want. And that's going to change our business in a big way. The technology has enabled us to make our new PWA faster than their current mobile site. We're now able to deliver visuals faster. And if you can start to deliver visuals faster, then you can start to change the formats you do. People are willing to stay longer. 
if they stay longer, they see more advertising. The PWA is going to result in more personalization. Personalization will yield more engagement. The web has made me realize there's an audience out there. There's an audience that's knowledgeable and there's an audience that needs to be understood. Banking should be painless, easy, fast, and it should just assist you in doing whatever you want to do. So actually, it's our strategy to empower people to take a step ahead in life and in business. If you look at our company, we have all this different IT landscape in all the countries. Still, we want to be able to share. And that's when we start to look at web components, and web components solve that for us. Because when we use Polymer and web components as the standard underneath, we can suddenly create components which will work in any country. So you can just take that components and start delivering a feature. So now when I'm in that shop looking at that bike, I'm not only checking my balance, I'm also pressing the button, let's look ahead. And what it will tell me, next month your mortgage will be deducted from your account. So maybe this is not the best time to buy that bike. And that's what we're doing it for, for features and not for the UI part. We are starting to see this all developer community, which is moving to one technology and we are seeing more and more people working together from all the countries. When this translates to result, anything can happen. Whether you're just starting out on your journey toward a career in Android development, or you've been working as an Android developer for some time, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Associate Android Developer Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can display the skills of an entry-level Android developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or are ready to take the exam. Training is available online as well as in person.
我在马来西亚长大生活。马来西亚是一个多元文化、多元种族的国家。我们有马来同胞、华人、印裔同胞、卡达山族。虽然大家都有不同的宗教信仰和文化，大家都能在这片土地上和睦共处，这是最值得骄傲的一点。这也是马来西亚的特色。在城市地区，大多数地方都有 WiFi 连接，通常上网不是一个问题。但是可能在比较郊外的地方要上网的话，就可能比较困难，因为设施还不完整。老一辈的都慢慢开始会使用网页，使用 iPad， 用电话上网。父亲并不完全知道我的工作性质是如何，他只知道我是做关于 IT 的，他只知道我是写编写软件的。我爸呢，一开始接触上网的时候，其实他最想要做的就是要知道即时彩票开卷的号码。当他知道他可以上网得知得到这个资讯的时候，他就开始叫叫我和弟弟叫他上网。我爸现在拥有智能手机，他会上网，他会上 Facebook， 他会用 WhatsApp 和我们聊天。我们还有一个家庭组。因为现在很多在，嗯，做 Web Development 的。都是从学校毕业出来，其中一个很大的挑战，你学到的东西并不是和你在领域上面需要的东西是一样的。在他们学习的当中，他们必须要令他们自己精修。所以我觉得必须要做的是，要有一些课程，要去一些学校里面跟他们说，其实现在这这些就是最新的科技发展，你必须要实时,时更新自己。开始找寻我第一份工作的时候，我遇到了困难，因为当时我所学的技术和当时领域需要的技术是不一样的，所以当我去第一份工作面试的时候，我失败了。当时那个面试者对我说：“你不适合做啊、呃、网页开发者。”当时我还蛮伤心的。过后我没放弃，我去面试第二份工作。幸好当时我第二位老板对我蛮好，他说只要你肯做，我就给你机会，所以我就开始做那份工作。过后啊，渐入佳境，我也升职了，还有机会去面面对客户啊，然然后啊，渐渐的我发现我越来越喜欢我现在所做的工作我希望别人叫我工程师，也可以叫我女性工程师。在马来西亚很少找到女性是做 Web Development 的，身为女性还是属于少数的。好像是 Real Girl KL 还是木虎 KL， 我们会有啊、um, Talk 的 Session， 我们会有一些 Meet Up， 我们会有一些 Collab 去教导一些科技之类的知识。所以我觉得这是一个方法去 Gather。女性在同一个 community 里面，就更加方便交流。当你有你们有交流的时候，你就知道别人其他的女性到底在这个领域上面遇到什么问题。Our whole objective is to get more females to take up coding. It's more or less the same problem in any male-dominated industry. Yeah, yeah. For the first project, you you just can't fail. You need to prove yourself. So after that, everything will just go. Just fine. So I think we as a community is the place where we provide the platform for people to, yeah, to start from ground zero. When we um to organize this kind of workshop event, because in Malaysia, there are very few such sessions. If I put the truth ticket on the internet, if we don't control it, maybe. 三十张票就会给男性直接 sign up 了。当然，我们也不是说要
特别特别去。趁到男性去参加这个这个 event， 因为我们是无门户口嘛，我是希望更多的女性参加这个这个 workshop， 所以现在我们做的就是，可能把大概七八十八千的位置先保留给给女性。在传统华人而言呢，父亲是扮演一个比较严厉的角色。父亲通常不会说一些说你令他骄傲的话，只是从别人口中就会听到，就是从他巴沙里的朋友口中就会听得到。一开始我是觉得惊讶，因为他从来没跟我说，这惊讶比较多。惊讶过后就有点窃喜，因为他算满意我的成绩。我觉得呢，网页是无法被代替的，只是有什么事我们可以做，令可以令网页更加 popular， 更加多人使用的。学习网页、学习开发这一部分，在马来西亚还是比较缺少的。我觉得我个人的经历是有影响到我如何去 mentor 新的人去，去去领导他们怎么学习网页。我希望我是其中一个推动网页发展。我希望做到的是，让这种知识更普及，更多人知道如何开发网页。If you've been working in web development, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Mobile Web Specialist Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can demonstrate the skills of an advanced level mobile web developer. 
The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or if you're ready to take the exam. You can reference our study guide and training is available online. When you're ready, sign up and take the exam. As part of the sign up, you'll pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you'll pay 6,500 rupees. If you live outside of India, you'll pay 99 US dollars. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you'll receive a voucher that you can use to schedule the exam. The exam is a timed, performance-based assessment in which you'll write code to solve challenges and demonstrate your skills in mobile web development. You'll have four hours to finish, after which you will submit the exam and respond to a set of exit interview questions. If after grading you're successful, you'll receive a digital badge from Google and join our community of Google certified mobile web specialists. Once you're certified, you can share your badge on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. Ready to start your journey? Hello everyone, my name is Eva Gasperovic. I'm a developer programs engineer here at Google and I'm very happy to see you here at today's session and especially in the beautiful city of Krakow, which I'm very proud of, so welcome. My intention today, my intention today is to shed some light on the process of transforming an existing website into a progressive web app. Me and my team we recently went through a few of such processes, and I would like to share with you some of the things we find out on the way. 
Prob probably by now you've heard a little bit about progressive web apps. The notion of PWAs is making grounds in the industry. And also, if you've been by any chance to some session about PWA, who've been in the morning? I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, plenty of people. Um, you probably know all of them by now. But in a nutshell, progressive web apps are experiences that combine the best of the web and the best of the apps. They are web, they are web experiences, which means um, they have the wonderful reach of the web. There is no installation, and every new experience is just one click away. At the same time, they use to the full extent the capabilities of modern apps and modern devices. It means they are fast, then don't make the user wait for them to load or react. They are, they are integrated, which means they feel like a natural part of your device. They are reliable, which means they load and operate no matter the circumstances. And they are engaging, which means they give users pleasure from using them. This all sounds very new and very exciting, but is it really? Some years back, when I first got my hands on a smartphone and started to browse the web, I totally expected it to work just like on desktop. My expectation was that if I visit a URL, it actually loads, right? That's not too much to ask. And I expected it to load quickly within my attention span. And please mind that for people like me, uh, people like me don't want to get stuck on the loading screen forever. And for people like me, the forever usually means like 30 seconds. That's the reality we live in. 30 seconds is already forever in mobile. So we wanted to, I wanted it to load fast. I wanted it to work smoothly, that I can actually enjoy uh, using the app. And I wanted to uh, have an easy way to access the content and be fully immersed in the experience. So those expectations are pretty old. It's not anything new um, to expect your website to work re really well, just in the way we describe progressive web apps. So why? do we even introduce this concept of progressive web apps as a new concept if all we want to talk about are actually websites just done so well that the user has a real pleasure, pleasure from using it. We use progressive web app notion to build a mental model and to communicate better about our expectations towards the modern web. It just makes it easier for us to wrap our head around it. It also allows us to effectively communicate the expectations and the new possibilities that are coming to the web. And by talking about PWA, we can encode those expectations into different models. Here you can see three of such models. The first, first one is describing behaviors of a progressive web app, fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging. The second one is a PW checklist. If you just Google it and go to the first result, you will see a checklist of features that you can pay attention to in order to enable progressiveness in your app. And finally, we encode also a set of rules in a tool called Lighthouse. Lighthouse can audit a website and give you a report how progressive or not progressive it is. So these are three different models, three different formats of describing a progressive web app, but actually the notion is the same. I'm going to use different tools like this today to talk about progressiveness and how to achieve it on your own website. Okay, getting from a website to a progressive web app is a process. It looks roughly like this. As most of the projects, it starts with a thought an idea, right? In my case, thinking is usually triggered by coffee, so here you go. We start with coffee. And while drinking coffee, you can also ponder about the scope of the project, about the things you want to achieve. After that, once you're done with your coffee, you can go and analyze your website to understand your starting point. You need to have a reference point once you're done implementing PWA features to know how you did. Next step is to prioritize. 
The truth is, we rarely have the resources to implement all of the stuff at once, right? And the cool thing about PWA uh, is that it's a modular concept. It's not a monolithic technology. You can actually pick and choose what to implement and in what order. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. You should always set your priorities according to your user base and your business needs. So always talk to your stakeholders while prioritizing PWA features. Then you should prepare your tools. Every job is easier when you choose the right tools to perform it. Finally, you can just execute your plan, implement the feature. I'll talk about some issues that you can encounter at this step, although it's a very broad topic and by no means I can be exhaustive here. At the end, there is sometimes an overlooked step, the evaluation, measure and evaluate. It gives you both a nice summary of how you did in your migration from website to progressive web app, but it can also be a very valuable starting point for your next iteration on the project. This is how the process looks like, and we're gonna follow it throughout this presentation. Okay, so while drinking our coffee, let's talk about the scope of PWA, what this notion actually includes. We know the goal, we want that we want to deliver the delightful user experience, but what are the actual practical deliverables? Usually, when we talk about PWA, and we talk about these three core technologies first. We talk about service worker and related techniques like caching. They allow you to offer your users an offline experience, but also they can improve reliability of your app, which can now load no matter the circumstances and also positively influence the speed for your second time visitors. Push notifications allow you to send user a message and bring them back to your app or re-engage them. Add to home screen allows you to make your app feel like a first class citizen on your mobile. The user can install it to their home screen and access it easily, making it easy for them to go back to your app again. And all of it, of course, is enabled by HTTPS, which is a bottom line of a secure web experience. I like to call these three features a native parity core because they actually allow us these days to do on the web the same things that just recently were possible only on native apps. And while they make me super excited about the future of the web, I think there is much more to progressive web apps than just the native parity. Well, let's fill some of this white space. Let's add a performance factor. I cannot stress enough how important it is to make your site fast and performant, preferably even before you implement service worker push and add to home screen. Making site performance includes a lot of techniques um, like optimizing your assets, espe especially images, unlocking scripts, and making good use of browser cache. Getting this part right is especially important for your first time visitors who do not have a service worker yet or are on browsers that don't fully support it yet. They have to rely on network in order to get to your site so by making it more performant, using a lot of available techniques, you make life easier for them as well. As a matter of fact, going for PWA feature, features is in general a very good audit opportunity. Not only for performance issues, but also for UX issues and for uh, other problems with your site. It is crucial to make your website uh, of generally good quality before adding the additional complexity of PWA features. I personally call it PWA readiness. Especially if you plan to implement offline down the line, you need to be respectful of user resources like bandwidth and memory, and you don't want to push to users cache a bloated website. Similarly, you don't want to send push notifications to the user only for him to come back to your site and discover he cannot perform the action he was asked to do because your forms are convoluted or are not accessible, right? So first remember to fix the basic issues with your site and only then move on to the PWA features. All right, 
our site is PW ready, it's performant, we already kind of get, have an idea of how to implement service worker, push, uh, at home screen. Is it all we need to care about? Well, the web is always evolving. And only recently, um, two features were added to the platform, credentials management and payments, and I'm pretty sure there will be more APIs coming that will make your user experience um, even better on, uh, on your websites. So you always need to keep an open mind about what's coming and what you can use in your projects. Finally, all of this is nothing if you don't top it up with a great UX. Good UX drives engagement, and without it, you might find that the gain from implementing all the underlying features is less than expected, just as I described with the push or with the service worker. So always make sure that all of these features are tied by a nice and smooth UX. Finally, it's always a great comfort and a good practice to make decisions based on, based on data. For this, you need to measure things, both before and after the implementation of the PWA feature, actually throughout the whole process. So that's the full scope, in my opinion, of PWA concepts. It's much more than just the service worker, right? These are all the areas you should take into account or at least think about uh, when investing how to approach adding PWA features to your site. Well, that's a big chart and a lot to digest and quite a monster. So how do you eat an elephant? I've heard one mouthful at a time. So let's start. We had our coffee, we understand the scope of our project. Let's actually start it. We start with analysis. First, you need to audit the website in order to understand the current state of the app. And in order to do that, we provide a very good tool, Lighthouse. Lighthouse is a great tool for website diagnostics. It's a Chrome extension that allows you to measure how close your web app is to a progressive web app. When you install the extension, Lighthouse, and run your website through it, it gives you back a score and a report that summarizes the state of your app for you. This is how the report, uh, average report might look like, right? There are different areas uh, where you need to pay attention to, and there is a, also a long list with uh, explanations why, you, why your website got uh, this score and not another, together with the links of how to make things better. So apart from being a diagnostic tool, it's also a very good educational tool because just by checking a report for your website, you can learn a lot about how you can make this website better. One feature I wanted to call out is the share button in the top right corner. Apart from sharing, it allows you to save this report in JSON format. I really encourage you to save your report before you start any projects because it provides you a benchmark and a reference point um, that you can compare to once your um, project finishes. Of course, Lighthouse is not the only tool available. There are other ones, um, and most of them actually also allow you to save the data somewhere. So if you have only 15 minutes to analyze your site, record and save the results from the tools mentioned above, Lighthouse, the security panel in Chrome DevTools, PageSpeed Insights, web page test. It will allow you to understand the standing of your site, but also provide a reference for comparison after implementation. All right, so we analyzed our website, we saved our snapshots of data, and we know exactly how it performs in different areas. Now it's time to prioritize. This is the all areas I mentioned you should take into account. So the question is where to start? I would say, Start at the beginning. Ensure PWA readiness. No amount of PWA features will solve unresponsive, cluttered, or junky website. So before you add new complexity, you want your site to be as lean, smooth, working, and optimized as reasonably possible. In particular, based on your audit uh, outcome, of course, because each site differs, you might look into the areas like optimizing images, 
easy thing and really brings big gains. Remove unnecessary code. Leverage browser caching uh, before you even switch to a service worker. Avoid blocking code and divide big monolithic JavaScript into smaller chunks if adequate for your website. These are common things that are very well known, but you know, as your website evolves over time, sometimes they're overlooked and they kind of go off track. So going for PWA is actually a great moment to stop for a moment, audit them again, and fix the issues if you encounter any. Let me show you an example. Some time ago, I was working on womentechmaker.org site. I was doing exactly that. I was preparing it for some upcoming PWA features. Here you can see some, uh, here you can see the network panel of the Chrome DevTools. What I did here, I just sorted the assets uh, by size and focusing only on the very top of this list, uh, you can pin down the best uh, targets for optimization. Here, the two biggest files were the YouTube API file and the hero image you can see on the home page. So the question was how to optimize those. Well, let's start with the hero image. It's a hero image, so it covers the whole viewport, so it needs to be as big as viewport, but it doesn't need to be bigger than that. So I just created two other versions of this file. Um, I saved the medium and small images. I added a few breakpoints to, uh, to my CSS, and there's an outcome on the medium size uh, page, I got a 21% gain uh, of lower weight of the images on that site. And this all took maybe six minutes altogether to perform, and this 21% gain just by optimizing one image. Really small improvements can lead to big gains in this area. Similarly, I was able to replace heavy assets with simpler ones. Previously, we used the player API for YouTube video on the page, which today is actually possible to do with simple iframe with the correct um, configuration uh, to embed a video. So I just replaced it with the iframe and the whole 400 kilobytes of YouTube API disappeared from my site, right? And it's one line of code, it's very easy to do. Similarly, we, re we realized that we don't use the full extent of the Lodash library, we just use few functions. So we can replace it with the core. It brings us from 24 kilobytes to four kilobytes, and maybe 20 kilobytes is not a great deal of amount of download data, but it, those small gains do add up. Finally, we started to leverage browser caching better. In the previous version of the site, we were caching our assets, sorry, we were, we were uh, versioning our assets by the build version. This means that with each build of our site, the, this number changed and the name of the file changed, which means the browser would need to download it again, even if the asset did, this particular asset did not change, just because the overall build for the site changed. So we switched it to the content-based hashing instead. Now only if the content of the file changes, we change the hash and therefore the file name, and this way we can optimize the browser caching. This allows users to download much less resources than in the previous use case. So you can see all of those changes were, uh, were pretty simple and were very easy to achieve, and they do, did add up to big gains on our website. Once you are PWA ready, you should ensure safety of your users. We want to develop great progressive web apps in order to leverage the frictionless and accessible web out there. But the web is also dangerous, so keeping your users safe is hugely important. So I would go for HTTPS as one of the first things you implement on your site if you go for PWA. Also, a lot of new web APIs are actually, actually require HTTPS to be enabled on your site. Uh, so it should be a natural step to take. Once your site is PWA ready and secure, you can simply follow your business need, and this pretty much depends on your site and on your business. For example, if user acquisition is important for your business, you should focus on FAIR, because 
performance site that loads quickly on the first visit allows you to gain some more users. If you have a huge bounce rate because of unperformant site, a lot of users don't even see your site in the first place. So for user acquisition, you might want to focus on third. If you care about users that are in low connectivity areas or in, I don't know, London Tube maybe, then you should focus on offline, on implementing service warfare and the offline experience because this is where the big gain for your users is. User retention, focus on push and add to home screen. This allows you to re-engage user uh, in your experience. And you can pick and choose because PWA is modular and you can see which areas benefit your business best. All right. Now we're choosing the tools. And there is a lot of tools out there, right? There is a lot of tools. Um, there are some starter packs and generators for different frameworks and libraries that allow you to build a progressive web app from scratch. But I want to focus on migrating an existing website to a PWA. That's why I will give a shout to one library in particular. It's the Workbox library. When developing offline experience, things might get a little bit fiddly. There is also a lot of boilerplate because many tasks are simply repetitive, like caching. So my advice is don't do things by, ha by hand. They might bite you. Remove both stress and boilerplate with workbox. And luckily, at quarter to three, we have a wonderful uh, workshop for you from website to PWA with workbox on the third floor. So if you want to see all the ins and outs and gains you can get from this library for your website, uh, go and check out the training. Yay, finally, we got to the point where we can implement our PWA features. This is the hardest part to give any generic advice on because it differs a lot from project to project, right? So instead, let me share with you an example of how we solved an offline dilemma in the Women Tech Maker site. I think it shows nicely the type of problems you need to solve when implementing PWA features, in this case, offline. So this is a Women Tech Maker site uh, seen as online. And it's a beautiful site. It's a very rich visual experience, lots of images, really, really nice uh, looking site. And I was supposed to implement offline experience for it. If I wanted to save all of this to cache, that would be very, very heavy. So caching all the images was rather a no-go. How about no images? Well, this site looks kind of ugly, but it's also unusable. Like, I can't even go to a different subpage because the menu button is missing, so it's totally unusable. Therefore, caching no images is also a no-go. How do we find a middle point? How do we no negotiate this? Well, I took a deeper look at the website to really understand its structure. I divided images by function. Let's take a look. The yellow images are the navigational and action images. They are there so that user can navigate and perform some activities on our website. Therefore, they're crucial for the site to be fully functional. Then the red ones are branding and priority. They allow you to connect with your user. They're very important. For example, thanks to them, the user recognizes which site they're looking at, right? So they are like high priority images. Then the blue ones are decorative. They make the site look nice. They add to the experience. But if they're missing, they don't really break anything. The site is slightly less rich, but it's still usable. And the third type of pictures, the green ones, I call informative. It means they look nice, they add to the graphical layer of the site, but they also convey some message within them. So how do we deal with those four different types of images? Well, for navigation and, for navigation and action images, I just inline them with SVG. They're usually small, they're icon-like, so it's easy to do. And if you embed them in your HTML, if you cache HTML, they're going to always be there, right? So problem solved. You don't not even need to come up with caching strategy with them because if the HTML is there, your images are there as well. Now, branding and priority, I won't always 
I, I for want for them to always be there because they're important for me for because of my business case. So I pre-cache them. It means when user enters the site, in this case, I pre-cache them with the workbox library. Um, I just push them to the user cache because they are important and without them, their experience will be broken. Now decorative, I employ the runtime cache strategy, which means as user navigates through the site and is online, I download those pictures and save to the cache because there is high likelihood that the user will want to go back to those sites later on when they're offline. But if the user don't venture to some parts of my site, I just show a fallback instead, a placeholder, right? The site maybe looks less rich, but it's still usable, and I didn't blow the user cache with a lot of decorative images. Now, informative images are kind of fancy ones in the slot, because here I use full power of service worker. Service worker is just a JavaScript file, which means you can put a lot of logic into it. Here I wanted to uh, be able not to save all the logos to the user cache, but still convey the message who were the sponsors. So instead of the logos, I generate the images on the fly in service worker uh, using the alt text from the image tag, right? So instead of saving all the images, I generate them on the fly to not have a real image, but still convey the message. And this is just an example of how you can deal with images and for different strategies. Um, the message I want to convey is that you should really look deeply into the structure of your site and type of content you have and try to divide it and come up with different strategies to different parts of your content. And this way you can provide the best user experience for your users while offline. Okay, once we implement everything, we need to evaluate the site, and it's often an overlooked step. Remember when I told you to save the snapshots of data from before the implementation? Well, now they come in handy. You can go again uh, through the audit procedure and record all the same stack traces and compare the outcome with the previous version. Hopefully, it will give you a surge of joy as you see metrics improve on your site. However, there is one caveat. Metrics are helpful, but they are only metrics. Getting a hundred on Lighthouse feels great. I can assure you, it feels really good. Uh, and it may also help to convince your stakeholders about the impact you achieved and maybe get your project a funding for the next iteration, but it does not answer how the users are finding your changes, right? And as a matter of fact, PWA influences many areas of your app. In, it influences the UX. For example, now you need to consider a lot of offline scenarios. Like, for example, how users will try to buy your product when they're in an offline mode. It influences your workflow. You need to add things to users' cache, and it's very hard to do it to manage this process manually. So maybe you need to invest into some build tools and into your workflow optimization. It influences your measuring. Now, a lot of interaction of your user with your site might happen when they're offline, right? So you need to implement offline analytics. And it might also influ your influence your SEO, so you should uh, check if nothing changed there or if the things were even improved on the SEO part. So that's the process. That's how we got from the website to PWA. First we analyze the website, then we prioritize, and we choose the features we want to focus on. We get a set of tools to perform those um, actions. Then we implement our changes, and then we evaluate it. And the important thing is, this can be an iterative process, right? Like each ending point where you measure can be also a starting point for the next iteration of your website. The web develops and your websites will develop over time as well and your user needs will change over time. So you need to keep going back and checking what can be done to provide better experience for them. Luckily, you're not alone in this road for perfection of your websites. 
there is a lot of resources, and a lot of them are available to you uh, today at this conference. There is Lighthouse tool. You can use it both as a Chrome extension and online. And there is one uh, real life lighthouse on the first floor, so feel free to give it a try. There are site clinics where you can consult the healthiness of your site uh, with Googlers. Uh, they happen on the third floor. We have some office hours. If you have any questions after this session or want to talk to me, I'll be present in the office hours area on the third floor after this session. Um, there is the instructor-led training, quarter to three, that walks you through Workbox. And of course, there is the progressive web app section on developersgoogle.com that I really encourage you to try out. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the session and see you around.你只需要打一个连接大家都能在这片土地上和睦共处这是最值得骄傲的一点这也是马来西亚的特色
通常上网不是一个问题，但是可能在比较郊外的地方要上网的话，就可能比较困难，因为设施还不完整。老一辈的都慢慢开始会使用网页，使用 iPad， 用电话上网。父亲并不完全知道我的工作性质是如何，他只知道我是做关于 IT 的，他只知道我是写偏写软件的。我爸呢，一开始接触上网的时候，其实他最想要做的就是要知道即时彩票开卷的。号码，当他知道他可以上网得知得到这个资讯的时候，他就开始叫叫我和弟弟叫他上网。我爸现在拥有智能手机，他会上网，他会上 Facebook， 他会用 WhatsApp 和我们聊天。我们还有一个家庭组。因为现在很多在，嗯，做 web development 的，都是从学校毕业出来。其中一个很大的挑战，你学到的东西并不是和你在领域上面需要的东西是一样的。在他们学习的当中，他们必须要令他们自己精修。所以我觉得必须要做的是，要有一些课程，要去一些学校里面跟他们说，其实现在这这些就是最新的科技发展，你必须要。实时更新自己。我开始找寻我第一份工作的时候，我遇到了困难，因为当时我所学的技术和当时领域需要的技术是不一样的，所以当我去第一份工作面试的时候，我失败了。当时那个面试者对我说：“你不适合做。”啊，网页开发者，当时我还蛮伤心的。过后我没放弃，我去面试第二份工作。幸好当时我第二位老板对我蛮好，他说只要你肯做，我就给你机会，所以我就开始做那份工作。过后啊，进入家境，我也升职了，还有机会去面面对客户。啊，然然后啊，渐渐的我发现我越来越喜欢我现在所做的工作。我希望别人叫我工程师，也可以叫我女性工程师。在马来西亚很少找到女性是做 web development 的，身为女性还是属于少数的，好像是 real girl KL 还是木虎 KL， 我们会有啊、um, talk 的 session。我们会有一些 meet up， 我们会有一些 collab， 去教导一些科技之类的知识。所以我觉得这是一个方法，去 gather 女性在同一个 community 里面，就更加方便交流。当你有你们有交流的时候，你就知道别人其他的女性到底在这个领域上面遇到什么问题。Our whole objective is to get more females to pick up coding. It's more or less the same problem. In any male-dominated industry, yeah, yeah. For the first project, you you just can't fail. You need to prove yourself. So after that, <laughs> everything will just go just okay, fine. So. so I think we as a community is the place where we provide the platform for people to, yeah, to start from ground zero. When we um to organize this kind of workshop event, the time, because in Malaysia, Malaysia, there are very few such kind of sessions. If 我把四十张票放上网的话，如果我们没有啊、嗯、控制的话，可能三十张票就会给男性直接塞了。当然，我们也不是说要特别特别去碰到男性去参加这个这个 event， 因为我们是无门虎口嘛。我是希望更多的女性参加这个这个 workshop， 所以现在我们做的就是。可能把大概七八十八千的位置先保留给给女性。在传统华人而言呢，父亲是扮演一个比较严厉的角色。父亲通常不会说一些
说你令他骄傲的话，只是从别人口中就会听到，就是从他巴萨一个朋友口中就会听得到。一开始我是觉得惊讶，因为他从来没跟我说，就惊讶比较多，惊讶过后就有点窃喜，因为他算满意我的成绩。我觉得呢，网页是无法被代替的，只是有什么事我们可以做，令可以令网页更加 popular， 更加多人使用的。学习网页、学习开发这一部分，在马来西亚还是比较缺少的。我觉得我个人的经历是有影响到我如何去 mentor 新的人去，去去领导他们怎么学习网页。我希望我是其中一个推动网页发展。我希望做到的是，让这种知识更普及，更多人知道如何开发网页。Whether you're just starting out on your journey toward a career in Android development, or you've been working as an Android developer for some time, you might ask yourself, "How can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized?" Introducing the Associate Android Developer Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can display the skills of an entry-level Android developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or are ready to take the exam. Training is available online as well as in person. Banking should be painless, easy, fast, and it should just assist you in doing whatever you want to do. So actually, it's our strategy to empower people to take a step ahead in life and in business. If you look at our company, we have all this different IT landscape in all the countries. Still, we want to be able to share, and that's when we start to look at web components, and web components solve that for us because when we use Polymer and web components as the standard underneath, we can suddenly create components which will work in any country. So you can just take that components and start delivering a feature. So now, when I'm in that shop looking at that bike, I'm not only checking my balance; I'm also pressing the button. Let's look ahead, and what it will tell me: next month, your mortgage will be deducted from your account. So maybe this is not the best time to buy that bike, and that's what we're doing it for—for for features and not for the UI part. We are starting to see this whole developer community, which is moving to one technology, and we are seeing more. PWA, Progressive Web Apps. If you've seen some talks today, Sam's talk, Ava's talk, you've already heard this acronym used, and also AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages.、Uh, I'm just curious now, who here in the audience has heard the acronym PWA before? All right, about two thirds maybe. How about AMP? 
Okay, very good. In the context of accelerated mobile pages, not at a guitar amp, perhaps. Uh, I guess Mike and the Mechanics were playing here a couple days ago. They had amps back here. This is the other kind of amp, accelerated mobile pages. And we're going to discuss something today called PWA and AMP, putting it together, how this pattern is powerful, elegant, and easy to do. And I'll show you an example of how to do this called the shadow reader. The first question is, why? Progressive web apps are these immersive, full-screen app-like experiences on the web. And accelerated mobile pages are best known for somewhat simpler kinds of pages, maybe for publishers, maybe a way to get into Google's AMP cache, and in general, kind of a simplification of the web for performance reasons. So how do these things fit together? And why bother with this? It's because of what I call the web app dilemma. So let's go back about 18 years ago. Back then, web pages were simple. If there was any complexity, it was on the back end. You had your Perl, maybe some PHP making things happen, generating HTML. The front end was HTML, just HTML, maybe some CSS, which was brand new back then, and not a whole lot of this little cute little language called JavaScript. And JavaScript wasn't like a real language. It was like a toy language back then. It was used for little things. Remember this thing over here? You can move your cursor over the button, and it would change color. That was pretty cool. That was JavaScript. That was pretty easy. Today, it's more complicated. There's a lot to learn, a lot of choices. You can make a very, very full-featured front-end web app with many, many different frameworks, all kinds of JavaScript. It can get pretty complicated. And when it gets complicated, there are some downsides to that. This might be you. Maybe you're spending a lot of time learning new technologies, maintaining a complicated app, trying to follow all your callbacks, tracing through all the code, trying to do various tweaks to get things to perform better. And speaking of performance, unfortunately, for your convenience as a developer, the user pays a price. So notice how web apps have gotten bigger in the last six years. They've more than tripled in size. A lot of that is things like images, video, but also JavaScript has gotten very, very big. Do you have a site right now that has 15, 20, maybe 30 JavaScript files on it, 400K of JavaScript, maybe some large frameworks that are loading before anything happens, using up CPU time, using up battery power? It takes a lot these days for a good web app. I was thinking about this actually yesterday while walking around the city, and this is the picture I took here in Krakow. And there's music that's supposed to be playing. Oh, there it is. Lovely Mozart. So why are we playing Mozart right now at a developer's conference? Because when I saw the architecture here, it reminded me of the movie Amadeus. Anybody seen the movie Amadeus before? Amadeus, anybody? It's about Mozart's life. I used to be a music professor, and I showed this to my students every year because otherwise they didn't really grasp classical music. They couldn't stand classical music. But Mozart, I was thinking about elegance and beauty and things like that. And maybe you can make it a little quieter, the music. Mozart's getting louder and louder. Elegant, beautiful things are, are important. They endure. Simplicity is good because when things are simple, they're more maintainable also for your users. Elegance also means you have fewer bugs. In five years, your code will still work. So simplicity actually matters. Elegance matters. And isn't one of the goals of life making something beautiful? That's one of the goals also of this PWA AMP pattern, helping make things beautiful and simple and elegant, again, on the web. So, well, if the web is too hard, can I make an app instead? Wouldn't that be easier? If you saw Sam's talk today, you know that almost all the time users spend in apps is in a few major apps, their Gmail, their Facebook, their WhatsApp. If you're making an app out there, the chances are very small people will ever, ever use it or download it because, as Sam was saying before, the average number of apps a user installs in the average month is zero. So the web is still a pretty important thing on mobile phones and will not go away anytime soon. So maybe make a simple website. That's not going to work. Users expect something better these days. They want a real web app experience. What do we do? Like a baby, we can cry. Or maybe there's an easier way. Happy baby. Is there one? There's not. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Wait, 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 wait. I've got some more slides to show. Uh, I'm just kidding. 
I think the easier way here is PWA and AMP. What is that? PWA, you've seen before in talks today, provides an app-like experience on the web. I won't go into this in detail, you've seen this before, but things load quickly, they're engaging, as a good app would be. They're quick, users aren't waiting around, they work offline, all these things people expect from mobile phone experiences, like they're on messaging, like they're on some other app. They want these things also from a website, a fast, good experience. So what is AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages? People think about it sometimes as this thing that was started for publishers. Most major publishers in the world use AMP in some way or another. But it's more than that. It's not just for publishers. It isn't just a way to actually make simplified web pages or to get into Google's search AMP carousel or make Google happy in some way. It's a new pattern to make the web easier and simpler and faster for users and also for all of you. What is AMP? A brief summary. It's an ecosystem for fast, beautiful, responsive pages. As you've heard earlier today, there's over 2 billion pages on the web that use AMP. Over a million domains now use AMP. AMP helps enforce good performance and good looks. It's basically a response to the bloat on the web. It's making things simpler, easier again. It doesn't cover all cases, but it covers most cases. Very few web pages right now would lose that much if converted to AMP. Even though the first thing up there, AMP allows you to write no JavaScript. No JavaScript at all. <laughs> so there, there we have a little bit of applause. Probably some people are crying. <laughs> people are clapping. Yes, you're free, you're free. You can still use JavaScript, but not on an AMP page. It's already there. Because if you want things that are interactive, that are easy to use, if you want things like a image carousel where the images just slide around on the screen, users can't stand these things, but they're very popular, or you want a video embedded, or you want a menu, all these things come with AMP. You just insert web components. So that's the second thing up there. It's a superset of HTML, a set of custom web components that do all those things that don't come with HTML, but that should. HTML was designed a long time ago for documents, not for making complicated web apps, but with AMP, you get back to actually putting all those things that you want into HTML. You lose some flexibility, but you gain a lot of ease of use, and you're coding less. You can code other places. And if you love CSS, I'm sorry to tell you this, it also restricts your CSS to 50K or less, which really, honestly, is most, most, enough for most pages out there, probably all pages. The idea behind all these things, no JavaScript, uh, web components, and less CSS, is to make the pages faster. So for users, AMP pages tend to load even on 3G connections in a second, in two seconds, which users tend to like quite a bit and which makes your company's money. It's good. And don't forget the elegance thing as well. Your pages, your code is more beautiful. It's simpler. You're not trying to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already there for you as part of AMP. It sounds kind of hard, right? I've got to learn two new things, PWA and AMP. I can't do that. I don't have time. Well, actually, it's not as hard as it sounds. And to prove that, we've created a simple example called the Shadow Reader. Whenever I say shadow, I'll say it like this typeface over here, the Shadow Reader, because I have no shame. So let's say that you work for a major news publisher, and you've got a website that's out there, but the boss knows people want to use a web app. They're sick of the website, sick of the slow transitions between pages. He wants a newsreader app. So your assignment from this very, very stern looking boss over here, you're the person there with the hat, is to make a web app out of existing web pages. The site already uses AMP. So how do we do that? How do we take things that already exist, those AMP pages, and get those into a nice, immersive, progressive web app experience? Well, PWA slash AMP is your answer. So why are AMPs useful in a progressive web app context? Let's discuss a couple of ways AMP can be used that haven't been used so much so far, but ways AMP is starting to be used now, which play on AMP's strengths as web components library. So first of all, we'll discuss how AMP can be used as web components, Second, as rich data. And third, AMP pages can be portable 
embeddable content units that you can embed in other pages thanks to the magic of Shadow DOM. I love that name, Shadow DOM. First of all, AMP is web components. This actually is kind of obvious. AMP is really a library of web components. Here are some examples of those, uh, those things. Here's one over here. Let's say you want to make one of those lovely image sliders that users, again, tend to object to, but people love these things. And uh, there it is. That's an entire carousel. That's done. So AMP carousel, you must specify width and height in AMP because the pages are laid out in advance. So as things load and lazy load, the page doesn't shift around. So all of your dimensions for images, ads, everything else are specified in advance. And there's a couple of images with the AMP image tag, and you're done. There it is, your carousel. Things lazy load, it's all good, you're done. Number two, AMP as rich data. This is kind of a weirder idea, but kind of a cool idea once you get the idea. Idea, idea, is a good word to say several times in a row. AMP can be used as rich data. So often if you're making a web app, you've got your app shell of some sort, and you're loading in JSON, and then converting that JSON to HTML using templates, using some sort of logic. This can be a fragile, difficult process. So instead of doing that, you can use the HTML itself as the data. It's a rich data source that includes layout information, includes components. It's like a whole page layout. It's kind of like Markdown on steroids. It's this really powerful, rich, beautiful data set. So what I mean by that, here's a typical example. Let's say you have this article on your web app that you're making over here, and there's some dang ancient babies I've heard of that apparently aren't very good, and you have an article about that, usual data sources, data, whatever. Here's how it might look on the bottom over here. Maybe you have an image of a guitar. Maybe you've got an H2, a link. Maybe you've got an ad in there. This is like data. So you can pull this in to your web app, which goes along with the idea that AMP can be portable, embeddable content units. So you can grab some part of a page, which is AMP, and stick it into your progressive web app. So again, taking an AMP page or some AMP stuff and using that in a different application. So you can actually take your web pages already that exist and cram those things into a web app. And here you are with your hat thinking, ah, this is the key to my project over here. I don't have much time. I can use this pattern, taking our existing AMP pages and putting those into my new immersive PWA. But how? The first key to this is the magic of Shadow DOM. So Shadow DOM is simple and kind of cool and magical. It's simply a DOM subtree that's fully encapsulated inside an HTML element. All the HTML, all the CSS is living inside an element in the DOM, Shadow DOM. It's part of the Web Components idea. And AMP comes in a version called Shadow AMP, which allows an entirely valid accelerated mobile page to exist inside another page. This allows you to AMP just one subsection of a web page, which we're going to need in our app we're making today. How does this work? On the top over there, you see we're loading up not the usual AMP library, but the Shadow AMP library. And then on the bottom, you see we're going to actually, once AMP exists, we're going to just attach Shadow Doc over there, three arguments, the container, where the Shadow root should be, the document itself, and the URL from which the document came originally. The complicated thing here is this is loaded asynchronously. So you can't call attach Shadow Doc until it's actually loaded. So we use this asynchronous callback pattern to do that. You see in the middle, that function we've defined called AMP ready, which takes the callback, and simply it looks for a global called AMP. If that global already exists, it adds that callback to an array of callbacks. If it doesn't exist, it defines that as an empty array. So this way, as AMP is still loading, you can keep on attaching callbacks to this object. When it actually loads up, it then finds these callbacks, and then it runs everything. It may sound complicated, but it actually is not complicated. I'll say it again more simply with fewer words. You load the Shadow AMP asynchronously. Once it's loaded, you can then use the attach Shadow doc method to actually attach your AMP document 
somewhere inside an existing page. Let's take a look at this now because it's getting pretty abstract. Let's go over to demo over here. And interesting. My computer logged out during this time. There it is, it's back. So this is the shadow reader. Here it is. In this case, it uses the Guardian as the data backend. Uh, all the news here is kind of depressing today, so I apologize for that. There's two modes for this. This is the cards mode. So this just shows top stories from the Guardian as a series of cards. And then clicking into a card, we'll look for one that's not bad and scary. Here we go. A black hole. That's kind of cool. It's not scary yet. Clicking on that, you see a bit of an animation, and it pops out. And there's the article mode, the second mode of this application. There it is, an enormous black hole. Not a problem for a long time, as far as we can tell. And uh, by the way, this bottom over here is all the AMP page. That's all AMP. If you go back over here, you're back here. There are sections, and so on. If we look at this here, we can see in the HTML, which is very small, unfortunately, if you can see this, at the very bottom, there's a thing called article over here. And somewhere in there, if you can see it, this is called shadow root. And in there is an entire AMP page just hiding in there. And there's the body, all the content there on the shadow root. I know this is very hard to see, but try it out. AMP.cards is out there. It's public. You can use it. Check this out. The code is out there, too. Check it out. See how it's built. Let's go back to the slides now. We're going to talk about more about how this thing is built. How is this thing built? As we discussed already before, there's your AMP page living within the PWA. That's the real key. And three things happen. The first thing is that AMP content gets pulled in from an RSS feed. And then we inject the AMP HTML right into the DOM. And then around all that is a lovely progressive web app making this nice immersive experience we were talking about here. Here's the first step. Not that complicated. You pull the AMP content in from the feed. And you can see here we actually use the good old XHR over here because you can use fetch. But the advantage of XHR is that the response XML is actually a parsed DOM. So once you get this back, you've got a whole document object. You can just tick that right into the DOM of the main page. So this is very convenient. And we're going to remove parts we're not going to use over here. So notice on the top, for example, the Guardian has this header. We don't want to see that as part of this app experience. You just remove things from the DOM you don't want. You take out sidebars, take out headers, just to keep the part you actually need. Step two, we inject the HTML into the DOM. Not that complicated. We uh, create a shadow root and use that magical attach shadow doc actually, again, take that AMP document and stick it right there into the Shadow DOM. And then all around that is a nice progressive web app, which has the kind of features you want from progressive web apps. It loads quickly with an app shell. As the app moves around, as you navigate through the app, things go on loading quickly. The experience is immersive throughout, like an app would be. You have the possibility on the Android of adding to the home screen and an app-like display, taking away the whole URL bar. And content is available also offline. How do those things work? Quickly, the first thing over here is that the initial load is pretty simple. Let me show you over here again, if I can get back to the computer here. The actual original payload over here that comes with this, a lot of CSS. The HTML is pretty simple. A couple of things here. And then notice as we go along here, see if I can zoom there a little bit, you see these little tildes over there. See those things? If you used uh, Facebook, for example, and you've seen when you're loading your feed, those little things appear with rectangles that kind of resemble actual um, things in your feed, but there aren't things in your feed. They're just actually an animation. So it gives the user the impression things are loading when they're actually not really there quite yet. Users like that if things are partially loaded and they get to see it kind of load. This is like that, but just pure text. So before any images load at all, anything loads at all, you've got something there that kind of resembles how the app's going to look, a set of lovely tildes. Let's go back now to the slides, please. Thank you very much. So yeah, simple, simple initial load over there. 
And that thing at the top over there is so I can tell whether it's actually from the URL in cards mode or article mode and apply the right kind of UI skeleton so you have that nice kind of loading in the beginning. <clears throat> and then, of course, as the app moves along, things load fast because you've got AMP pages. AMP pages load very fast. They're very simple. And you use Shadow DOM to get those things into your PWA. Then the immersive experience is pretty easy to do. I'm going to go back to the demo here one last time. We can see these lovely animations over here. Again, this is just a normal web app, so you can make nice things happen. When you click on this black hole over here, it animates upwards nicely. When you change articles, things merge around smoothly. There's also stuff here for accessibility, for screen readers. All those things are easy to do because you've got all the power of PWAs and CSS and all those things. And again, try it out yourselves at home if you'd like to. Let's get back to the slides over here. And this part is easy for the PWA. You've got a manifest. So for Android, those icons over there let you add things to the screen, the home screen, that is. And then display standalone just tells Android to display the app in a full immersive app experience. This part is super simple. Finally, offline content. This can be a little challenging when you do Service Worker. The caching may be a little bit complicated sometimes. It involves some coding, some promises, things like that. But in this case, it was very simple. We use Workbox as a bit of a workaround over here. I recommend trying out Workbox.js, a great Service Worker library. And this, by the way, is the only library that was used in the making of this whole web app. There was no Angular, no React, not even jQuery. The code here is incredibly small to make this happen. In fact, minimize is about 10K of JavaScript behind the scenes. That's it, about 10K. Workbox makes things very simple. Over here is the code to cache our lovely YQL query. That's all you do. Register your route, declare your strategy, and you're all done. The service worker stuff here is maybe 30 lines of code. So there is offline content. We also pre-cache some things like images, other things that are important for the app. And like I was just saying a minute ago, there was no framework used in the making of this app, not even jQuery. I mean, these things over here are samples from the code. They're a little bit ponderous in some cases. Document, dot, query, selector, remove attribute, all these things. jQuery makes it a little simpler. But this is just to show we didn't need jQuery for this. You still have pretty small code. It's pretty simple. It's just JavaScript, but not much JavaScript. A little bit like the old days. So this is good. You made the web app. The boss likes you. You can keep your job. Triumph, happiness, all those things. So you're happy. Then you think, oh, great, I've made this awesome PWA. But is this AMP, though? I thought this AMP thing was important because I had to get into Google's search carousel and the AMP cache and all those things and make Google happy in some way. But this is not an AMP over here. I've made this normal web page. So is that OK? Can I do that? And yes, you can. Who cares? Go ahead and do it. In this case, the main app would not pass AMP validation. It isn't supposed to, but it's fast. It uses AMP and just works really, really well. If you want to actually get into Google AMP cache on the first page of your application, there's a pattern for that. The first page can also be an AMP. The entry page, landing page, can be an AMP. Actually, AMP has an install service worker component. You can use install service worker to get your PWA started behind the scenes. They can navigate to the next page, which is the PWA, and then you can use AMP within that again. So again, you can use these things in various ways to get all the benefits of AMP, to get the pre-rendering and all those things that come from the magic of finding your link in Google Search or elsewhere that has an AMP cache. And then the PWA starts up. You can use AMP components in there to make your life easier. And it's more than just publishing. The same pattern applies in more other kinds of ways. What if you've got a site that's like a lead gen site where users are filling out this long form, one of those things with five different screens, your name, your address, your birthday, your neighbor's name, your dog's name, your cat's name, the name of the tree in your front yard, all those kinds of things. This happens sometimes. It can be hard for users. If you use AMP, AMP comes with nice validated form fields, so it makes your life easier. And like with the articles just back there, 
Imagine a set of articles, imagine pages of the form in a PWA. So you control the experience. Users can't stand it when they're working on a long form and they go to the next page and they face a long load. They abandon in those cases. In a PWA, things can load more quickly, especially if they're AMP. You can go back and forth, you can control the screen, make it fun for the user to fill out this long form. Register now. Another idea, e-commerce. E-commerce is a new thing that's happening with AMP. Various e-commerce sites are now using AMP for all kinds of things, product pages, uh, listing pages, up to and now also including the checkout process is just now possible also with AMP, thanks to the Payment Request API. So in this case over here, I imagine instead of your news articles, a series of product pages, which are all written with AMP, so they're fast, user isn't waiting around to actually have things load. And dynamic content is possible with AMP as well. There's AMP state, there's AMP list, there's various components that let you actually change things on the screen dynamically. So you change the number of things you're buying, the prices can change, shipping costs can change with user input, and so on and so forth. Or imagine the travel application. Instead of these articles, you've got hotels, hotel information, and you go back to your hotels. So again, all possible with AMP in a PWA context. The upshot is this makes you money because the users are happy because they have a better experience. They're not abandoning the pages as much. And a lot of data shows us AMP pages tend to get better user engagement. A lot of data shows us that faster pages get better user engagement, get better conversions, lower bounce. So your users are staying on for longer on your app, and they're converting. They're buying something, or they're viewing an ad, whatever it is. Ad support and AMP is also very, very advanced these days. So you gain money from the users. You also make money because developers are spending less time working on their app. Things are simpler for them. So you can make things more quickly, so you make money on both sides of the coin. Which, of course, isn't your motivation because you're programmers. You don't care about the money. You care about the beauty of your code, the integrity of your work. Money is just kind of one of those things that gets you rent and maybe occasional Doritos and ramen soup, or I guess kielbasa and dumplings over here. Uh, but also don't forget that, I don't know, I went backwards instead of forwards. Don't forget also that this is better for you, the programmer, not just because of the money you're making now and you're retiring early or becoming a manager or something, but because you didn't just create this terrible Frankenstein web app that was a hodgepodge of various JavaScript you found on uh, the internet and kind of copied things, you know, pasted them together. You don't have to panic. This was something else I found in Old Town as well. Um, instead, you have this lovely, maintainable, elegant code that's going to work for longer, that people will like in a couple years. Future programmers at your company will see your code and they will smile instead of thinking, why did they make all this stuff? This is crazy. They'll see it. It looks easy. It's elegant and maintainable. And in conclusion, isn't life about creating something beautiful? This is your chance to do that, PWA and AMP. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Ask Firebase Show. Can I use, this is a long question. Oh, it's go. It is go, that's correct. Next question. 
We've been working hard to build the improvements and enhancements you've been asking for. I'm going to use Cloud Functions for Firebase to respond to authentication events. Magic. Firebase! Sure enough, there's that exception. Are you going to start using a helmet when you skateboard? When I sat in front of the computer, I felt like I had superpowers, but people told me I was just wasting my time. When I turned seven, I got asked to build a computer with my dad. It was mind-blowing for me that, you know, something that I built came to life. When I graduated high school, my parents just told me that I need to do something that can lend me a job. I didn't really know where to go, and I gave up on my dreams of pursuing computer science, and eventually I got into business school. I felt like I was out of place. I felt like it wasn't a good fit, and I knew it wasn't a good fit. Dropping out felt really risky because I was afraid that I'm going to make the same mistake again. Since my parents didn't graduate high school, they didn't know what was right for me. I found Udacity was a good way to learn about different areas of computer science before I start my studies again. Online learning is really good at reflecting the market's needs. And you can start with something like web development and work yourself up to self-driving cars. It's all in the realm of possibilities, and, and you don't need a degree, and you can do it from anywhere in the world. With Udacity and Google, you build projects which are interesting for potential employers. When I had my job interview, they looked at the app I built, and they saw what I could do for them. Once I got my certification from Google, it took three months to go from knowing some programming to landing a job. It's just really a fast-track program to becoming an Android developer. My work really reflects how I approach things, and seeing people enjoy that gives me the feeling of being on the right track. Fekete Jedikó vagyok, két gyermekes anyuka. Magyar tanárként végeztem, és mostanában kódolással foglalkozom. Az első gyermekemet vártam, amikor komplikációk léptek föl, és az orvos azt mondta, hogy tanácsosabb lenne otthon maradnom, így úgy döntöttem, hogy ott hagyom a munkahelyemet. Nem szerettem volna ezt az időt tétlenül tölteni. Később el is költöztünk a párommal az ő munkája miatt. Rengeteg kihívás elé állított ez minket. Szembesültem azzal, hogy nem fogok tudni a régi munkámhoz visszatérni. Böngészés közben találkoztam a lehetőséggel, hogy a Google jó voltából a Udacity honlapján tanulhatok. Nagyon megtetszett, és jelentkeztem. A tanulói program alatt megtanultunk Android készülékre applikációkat készíteni, elkészíteni a layoutokat és a javakódot egyaránt. Nagyon élveztem azt a hátteret, amit ezúttal a Udacity számomra biztosított. A Greenfield applikáció, amit készítettem, kiszámolja az ökológiai lábnyomunkat. Amikor a gyerekeim megszülettek, észrevettem, hogy hihetetlen mértékben megnőtt a szemét termelésünk. Nem gondoltam, hogy valaha képes leszek saját applikációt készíteni, ami a természetvédelemmel kapcsolatos, és 
tényleg számít, hatással lehet emberekre. Ö, azt hiszem, hogy a, a programozás az, az lehetővé teszi, hogy bármit elkészítsünk. Coding mannak lenni nehéz, de szuper. Bízom benne, hogy a Udacity tanulói program keretében végzett tanulmányai miatt könnyebb lesz majd munkát találnom a gyerekek mellett.你只需要打一个连接大家都能在这片土地上和睦共处这是最值得骄傲的一点这也是马来西亚的特色老一辈的都慢慢开始会使用网页使用iPad用电话上网父亲并不完全知道我的工作性质是如何他只知道我是写编写软件的我爸呢一开始接触上网的时候其实他最想要做的就是要知道即时彩票开卷的号码因为现在很多在做web development的 都是从学校毕业出来 其中一个很大的挑战你学到的东西并不是和你在领域上面需要的东西是一样的在他们学习的当中他们必须要令他们自己精修 
，所以我觉得必须要做的是要有一些课程，要去一些学校里面跟他们说，其实现在这这些就是最新的科技发展，你必须要实时,时更新自己。开始找寻我第一份工作的时候，我遇到了困难，因为当时我所学的技术和当时领域需要的技术是不一样的，所以当我去第一份工作面试的时候，我失败了。当时那个面试者对我说：“你不适合做啊、呃、网页开发者。”当时我还蛮伤心的。过后我没放弃，我去面试第二份工作。幸好当时我第二位老板对我蛮好，他说只要你肯做，我就给你机会，所以我就开始做那份工作。过后啊，渐入佳境，我也升职了，还有机会去面面对客户啊，然然后啊，渐渐的我发现我越来越喜欢我现在所做的工作。我希望别人叫我工程师，也可以叫我女性工程师。在马来西亚很少找到女性是做 web development 的。身为女性，还是属于少数的。好像是 real girl k l 还是木木 k l 我们会有啊、um, talk 的 session， 我们会有一些 meet up， 我们会有一些 collab 去教导一些科技之类的知识。所以我觉得这是一个方法去 gather。女性在同一个 community 里面，就更加方便交流。当你有你们有交流的时候，你就知道别人其他的女性到底在这个领域上面遇到什么问题。Our whole objective is to get more females to pick up coding. It's more or less the same problem in any male-dominated industry. Yeah, yeah. For the first project, you you just can't fail. You need to prove yourself. So after that, <laughs> everything will just go. Just fine. So I think we as a community is the place where we provide the platform for people to, yeah, to start from ground zero. When we um to organize this kind of workshop event, because in Malaysia, there are very few such sessions. If I put the facts on the ballot, if we don't have control of it, it may be. 三十张票就会给男性直接 sign up 了。当然，我们也不是说要特别特别去碰到男性去参加这个这个 event， 因为我们是无门户口嘛。我是希望更多的女性参加这个这个 workshop， 所以现在我们做的就是可能把大概七八十八千的位置先保留给给女性。在传统华人而言呢，父亲是扮演一个比较严厉的角色。父亲通常不会说一些说你令他骄傲的话，只是从别人口中就会听到，就是从他巴沙里的朋友口中就会听得到。一开始我是觉得惊讶，因为他从来没跟我说，就惊讶比较多。惊讶过后就有点窃喜，因为他算满意我的成绩。我觉得呢，网页是无法被代替的，只是有什么事我们可以做，令可以令网页更加 popular， 更加多人使用的。学习网页、学习开发这一部分，在马来西亚还是比较缺少的。我觉得我个人的经历是有影响到我如何去 mentor 新的人去，去去领导他们怎么学习网页。我希望我是其中一个推动网页发展。我希望做到的是，让这种知识更普及，更多人知道如何开发网页。
banking should be painless, easy, fast, and it should just assist you in doing whatever you want to do. So actually, it's our strategy to empower people to take a step ahead in life and in business. If you look at our company, we have all this different IT landscape in all the countries. Still, we want to be able to share. And that's when we start to look at web components and web components solve that for us because when we use Polymer and web components as the standard underneath, we can suddenly create components which will work in any country. So you can just take that components and start delivering a feature. So now when I'm in that shop looking at that bike, I'm not only checking my balance, I'm also pressing the button, let's look ahead. And what it will tell me, next month your mortgage will be deducted from your account. So maybe this is not the best time to buy that bike. And that's what we're doing it for, for features and not for the UI part. We are starting to see this all developer community, which is moving to one technology and we are seeing more and more people working together from all the countries. When this translates to result, anything can happen. With the instant access of the web, there's no place that I can't reach. The impact of the web on the newsroom was monumental. It's now more the reader telling the newsroom, this is important to me. You really have to start to build from scratch what is a story on the phone. With a progressive web app, there's a link, tap it, and install it with no friction. The PWA is on their phone, done. And once that is installed, we are able to alert you to, hey, we got some more information for you. If you're interested in whatever areas that you are, you can install that subject, that topic, and we're going to serve you the content that you want. And that's going to change our business in a big way. The technology has enabled us to make our new PWA faster than the current mobile site. We're now able to deliver visuals faster. And if you can start to deliver visuals faster, then you can start to change the formats you do. People are willing to stay longer. If they stay longer, they see more advertising. The PWA is going to result in more personalization. Personalization will yield more engagement. The web has made me realize there's an audience out there. There's an audience that's knowledgeable, and there's an audience that needs to be understood.
podcasters, and welcome to a surprise edition of the Meownica Show. So if you work in software development and you don't exercise your design skills, just practice, just do it. Do it even though you know that it's bad. If you want to improve the quality of your site but don't know where to start, the new audits panel is a great place to get some inspiration. This is a quick web series about solving web problems with standards. Let's go. I'll be right here to tell you what's new in Chrome. That's a Webpack performance. One day I'll get around to learning it. You could just watch this video. Knowing what is and what is not visible can be very useful information. I can change these properties in DevTools to find the ideal value for my layout. It's Rob Dotson. Welcome back to the Alley Cash Show. I want to show you what just landed in Chrome DevTools version 60. So follow me over here to the laptop. If you want the latest news and ideas in web development, subscribe to the Google Chrome Developers YouTube channel. If you've been working in web development, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Mobile Web Specialist Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can demonstrate the skills of an advanced level mobile web developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or if you're ready to take the exam. You can reference our study guide and training is available online. When you're ready, sign up and take the exam. As part of the sign up, you'll pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you'll pay 6,500 rupees. If you live outside of India, you'll pay 99 US dollars. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you'll receive a voucher that you can use to schedule the exam. The exam is a timed, performance-based assessment in which you'll write code to solve challenges and demonstrate your skills in mobile web development. You'll have four hours to finish, after which you will submit the exam and respond to a set of exit interview questions. If after grading you're successful, you'll receive a digital badge from Google and join our community of Google certified mobile web specialists. Once you are certified, you can share your badge on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. Ready to start your journey?
I'll wait for people to settle down. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shailin Tooley. I am a developer programs engineer working on Android at Google. And I'm here to talk to you about building great apps for Android O. Um, Android O is kind of a big topic. There are lots of uh, cool things in O. And there's a talk later in the afternoon that's going to cover many of them. Um, my talk is going to talk about, is going to focus on a couple of topics. Um, basically, what you can and cannot do with regard to background work in your O apps, and what you can and cannot do with regard to location gathering when your app is in the background. Uh, this is going to be a fairly technical talk. Uh, I'm going to focus on just those two issues. Um, and I'll, I have a lot of material, so I'm going to go a little fast, so you've been warned. Um, OK, so why focus on background so much? Why focus on background limits that are coming in O uh, and uh, all the location limits? Because first, I believe these are some of the biggest changes in the platform. Um, and these are changes that have really, really great consequences for you app developers. Because I believe these changes make Android an even better platform for writing apps. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. I'll talk, of course, about what the changes are, what strategies you can use to deal with them. I'll talk also a little bit about sort of historically how we have come to this point where we have to um, limit what kind of background work goes on um, in generally and in specifically uh, with regard to location. So sort of a little historical overview of things. OK, so pretty much everything I'm going to cover in this talk relates either to system health, basically good RAM management, or to battery, to how to get more battery uh, performant um, uh, stuff happening in your apps. Um, what I'll do is I'll start with a little overview, just talk about a few things that are, that sort of just give you a sense of what's really happening in O, uh, and then we'll do, we'll do a deep dive in, in, into each of these topics afterwards. Um, so the first thing with regards to system health is there is a limitation now in O that there will be no started services in the background. This is kind of a big deal, uh, but it really only applies to started services in the background. When you're in the foreground, there is no limitation to started services. You can keep uh, doing what you're doing now. The other system health issue is that there will be uh, fairly substantial limits on implicit broadcasts. So you can still have explicit broadcasts. You can dynamically register for broadcasts. But broadcasts that go into your manifest, there's going to be quite a lot of limits placed on those. Again, we'll explore these. Um, so the question is, when? When do all these things happen? When do you have to start worrying about these things? Um, and the answer is when you um, increment your target SDK version to target O. Uh, now, that may seem like distant to some people, uh, maybe not so distant to others. But I would urge everyone to start thinking about this and thinking about it now. Because even today, people, users of your apps can go into their settings uh, of their phones, figure out how much work you're doing in the background, decide if that work is too much, and essentially curtail that work. So like it or not, the limits on background work that you can do, those are here already. So it's something that you as app developers kind of have to deal with. You'll deal with them much more substantially when you upgrade to O, but you have to deal with them now as well. That's all system health. So let's talk about battery now, and that's pretty much the focus of the changes that are coming in O or have come in O. Um, so basically what's happening is that for battery um, reasons, what kind of location gathering you can do in the background is going to be some substantially throttled. So if you have uh, gotten used to the idea of having very frequent updates, for instance, uh, in the foreground and in the background, uh, the foreground stuff is going to remain the same. The background stuff will be quite different. Um, and so the question is, when does this kick in? When do these limits kick in? Uh, and the answer here is, they kick in now. Uh, for any app that is running on an O device, regardless of SDK version, these background limits with regard to location are here. So this means that if you have an app that does something with location, 
and your target SDK is N or M or L, uh, that app may actually behave quite differently without you, having changing, without you having to change a line of code. That app, when it's run on an O device, is going to start behaving differently, could behave differently. So this is a fairly significant change as well. Uh, and it's something uh, that uh, if you have a location component to your apps, you're going to have to deal with. Um, so these are big changes, like no started services, limits on what you can do with broadcasts, limits to what you can do with background. So the question is, why are we doing this? Um, how did we get here? What's really going on? So the first thing is, we're not doing this <laughs> because we like being difficult or we just like making people's lives difficult. We're doing this because this is essentially better for the platform. It's better for the users. The users want us to build, want you to build apps that are really, really performant, that, that do really great things uh, with RAM management, that do really great things with battery. Um, the changes that we've introduced in O have been a long time in the coming. So I'm going to take, we'll get to all the details in a, in a minute or two, but I'm going to take a little while and just talk about how we got here, uh, starting in Marshmallow. So go back to Marshmallow, and you remember uh, that's when we introduced Doze. So what, what's Doze? Just to recap, uh, that when your device is stationary, when it's not charging, when the screen is off, essentially when it's not being used, we said you can't just go crazy and do all sorts of things in the background. You've got to channel all your background work into very narrowly defined, well-defined maintenance windows. Because frankly, when a device is just sort of sitting there, it should not be doing really crazy things. It should be a very well-behaved, quiet machine. So that's, what, that's where those came in. Um, Android M also gave us app standby. And the idea there was that if you have background network activity, um, it, it, how that activity was done was actually dependent on how much or how little the user was interacting with your app. Again, the idea is if there's background work being done, let's just do this very carefully. And in Android N, uh, we gave you Doze Lite, which is basically like Doze, but the difference is that the device is not stationary. So think of, you know, I have my phone right here. It's not on. It's obviously, it's not charging. Uh, but it's moving, because I'm moving. Uh, and again, the idea was, even then, you do background work pretty carefully. So all of this started off a couple of releases ago. And what you're seeing in O is pretty much a very natural progression of what we introduced in M and in N. Uh, so the other stuff that's very significant is uh, starting in N, we started paying attention to some broadcasts that we felt were excessively noisy. They were causing system health problems, thrashing, very visible jank for users. And we decided to uh, curtail what you could do with those broadcasts. So in Android N, um, we said, for instance, the connection action broadcast. You could not anymore listen for this in the register. Uh, and you, couldn't, you could no longer register for this in your uh, manifests. And the reason was that it was an extremely noisy broadcast. We didn't want to be waking up apps to inform uh, about connectivity changes. Uh, it was too expensive. Um, similarly, there were two other broadcasts that were targeted in N. And that's action new picture, action new video. These are fired when uh, a user takes a picture or uh, creates a little video. And so this is action new picture is actually a great example to consider when you think about what the system health implications are of allowing a broadcast like that to happen. So imagine a user takes out their phone, takes a photograph. At that point, um, there are, let's say, 20 apps on the user's device which have registered for this broadcast. The system says, all right, let's go. Let's wake you up. Off, off we go. One, two, three, four, five. And each of those apps now wants to do some really great, impressive things, because who doesn't want to impress the user, right? And so they start services, they start expensive stuff. And before you know, the system is saying, hey, apps six, seven, eight, I can't really launch you before I kill off one, two, and three, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, so the system is, in this point, in turbulence. It's, it's launching stuff, it's creating stuff, it's killing stuff, doing whatever it can. Uh, Heaven forbid the user takes a second or a third picture, goes even more crazy. So in Android N, we said, this is, this is no way for an operating system to be behaving. You cannot register for these things in the manifest. We're not going to be waking up your apps. We're not going to go crazy every time somebody takes a picture or makes a video. Um, so, that's, so that's the background of that. 
Um, now, the location stuff that we're going to talk about is largely driven by battery constraints. Uh, and battery has been a huge issue for us year after year after year. After year. Um, in our surveys, developers tell us, users tell us, sorry, that one in three users say that battery is the number one concern for them about Android. Um, and what happens is users, rightly or wrongly, associate location with battery drain. And because they do that, they go and disable location altogether, which makes all the nice apps that you guys have written either not work at all, or they work in a degraded manner. This is not good for the app developer, it's not good for the user, it's not good for Android as a platform. So this time in O, um, um, Google has taken a very serious approach to battery management uh, and targeted uh, background usage of location as a primary culprit, uh, which needs to be sort of carefully managed for battery to work well. All right, so that's, that's the historical stuff. Uh, one more little segue before we dive into the O limits, uh, which is that you know, all through this time, we're going to be talking about started services, implicit broadcasts, background location, and it's a good thing to take maybe a minute and say, what exactly is foreground, what exactly is background? It's sort of obvious at one level, and maybe not so obvious at another. Um, so the obvious stuff, when you have a visible app component, when the user can see your app, when your activity is started or resumed, you're in the foreground. When you have a widget, you're in the foreground. Fairly obvious. Uh, when you have a foreground service, you are considered in the foreground. Kind of obvious, it's a foreground service. Don't let the service part feel, fool you. Stay with the word foreground. You are in the foreground with a foreground service. Um, when you have a bound service, and there is a client in the foreground binding to that service, you are then also in the foreground. When you have a content provider and there is something that is in the foreground accessing that content provider, you are then also in the foreground. Uh, and then there's a slew of sort of very specialized cases which if you read about these, you will understand, yeah, these kind of have to be foreground. An accessibility service, for instance, has to perform all sorts of actions on behalf of the user. It has to be considered foreground. Notification listener service, abstract account authenticator, wallpaper service, you can find documentation on uh, developer.android.com explaining uh, all of this pretty carefully. The, the good news is, in all of these cases that I mentioned, nothing that re relates to background limits in Android O applies. None of that. You can keep, if you're in the foreground, you can pretty much do whatever you could do in, in any release up till now. Nothing really changes for you. But when are you now not in the foreground? When are you in the background? So you're no visible app component, so your activity is stopped. There's no widget. Um, you are in a started service that is not a foreground service. So that would put you in the background. You are um, in a job service. We'll be talking a lot about job scheduler and jobs um, later on. But when you're in that part of the code, you are, again, going to be in the background. And when you're uh, dealing with, the, with broadcasts inside your broadcast receiver, you also, in this time, are in the background. Um, in all of these cases, the background limits that have been introduced in O, they will apply. So it's kind of a big deal. Trivial apps can do without dealing with broadcasts and services, et cetera. Most people don't write trivial apps. They write mature apps. Uh, those apps will be affected by these changes. So, I'm going to dive into services and what's changing with services in Android O. Uh, lots of fun stuff. Uh, as I said, this is a pretty technical talk, so we'll go deep into this. Um, from now on, applications can no longer freely execute background services. So the idea is we want you to stop thinking about services and start thinking about jobs. Move to job scheduler or Firebase job dispatcher for the kind of work that you would currently give to services. Apps that are doing ongoing work with regard to broadcasts should also start thinking about jobs because um, you know, starting a service, for instance, to do something in response to a broadcast will no longer be possible. Um, the idea behind these changes is fundamentally that if expensive work or potentially expensive work is being done uh, on behalf of the user, the user should be aware of that. It should be visible to the user. 
if you are doing things that cost the user data, battery, RAM, whatever, the user should sort of say, hey, I know you're doing this. I approve. This is making my app experience really quite good. Keep doing it. We don't want expensive work sort of happening quietly in a clandestine manner without the user's approval. So that's sort of that's the guiding principle behind, behind a lot of these changes. So now what happens if you do call start service and you're not in the foreground? You get an illegal state exception. If a pending intent is involved, then you won't get this exception, but it still won't work. You'll get a log warning. Basically, there isn't a way when you're in the background to start a service anymore. Um, so this is pretty, this is kind of a big deal. Um, it, I don't know if you think it's a big deal, but when I first found out about this, I was like, whoa, that's a big deal. Um, but there are actually some very practical ways in which this is softened up. Um, so one of them is that there is a grace period. Um, so services continue to run on for a while uh, once you lose your foreground status. So take an example of you have an app, the app does some, you, the user is using the app, it launches a service, the service is doing fine, and then the user swipes away your app, it's gone now, it's no longer in the foreground, the service won't be killed off immediately. There will be a few minutes uh, of grace period where the service will continue to run, at which point the system will step in and say, okay, enough of that, and it will kill off that service, but it won't be immediate. And effectively what will happen in a few minutes is, uh, the services on destroy method will be called, and it will be as if the service had called stop self. The system will just do that for you. Um, but it's nice that it's not abrupt. There is a grace period. The second is, I think, the realization that sometimes when you are in the background, your app is going to want to respond to certain events. They may be very user visible events. They may be other kind of events. And for that, there is a process to temporarily whitelist apps, to temporarily treat apps as if they were in the foreground for doing very specific things. This is probably best explained with some examples. So let's say you have a high priority cloud message coming down to your device uh, that pierces those um, restrictions and your app now wants to do something with it. So we give you a period of a few seconds, less than a minute, whereby you can be considered foreground and you can launch services. Similarly, if you have an SMS or an MMS delivery, you may want to respond to that. So again, there is a short window where you're given temporary foreground status and you can respond to that. Um, and in Android O, notifications um, are kind of a big deal. Um, when, uh, when you are responding to a notification action of any kind uh, and there's a pending in intent involved, uh, at that point you are treated as if you are in the foreground. So this is sort of a very pragmatic approach that the framework team has taken. They've said, by and large, we don't want you doing expensive work in the background, but we do understand that there are some cases where you'll need to do it, and here's how you do them. So this whitelisting process um, should, in fact, um, help most developers target what they need to do uh, pretty effectively. That's our hope. Um, Foreground services are not affected by any of this. So you can have a foreground service, uh, have a persistent notification, the user sees that, and life is good. Uh, the only problem is uh, that foreground services um, have typically been done in two steps. You start a service in the background, and then you promote it to foreground. The first part is not going to work anymore. You can't start services in the background. So there's a new API for starting foreground services. Essentially, it does that two-step thing, and it just does it for you. Um, we'll talk more about um, foreground services and the appropriateness of foreground services in a bit. Um, so a question I was asked when I did this presentation in India by a developer, he said, do you expose any kind of API where I can tell if it's safe to start service or not? Uh, no, we do not. It's for the app developer to figure out when it is safe and when it is not safe to start a service. Essentially, you have to sort of do your homework and figure out when you're in the foreground, when you're not in the foreground, and go with that. Um, so that's, that's the gist of the services part. A couple other points to tidy up. Bound services are unchanged. Um, because we're thinking much more about foreground and background, 
there are some sort of semantics of this that are interesting. So for instance, if I am bounding, if, if I'm in the foreground and I'm binding to one of my own services, that's no big deal. If I'm in the foreground and I'm binding to somebody else's service and they're in the background, then they too will be considered foreground because a foreground client elevates their status to foreground as well. So these are sort of things that as you start thinking in, in sort of O semantics, uh, in O terms much more, uh, will be very obvious. Uh, it's not something that I thought a lot about when I was writing code. Um, so this is, this, was, this is gonna be a little bit of an adjustment as we go into O. Um, all right, here we go. Question that's asked to me, what about intent services? Uh, you've talked about started services. What about intent services? Intent services are just services. They are started services. Everything I've said about started services applies to them. Um, and in fact, um, this is kind of a big deal. So the support library now has support for the job intent service class. Uh, and that's supposed to be a replacement. It could be considered a replacement for intent service. We'll talk more about this uh, in a bit. Fundamentally, we would like to start thinking that jobs are the way you want to go about this. Services, expensive broadcasts are really, have served us well, somewhat well, up till O, but from now on, job scheduler, Firebase job dispatcher, and jobs are your real, real Swiss army knife as you go forward uh, building your apps. So that's services. A lot of stuff to take in, a um, lot of changes, um, so I'm going to throw more stuff at you now uh, about background limits um, and broadcasts. So the limitation is on implicit broadcasts. Um, and the, the, the gist of it is that limits to implicit broadcasts delivered to manifest defined receivers are not going to be honored for the most part. So um, at this point, the question comes, what is an explicit broadcast? What is an implicit broadcast? If you go to Stack Overflow, you'll see all sorts of confusing answers about that. Um, and the answer here simply is, if a broadcast is explicitly targeted at something, at someone, at some package, some app, um, then it's an explicit broadcast, and you can put it in your manifest. If it is not, if it's a general broadcast that is sort of sent out into the wild, it's an implicit broadcast, and you should not put it in your manifest. So take, for example, action package replaced. Um, action package replaced, if you register for this in prefer O in N and lower, uh, you will have this broadcast go off every time any package is replaced from your device. That's pretty noisy, right? Um, contrast that with action my package replaced. In this case, the broadcast is sent only to me because my package has been replaced. So this is a kind of a big distinction. It's not always in incredibly intuitive, but I think this is something that developers will have to think about. Explicit broadcasts can still be put in the manifest, no problem. Um, now, there are some implicit broadcasts that the framework team has understood need to be allowed. And they are, um, and if you follow these, uh, there's a pretty good reason why each one of these is, is uh, permitted to still be put uh, in O-World uh, in your manifest. So action boot completed. Okay, this fires once. It's required by apps to set up jobs, alarms, et cetera, et cetera. It's not hugely disruptive. It's okay. Uh, action locale changed. Well, your locale presumably doesn't change a whole lot. Uh, and when it does, it's not totally unreasonable that apps will want to respond to that. Um, action headset plugged. Now, this is, you know, the user plugs in their headset. So at that point, um, there's a user action involved. It's not entirely unreasonable that some app is going to want to respond to that. Again, this is not hugely disruptive. Uh, when you have received an SMS, you'll want to respond. This is a very partial list. The whole documentation is there, or android.developer.com, um, and it uh, will explain to you why all these broadcasts, uh, while, they're being while they are implicit, are still actually completely okay. Uh, the dynamic registration of, for broadcasts is completely okay. Nothing of this has changed. So you can always use context.register receiver, and as long as that context is valid, you will get whatever broadcasts you re registered here. So that's completely okay, it's not changed. The idea is if your app is being used, there's an active context, and you register for a broadcast, it's not hugely disruptive for the system to give you that broadcast. But if your app is asleep, 
that's a different thing. So those, that's the way to think about these, uh, these uh, limitations that are being introduced in O. So at this point, you're thinking, well, this is fantastic for, developer, for users, right? Uh, your battery is preserved, your system health is so much better, no long running services, all the noise that was generated by these broadcasts, that's pretty much quieted down. What about me, the developer? I had all these great ideas, all these great plans. What am I supposed to do? Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what you can do is a bunch of strategies. So first, instead of having long running services, if there is some external stimulus that changes something in your app or that wants to change something in your app, use cloud messaging. It's fantastic. You can use a cloud messaging. Uh, if you use high priority, it'll pierce through those. It'll give you temporary foreground status, and you're good to go. Um, if you use normal priority, that's still very good because now the operating system can very judiciously, carefully, efficiently schedule the work that you want to do. Um, normal priority should be your default. You don't want to abuse this. Um, and you want to preserve the system health that comes from that. Um, another thing is you can use job intent service. I had mentioned that a few slides ago. Job intent service is um, part of the support library. It's very new. Uh, it should be considered a replacement for intent service. And basically what it will do, it's, it's aware of background limits. And it will just sort of do the right thing. In pre-O device, uh, pre-O apps, it will run context.start service. And in O and beyond O apps, it will run jobscheduler.nq for work. So this is a pretty good way to sort of have all that abstracted away and you don't have to think about it. Um, wakeful broadcast receiver is now deprecated. The whole point of wakeful, wakeful broadcast receiver was that you're handling a broadcast and you kick off um, a service or something like that. Uh, you can't do that anymore, so there's really no reason to have this sticking around. Um, and finally, and this is kind of an important conceptual point, you want the operating system to be your friend, right? So go back to that example I gave of somebody taking a picture which spins off the starting off of 10, 15, 20 apps, all of which are now starting services. At that point, the operating system can do one of two things. It can either run your app or it can kill your app. It cannot do anything else. It'll try to run everything, but when it stops, um, when it loses the ability to run everything, it'll start killing things. You don't want the operating system be, to be turned into a killer. You want to schedule the, your, your, your work to be scheduled intelligently by the operating system. So for that reason, it's much better to use jobs. Um, when you use jobs, the, the operating system can say, all right, one, two, three, I run you now. Four, five, I run you, I run one again. It can schedule that intelligently. So you want, you want to go for that. We encourage, you, you, we encourage you to use job scheduler as much as you can. And the big topic, you can use foreground services uh, for doing all sorts of great work, and there are no limits. So a very temp big temptation would be to say, oh my god, so much is changing, and oh, I'm going to just slap on a foreground service, and I don't have to think about this. The problem with that is the foreground service has a certain meaning, right? Um, when I'm listening to music, when I'm in a fitness app, when I'm using maps and navigation, it makes sense that there is a notification at the top and that it's doing work for me even when I'm not actively engaging with the app. If that is the case in your apps, great, use a foreground service. It's a fantastic idea. But if it isn't, the users are going to start wondering why the hell there is this persistent notification at the top telling them that you're doing expensive work that they don't understand. They'll probably either stop that work, or worse still, uninstall your app. Uh, you don't want that to happen. Use foreground services if it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, think of all the other strategies that we've outlined um, and go with those. Uh, and finally, since O is pretty much putting you in a position where you have to think about background and what you're doing in the background, I think it's a good time to ask, do you really need to do all this background work? I think there has been a sense for many, many, many years now in Android that it's cool to just spin up something and have it run forever and ever in the background and the system will somehow handle it. Um, well, now the system is telling you, no, no, we don't want to handle it. We don't want this to happen. So if we are really at the point where we are questioning all this, it's a good time to ask, 
hey, I started doing all this background work three years, four years ago in my app. Do I really still need to do this? The answer sometimes you will find will be, no, I don't really need to do this, in which case you shouldn't. All right, fast segue to location. So first of all, location is kind of a huge topic. It's used in a ton of apps. In fact, when I started looking at logs to see who was using location, I was surprised. Like, oh, I, I didn't think all these apps were using location, but they are. Um, and in Android O, the limitations uh, on location are actually very significant. So let's, let's talk about those. Um, so again, as I mentioned, people treat location as they associate that with battery drain. They turn off location, um, and your apps don't work properly. So we believe this doesn't help anyone. We believe that location should be used wisely. It should be used efficiently. It should not be conflated as a, uh, automatically with battery drain. Um, we want people to love their location apps, right? So this is where kind of big changes have happened in O. Uh, and you will see, while this may seem a little dramatic at first, you can see how much better an experience this will be going forward for app developers. Um, so the location limits are, that background apps um, will receive location in a very throttled way. So when you're in the foreground, you can pretty much request location, I don't know, as often as you want. Let's say you want updates, you can have location updates, 30 seconds, whatever. Um, once you go in the background, we will give you location updates a few times an hour. That's it. So um, this is kind of a big deal. Um, and this will happen regardless of the target SDK version. So on your N apps, your M apps, your L apps, and whatever, this will start happening now, the moment all devices start appearing on the market. Um, you can use batching, and what that does is it collects location ever so many times and then delivers all those location data to you in a single, uh, in, in a batched way. And that's a way that you can get more data points um, you trade latency for more data. But your data will still be delivered only a few times an hour. Um, this changes in O to Wi-Fi scanning. So um, we could have an entire talk about what makes location expensive, what doesn't make it expensive. But GPS is very expensive, super accurate, but very expensive. Wi-Fi isn't actually that cheap. So now the deal is that no location computation will be performed when the device stays connected to the same static access point. There's no need for it. Your location isn't changing. We're going to sort of be very judicious in making Wi-Fi scans because they're expensive. Uh, and this is good for, for a lot of people. For me, I spend, I don't know, at a time, 8, 10, 12, 15 hours at home. I'm connected to the same Wi-Fi. Why the hell does location services have to compute my location over and over? It's not changing. Um, similarly, when I'm at work uh, and I spend eight, 10, hopefully not 15 hours at work, um, again, I'm connected to the same Wi-Fi. Nothing's changing. Why does location service have to expend um, um, energies uh, trying to compute my location? Most people spend a lot of time at home or at work. So there's a lot of changes to Wi-Fi scanning that actually make O much better. Um, there's also changes in O to how geofencing works. So it was quite normal up till O to scan for geofencing every few seconds. Um, and we have now made that not every few seconds, but around a two minute latency. latency. This is sort of vague. Uh, but we, what, what we noticed that even going from, let's say, tens of seconds to two minutes, uh, for geofencing latency gave us dramatic battery performance. Um, in some devices, it was 10x. It's a little bit device dependent, so it's not always going to be 10x, uh, but we found it to be really quite dramatic. So that's another change that's come. Um, so this is all, up till now, everything I've said about location is about what happens when you run your N app, your M app, your L app on an O device. What, if, what happens when you actually start targeting O? What happens to location? Um, so the first thing is, you know, we've always told you um, when you request locations, use a pending intent dot get service. 
That's one of the arguments that you pass to the request, uh, to your location request. Um, you can't do that anymore because, because it's O, there's no get service, background services can't be started, so you're gonna have to have a different strategy, and that strategy is you use pending intent or get broadcast, and then you go and register an explicit broadcast in your manifest, and that will work. So the targeting of O is not hugely hard. Um, I think it will, um, uh, it should be fairly painless to do it. Getting adjusted to the idea that you are running on O when you hadn't planned to is going to be an adjustment, and I would urge all of you to start thinking about this path. So what are good location strategies? Like what can you do as developers now? Because frankly, with the location stuff, these changes are here now. Sooner or later, O devices are going to start showing up, and people are going to start running your apps on those O devices, and then they will notice that location works differently. So a very good strategy, instead of having long-running services or expensive and very fast location updates in the background, is to start using geofencing much more. We have generally found that people use geofencing less um, than we would like them to, Geofencing is very, very, very supremely optimized for performance. So for instance, if I have a geofence around the Krakow airport, and I have a geofence around the airport that I will be flying to in a couple of days in San Francisco, uh, location services knows that I, there is no chance, that there's no reason for it to expend any uh, cycles trying to track the geofence that's in San Francisco. I'm not there. Uh, but it also knows I'm actually not that far from the Krakow or airport, so it will very carefully um, uh, and judiciously monitor that geofence. So a lot of the use cases for location updates involve uh, updates around an area. When am I near home? When am I near a restaurant? When am I leaving a place? Et cetera, et cetera. And geofencing can be a huge, huge asset. So please use it as much as you can. Um, use batching. So I promised I'd talk more about batching, so I'll do that now. Essentially what you're doing is, when you're in the background, you're only gonna get updates a few times an hour, but you can get more data points as long as you prepare to give up um, the trade-off is with latency, okay? So here, here, look at this code now. So you create a location request, uh, you set its interval to be 10 minutes, so you say give me location updates every 10 minutes, and then you say, but deliver them no later than 30 minutes. So in a normal situation, what will happen is you will get three location data points every 30 minutes in this kind of a case. If you didn't set the max wait time, uh, you would not get batching, and therefore you would miss out on data points. Uh, another very, very important location strategy in the age of O is to get your location passively. So what are we talking about here? Um, basically, location is computed on a device basis, not just on an app basis. So when your app is in the background and therefore getting fairly infrequent location updates, another device, another app may be in the foreground. It may be a mapping app, it may be some other app that gets location updates quite a lot. Um, location services free of charge will make that stuff available to you, the data points available to you and to any other app that's in the background and wants that data. So this, is, this kind of opportunistic uh, location gathering, I think, is extremely good. It's, we believe it's underutilized, and we would like developers to use it much more. So here's an example how you can do that. Again, you create a location request. You set the interval to 10 minutes. You set the max wait time for batching to 30 minutes. Um, but then you set the fastest interval to, let's say, two minutes. Meaning, if I'm in the background and anybody else is consuming location data, every couple of minutes, let me know about that data. And given the sheer number of apps that use location, uh, there's a pretty good chance that when the user is using their phone for something else, they will be gathering location data, and then you can have it for free. Um, so that's, that's, that's a very important strategy. I would urge all of you to use it. Um, while you're doing all this, you know, because of these changes in O, um, we're putting developers in a position where they kind of have to rethink their location strategies from scratch, right? If you're gonna do that, you might as well rethink them from pre -O for pre-O apps also. 
if you're running an N app or an M app or an L app, that too could use some of the same principles that we are putting forward in O and become more battery efficient. So why, why wait? You can start making things better now. So fundamentally, location is expensive in one of three ways, related to frequency, latency, or accuracy. So O is saying to us, um, on, on, on the frequency axis, it's saying that when you're in the background, you need to not be so frequent. You can implement that now for your N apps, for your M apps. Um, again, latency. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes you want the real-time experience, but sometimes it's actually okay to wait a few seconds uh, before you get the location data that has been computed for you. So use batching, like we just talked about. You can do that now. Um, uh, if you're using a geofence, um, you can use a responsiveness time. The more you give it, the better your battery performance will be. You can do all these things now for your apps. Uh, and when you're, when you're at it, I mean, O isn't really dealing with accuracy that much. Uh, if you're rethinking everything in regards to location, you might as well also say, do I really need high accuracy all the time? Um, maybe I can use a balanced power accuracy, maybe no power. There are a lot of options. You can read our documentation on this. Do I need the best, greatest, most expensive location updates all the time? Probably not. Um, and finally, foreground services. You can, you can go right ahead and just completely bypass all these location limits in O by running a foreground service, but you just have to make sure the user will really approve of that service. Otherwise, they will get annoyed with your app and they will probably uninstall it. Don't want that. Uh, that's basically it. A uh, lot of stuff. Um, I'm around. If you have apps that you think are going to be now struggling with some of these O limits, please come and talk to me. I'd love to hear your story. Um, and uh, happy coding. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Ask Firebase Show. Can I use, this is a long question. Oh, it's go. It is go, that's correct. Next question. 
We've been working hard to build the improvements and enhancements you've been asking for. I'm going to use cloud functions for Firebase to respond to authentication events. Magic! Firebase! Sure enough, there's that exception. Are you going to start using a helmet when you skateboard? <laughs> I sat in front of the computer, I felt like I had superpowers, but people told me I was just wasting my time. When I turned seven, I got tasked to build a computer with my dad. It was mind-blowing for me that, you know, something that I built came to life. When I graduated high school, my parents just told me that I need to do something that can lend me a job. I didn't really know where to go anymore. I gave up on my dreams of pursuing computer science and eventually I got into business school. I felt like I was out of place. I felt like it wasn't a good fit and I knew it wasn't a good fit. Dropping out felt really risky because I was afraid that I'm gonna make the same mistake again. Since my parents didn't graduate high school, they didn't know what was right for me. I found Udacity it was a good way to learn about different areas of computer science before I start my studies again. Online learning is really good at reflecting the market's needs and you can start with something like web development and work yourself up to self-driving cars. It's all in the realm of possibilities and, and you don't need a degree and you can do it from anywhere in the world. With Udacity and Google, you build projects which are interesting for potential employers. When I had my job interview, they looked at the app I built and they saw what I could do for them. Once I got my certification from Google, it took three months to go from knowing some programming to landing a job. It's just really a fast-track program to becoming an Android developer. My work really reflects how I approach things, and seeing people enjoy that gives me the feeling of being on the right track.
Welcome to Machine Learning APIs by Example. I'm going to teach you how you can use pre-trained APIs to access pre-trained models with a single REST API request. My name is Sarah Robinson. You can find me on Twitter at srobtweets, and I'm a developer advocate on the Google Cloud Platform team. I focus on big data and machine learning. I'm based in New York. This is my first time in Poland. I'm super excited to be here. So before I get started, thank you. <laughs> I want to talk about what machine learning is. So at a high level, machine learning is teaching computers to recognize patterns in the same way that our brains do. So over time, as machine learning models are given more examples and experience, they can improve. And with more data, they're able to generate better predictions. So it's really easy for a child to differentiate between a picture of a cat or a dog. But it's much, much more difficult to teach a computer to do the same thing. So let's pretend for a minute that we don't have any machine learning models. We don't have any deep neural networks. And let's try some human-powered image detection. So if we take these two images of an apple and an orange, and we were to write an algorithm to differentiate between these two, what are some things we might look for? You can shout it out. Color. color. I heard color. That's a good one. So if we looked for color, we could say, are the majority of the pixels in the image red? If so, it's an apple. Otherwise, it's an orange. And that would work pretty well in this example. But what if we had grayscale images? Then we'd have to start over again. What are some things we might look for now? Stem, texture. Those are all good ones. We could look at those different qualities. And that would take into account uh, the grayscale images. But then, what if we got crazy and added a third fruit? What if we added a mango to the equation? Then we have to start all over again. So you get the idea. Uh, but these images are all pretty similar. They're all images of fruit. They're relatively circular. Uh, so the image classification should be a lot easier if we have two images that look nothing alike, right? So what if we have a picture of a dog and a mop? They have pretty much nothing in common. The mop is not living or breathing. It has no eyes, nose, or ears. It's actually kind of difficult. <laughs> so here we have pictures of sheepdogs and mops, four of each. And it's actually kind of hard even for the human eye to be able to distinguish between the two. So the point I'm trying to make here is, what if we have photos of everything? We don't know exactly what photos our users in our application might upload. Uh, might not just be photos of fruit or animals. We're probably going to have photos of all sorts of things. And in addition to photos, we might have other types of unstructured data. So we might have video, audio, or text. And on Google Cloud Platform, we have two ways to help you make sense of this unstructured data. So on the left-hand side, if you want to use custom data to build and train your own machine learning models from scratch, we have TensorFlow, which is an open source library to help you do that. And if you want to run your TensorFlow models on managed Google infrastructure, you can use Cloud Machine Learning Engine. What I want to focus on today is the right-hand side. And this is what I like to call friendly machine learning. So these are APIs that give you access to pre-trained models with a single REST API request. So I'm going to cover all of these APIs in this presentation. And I'll dive right in with the Vision API. The Vision API lets you do complex image det detection with a simple REST API request. And before I get started, I want to talk about some companies that are using the Vision API in production. So the first one, the example on the left, is Disney. And they used the Vision API uh, for a game that promoted their movie, Pete's Dragon. And what the game did was it was a scavenger hunt type game that sent users on a quest where they had to take a picture of a certain item, maybe a couch or a computer. And they need, if they took a picture of that item, uh, the app would superimpose an image of Elliot the dragon on that photo. So they needed a way to verify, did the user's image match the clue that it was given? And the Vision API was a great fit for that. Uh, Realtor.com is a real estate listing service. And they use the Vision API's optical character recognition feature to extract text from an image. So when somebody is looking for houses and they use the Realtor.com app, they can take a picture of the for sale sign and then be immediately directed to the correct listing in the app. Uh, and Realtor.com is using the Vision API to extract the text from that picture and direct them to the relevant listing. So these are the core features of the Vision API. 
Label detection will tell you what is this a picture of. Face detection will tell you are there faces in the image, where are the faces located, and what are the different emotions in those faces? Are they happy, are they sad, angry, or surprised? OCR was the use case I mentioned before with Realtor.com. This can extract text from an image. It can tell you where the text is and what language that text is in. And then explicit content detection, pretty self-explanatory, will tell you is this image appropriate or not? Um, and this is really useful for pretty much any site that has a lot of user-generated content. So you can, instead of having somebody manually review the content, is it appropriate or not, you can send it to the API, and then you only have to review a subset of those images. Landmark detection will identify common landmarks, and logo detection can find company logos in an image. So to show you uh, some of the JSON responses you get back from these endpoints, I want to look at face detection. Uh, this is a selfie I took with two of my teammates. We're actually here at this conference. Uh, we took this last year in Petra in Jordan. And face detection returns an object for each face it finds in the image. The JSON response here we see is just for my face. So we can see that headwear likelihood returned very unlikely, which is true. I'm not wearing a hat in the picture, although both of my teammates are. And then joy likelihood returned very likely. I was excited. I was on vacation, taking selfies. Uh, and it also returns data on where different features are in your face. And then if we look at landmark detection, we can take this picture of a pretty common landmark. This is the Eiffel Tower, right? It's actually not the Eiffel Tower. It is the Paris Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. Uh, and I wanted to see if the Vision API could spot the difference. And the answer was that it could. Uh, so it correctly identified this as the Paris Hotel and Casino. And you'll notice that MID in the response. Uh, the MID is an ID that maps to Google's knowledge graph. So if you want to get more information on this entity, you can send the ID to the Knowledge Graph API to get more data on the Paris Hotel and Casino. Uh, we get a bounding box of where this is found in the image, and then we also get the latitude longitude coordinates for this landmark. We've got some additional features in the Vision API. Um, one is crop hints, which will give you suggested crop dimensions for your photo. Web annotations will search the web for additional details on your image, and I'm going to get into that more in the next slide. And then document text annotations improves the OCR, OCR model uh, for the API. So it's much easier for it to identify um, text in large blocks of text. So if you have an image of a menu or a business card, um, it can break your text down into paragraphs, words, and symbols. So I want to focus a little more on the web annotations endpoint. And to do that, I have this image of a car. Uh, it's not just any car. It's a car from the Harry Potter movies. I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Um, and it's on display in a museum. So this is a car from the second movie. And I wanted to see what, the, what entities the web annotations endpoint was able to find. So the first one it found was that it, this was a Ford Anglia, which is indeed the correct model of the car. It also returned Art Science Museum, uh, which is a museum in Singapore where this car is currently on display. And then finally, it was able to tell me that this is from Harry Potter. So the way that it does this is it finds similar images from across the web. And based on the context of the pages where those other images are found, it's able to extract these entities. We also get, in addition to the entities, the web annotations endpoint will give us additional details on the image. So we'll get all the URLs where this image has been found on the web. So this is really useful if you have an app where users are uploading images. And you want to make sure that this image is theirs. It's unique. It hasn't been seen before. You can use full matching images to guarantee that. Partial matching images, exactly what it sounds. It'll give you um, URLs of visually similar images. So this is kind of like a reverse image search. Um, so we might see images of this car in another context. And then pages with matching images will just show you the URL where all the exact image matches were found. You can all try this in the browser with your own images. If you go to cloud.google.com slash vision, um, you can try it out, see if it's right for your application before you start writing code. And in case you were wondering about our sheepdog versus mop example from before, um, this is what the API returned for this, the bottom right picture of the sheepdog. So it's 99% sure that it's a dog, and it's even 77% sure that it's a commodore, which is the exact breed of dog that this is. It was able to identify this as a broom or a tool. And I won't show you the response for all of them, uh, but the API was able to identify three out of four for each of these correctly, which is pretty good considering that 
this model wasn't trained specifically to identify pictures of sheepdogs and mops, um, and it was able to identify almost all of them correctly. So that was the Vision API. Uh, next, I want to move into the Speech API, which exposes the functionality of OK Google to developers. So it lets you implement speech-to-text transcription in your applications in over 110 languages. One company using this API is Azar, and this is a chat application. They've connected over 15 billion matches so far, and they're using the Speech API anytime uh, an audio snippet is sent between people. They'll transcribe it with the Speech API. And these APIs are really easy to combine with each other, so they're also using the Translation API. Anytime two of the matches don't speak the same language, they'll transcribe it with the Speech API and then use it through the, uh, pipe it through the Translate API uh, to translate it into the host language. We recently launched a new feature of the Speech API just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Speech Timestamps. So if you specify this in your API request, instead of just getting the transcription, you'll also get the start and end time uh, for each word in your transcription, which makes it really easy to search for text within your audio. So I'm gonna go into a demo shortly of the API. Um, Briefly, I'm gonna explain how it works. So I wrote a bash script that's gonna call the speech API. First, it'll make a recording using SOX, which is just a command line utility for audio. Then we'll create an API request in a JSON file. We'll send it to the speech API, and then we'll receive the response back. So let's go to the demo. Cool. So the way that I'm gonna call my script is just with bash request.sh. And it's going to ask me to record five seconds of audio. So I'm going to record something. Here we go. I'm super excited to be in Krakow, Poland for Google Developer Days Europe. And I'm going to send that to the API. While I do that, this is what my request file looks like. It looks like it did a pretty good job. Uh, this, is what, this is the transcription that I got. And it's 93% confident that it transcribed that correctly. Um, I want to briefly talk about what the request file looks like. So here in our config, we just needed to tell the API the encoding type of our audio. We're using FLAC here, the sample rate in hertz, the language code, which if you leave this out, will default to English. Uh, if you're transcribing in another language, you just need to specify the language code that you're using. You can optionally pass it some phrases. So if you've got some uh, proper nouns that are specific to your application that the API may not recognize normally, you can give it hints of things to look for. We can also give it a parameter called max alternatives. Um, so you can you notice here we got three possible transcriptions back. So you can use max alternatives to specify that. And then you can pass your content in either as a base64 encoded string or as the URL of an audio file stored in Google Cloud Storage. So that is how the speech API works. And I've got one more speech API demo I want to show you um, to highlight the timestamps feature. So here I've got a video of ORS talking about GCP's Google Cloud Platform's pricing philosophy. And below the video, I have the transcription that the Speech API gave back. Um, now, what I can do with timestamps is I built a demo that we can search through the transcript, essentially. So if I click on this, Google Cloud Platform delivers. we can skip to the exact point in our audio where this occurs. So if I go to another 70% line, you get the idea. So the timestamps feature I'm really excited about because it makes it easy to search a large library of video content um, just using the transcription. So the way that I did this is I extracted the audio from the video and then sent that audio to the speech API. So, and, and I have more than one video here. So I've got a, a bunch of videos about cloud, Firebase. Um, so let's say I want to search for all my videos that mention Firebase. I can do that here, and I can actually jump to the exact moment in the video where I see Firebase. So this video is a screencast tutorial about Firebase hosting. And we can see all the points Firebase hosting. that mention Firebase, which is pretty cool. In this video, we've only got one mention of Firebase. So if our job was to look through the video and find all the mentions of Firebase, chances are we might miss it. Um, but with the Speech API's timestamp feature, we're able to jump right to that point in the video. Firebase real-time data. So that's an example of the timestamp feature, feature of the Speech API. Uh, and we can go back to the slides now. So with the Speech API, you can transcribe audio. Once you've got that text transcription, the next thing you might want to do is extract more data from it. And that's where the Natural Language API comes into play. So with the Natural Language API, 
you can extract entities, sentiment, and syntax from your text. One company that's using it is Wootrick, and Wootrick is a customer feedback platform. So what they enable their customers to do is if you look at that box on the top right, um, their customers place these feedback forms in various places throughout their application, and they ask them, how is your experience on this specific page from zero to 10? So they rate their experience, and then they have this open-ended feedback. Um, and Wootrick's job is to help their customers make sense of this feedback. So it's pretty easy for them to make sense of the numbered feedback. But what's much more difficult is making sense of that open-ended text. And they're using all three methods of the Natural Language API to do this. So they're using entity and syntax annotation to extract the subjects um, and see how people are talking about different topics. And then they're using sentiment analysis just to gauge, did the numbered score the person line up, um, line up with the open-ended feedback that they gave? And so this enables them to do things like, say they have a high-priority customer that's angry about usability. So they can route that request really fast to the right person. And with the Natural Language API, they're able to route and respond to customer feedback in near real time, instead of having people manually go through each open-ended response. So now I want to talk about each of the three methods of the Natural Language API. Uh, the first one is extracting entities. And obviously, I have a Harry Potter example again. Um, so I just took a sentence about JK Rowling from her Wikipedia page, and I wanted to see what entities the API found in this example. We got these five entities back. Um, and then I wanted to look closely at the JSON response it gave for each one. So notice that these are three different ways of referring to JK Rowling. Uh, if you're wondering, the third one is a pen name she used for a different book series. That's a topic for another talk. Um, but all of these map to the same entity. So they all point to her Wikipedia page. So it's able to normalize these different mentions of the same thing. So in our JSON response, we get back the, her name, the type of entity, she's a person, and then we get some additional metadata. We get that MID, which maps to her um, knowledge graph entity, and then we get the Wikipedia URL for her. Similarly, for British, it maps to the Wikipedia page for United Kingdom. So if instead this had said United Kingdom-born novelist, it would have mapped to the same entity ID. And we get a similar one for Harry Potter. Um, and if you have entities in your text that don't have a Wikipedia page associated with them, the API will also be able to identify those. It just won't return anything for metadata. So if this instead had said my name, uh, the metadata would be empty because I don't have a Wikipedia page yet, at least. The second thing we can do is analyze sentiment. So if I had, this might be something I might find on a restaurant review. The food was terrible. I will not be going back. If I was a manager of this restaurant, this is probably something I'd want to flag and maybe respond to, but chances are I don't want to go through all the reviews to do that. Um, so I can use the sentiment analysis endpoint to get some data on the sentiment of this text, and it returns two values. The first is score, and score will tell us on a scale of negative one to one how negative or positive is this text. And then magnitude tells us, regardless of being positive or negative, how strong is the sentiment in this text? And this is a range from zero to infinity, normalized to the length of the text. So since this is pretty short, we get a small number of 0.9. And then the last method of the API is analyzing syntax. So this gives us more linguistic details on the contents of our text. Um, so here if we have the sentence, the natural language API helps us understand text, the first thing we get is a dependency graph. Um, so this is called a dependency parse tree, which tells us essentially how do the different words in the sentence relate to each other. So this is one piece of data we get back. We also get the parse label, which tells us what's the role of each word in the sentence. So in this example, helps is the root verb, API is a nominal subject. So it tells us um, the role of each word. We also get part of speech. So it tells us is it an adjective, a verb, a pronoun. And then we get lemma, which is the canonical form of the verb. So in this case, we just have one for helps. The canonical form is help. Um, and this is really useful if you're counting how many times a certain word appears in the context of your app. Um, you probably don't want to count helps and help as two separate mentions. They're really just the same word. So you would use the canonical form here to do that. And finally, we get additional morphology details on our text. Um, this is going to be a little bit different depending on which language you send to the API. So this is just a visualization of all the JSON you get back. Um, you can actually create your own if you go to the Natural Language product page. 
There's a little try it demo in the browser, so you can enter your own text. I'll share a link at the end. You can enter your own text and generate these visualizations as well. So I want to show you a demo um, specifically focused on the syntax annotation endpoint of how you could actually use that in an application. Um, so I've, I've been running some natural language processing on tweets using the hashtag GDD Europe. And what I did is I wrote a little node script that calls the Twitter streaming API. Um, and I'm just looking for tweets with that hashtag. So the streaming API won't give me all the tweets, but it'll give me a subset of tweets with GDD Europe in it. So I'm taking those tweets, and I take the text of them, and I send that through to the natural language API for processing. And then I store that in BigQuery. And BigQuery is Google Cloud Platform's big data as a service tool. So it lets you analyze really large data sets super fast. So let's switch to a demo. There we go. Um, OK, so this is the BigQuery web UI. It lets me visualize my data stored in my BigQuery table directly in the browser. And here I have um, the schema. Let me make this a little bit bigger. I've got the schema for my table. So I'm storing the ID of each tweet, the text of each tweet when it was created, um, how many followers the user has, the hashtags as a JSON string, which I get from the Twitter API, um, the tokens, which is a giant JSON string returned from the natural language API, and then the score and magnitude. So we can preview this. Looks like we've collected about 840 tweets so far, which is really, really small for BigQuery. BigQuery is meant for lots of data, but this is just a demo. Um, so we've got the text of the tweet, and we've got the hashtags, and we have this giant JSON string of the natural language API response. Um, and we write all our BigQuery queries in SQL. So you may be wondering, how am I going to parse this giant JSON string with SQL? And the answer is that BigQuery has a feature called user-defined functions, which lets you write these custom JavaScript functions um, to parse different columns in your table. So here I want to find what adjectives people are using when they talk about GDD Europe. And I've written a function just to look for um, each token. And if the part of speech tag is adjective, um, I'm going to do a running count. So I'm running this query. And let's see the results. So it looks like pretty positive adjectives used about GDD Europe, which is good. Um, so these are the most, most commonly used right now. And again, what's really cool about this is this ran this on all 840 of our tweets. Um, and it ran really fast. 3.1 seconds, um, but ran this custom function on all of the tweets in our table, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll do one more query for you. I'm a big fan of emojis, so I wanted to see which emojis are people using most frequently uh, when they talk about GDD Europe. So I'm looking at the token again. Um, it looks like the laughing, crying is a popular one, clapping, Firebase. Overall, not too many, though. So maybe people should use more emojis in their tweets. Um, but the goal of this demo was just to show you uh, what you can do with the syntax annotation endpoint of the natural language API to do things like see how sentiment is around a particular topic. So that's a demo. We can go back to the slides now. Um, so another thing you might want to do with text, in addition to analyze it or transcribe it, is translate it into uh, many languages to support all the users in your application. The translation API lets you translate text in over 100 languages. Before we get into it, I want to look a little bit at Google Translate. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Google Translate. Anyone else here use it? Looks like uh, most people. Um, so I use it especially when I travel somewhere where English isn't the first language. I was on a trip to Japan last year, and I really wanted to order octopus. So I translated it, found out that the word was taco, which I was a little confused, but I was like, I'm going to go with this. So I showed it to the waiter at the restaurant, and I did get octopus back. So Google Translate success. Uh, but you probably want to do more with Google Translate than just translate the word for octopus. Uh, and the translation API essentially exposes all the functionality of Google Translate to developers. One company that's using the translation API is Airbnb. Uh, and they actually have 60% of the bookings are connecting people that use the app in different languages. And they're using the translation API not only to translate listings, but also reviews and conversations. Uh, and they found that using the translation API significantly improves uh, a guest likelihood to book. Here's a Python example uh, of how you would call the translation API using the Google Cloud module for, um, for Python. And notice here that we just pass in the string of the text we'd like to translate and the target text language. We don't need to tell it the source language. The API can detect that for us. 
Um, and if you also just want to use the API to detect the language of text, so if you've got users inputting text in a variety of languages, you can just use the detect language endpoint to do that. So we get our translation result, pretty straightforward. Um, one improvement we made to the API a few months ago was um, improvement to the model called neural machine translation. So the way that the model works before uh, with first generation translation is that it would take each word in your sentence and translate it word for word. So this is similar to what you might do if you were traveling, you had a dictionary with you and you had a sentence you wanted to translate and you did a lookup of each word. Um, now the accuracy would be pretty good, you'd probably get your idea across, um, but it wouldn't be perfect. And what neural machine translation does is it takes the context of each of uh, the surrounding words around each word in a sentence and it's able to produce much higher quality translations. Um, there's a great New York Times article about it if you want to learn more. It's available at this link, bit.ly slash nyt dash ai dash awakening. Um, and just to highlight the differences between the two models, I've got a Harry Potter example again. Um, what I have here on the left, I know there's a lot of text on this slide, but I'll explain it, um, is the original Spanish translation. Um, so Harry Potter was translated into over 70 languages, and they didn't use the translation API to do that. That probably wouldn't have worked very well. Um, they had somebody translating the text for each one. So this is a paragraph from the original Spanish translation, and I've translated it into English using first generation translation in the middle and then the improved neural machine translation on the right. Um, and I've just bolded some of the differences. So you can see these are small improvements, but they make a big difference in terms of the overall quality of the translation. So that is the translation API. Um, and the last API I want to share with all of you is the Video Intelligence API. And this is our newest machine learning API on Google Cloud Platform. Um, and what it lets you do is it lets you understand your video's entities at shot, frame, or video level. One company that's using it is Cantemo. Uh, they're a media asset management company. And so all of their users have tons and tons of video content that they're uploading into the system. And they're using the video API to help their users better be able to search large libraries of video. The best way to see how the video API works is through a demo. And so the demo I'm going to show you here is what I've got is the video of a Super Bowl commercial for Google Home. And I'm going to play the video. And you'll notice that it starts with a mountain pass, goes to a house, a city street, lots of scenes changing in the video. Now we see a dog. I won't play the whole thing, um, but you get the idea. There's lots of scene changes in the video. And if you were to manually uh, transcribe what was happening, you'd have to watch the whole thing, write down what was happening in each scene, and then maybe store those tags in a database somewhere. And with the video API, it essentially does all of that for you. So the JSON response tells you at a high level what's happening in this video, um, what is the video about, and then at a granular level, what's happening in each scene of the video. So if we look below this, we can see all the labels that the, that the video API returned. So for example, it knew there was a dog in the video, and it knew exactly when that dog appeared. It knew that it ended with birthday cake. Um, and if we scroll down, we can see it identified even the type of dog that we had there. Um, and it's also able to identify that mountain pass from the beginning scene. Um, so that's pretty cool. And this is just one video. So chances are, if you want to analyze videos, you've probably got a lot of videos sitting around in storage buckets. Um, and the video API, with, with the JSON response you get back, it makes it really easy to search a large library of videos. So if you look here, I've got lots of videos. And let's say I'm a sports media company. Um, and I've got lots of sports footage. And I want to create a highlight reel just of one specific type of content. So let's say I want to create a highlight reel of all my baseball clips in my videos. So without the video API, I'd have to have somebody man manually watching all the videos to find baseball. Um, with the video intelligence API, this is pretty easy. So if I search for baseball here, we see that I get back not only which videos have baseball, but we can see all the scenes that have baseball in them. Um, so this video is almost entirely about baseball. I really like this example here because we've got a long video, and there's only one tiny baseball clip in the video. Um, so here we have the year in search video, which Google publishes at the end of every year, highlighting top searches. And if we skip here, we can see that baseball clip. Um, it's actually when the Cubs won the World Series last year. I'm from Chicago, so I was pretty excited about that. Um, but there's only one small baseball clip in this video. So if somebody's job was to scan it for that, that clip, chances are they might miss it. It's only one or two seconds of the video. 
Um, but with the video API, it's really easy to make our library searchable. Um, so I'll do one more search. I'm going to search for beach because uh, it might be nice to be on a beach right now. It's a little cold today, maybe a little rainy. So now we can't go to a beach, but we can search for all of our beach videos. It's the next best thing. Um, so here we can find the beach clips in all of our videos, which is pretty cool. Um, so something that used to take hours, now with the Video Intelligence API, you can do in seconds or minutes. Let's go back to the slides. So just briefly, I want to share how the demo works because it uses a couple of other Google Cloud Platform products as well. Um, all of the videos are stored in a Google Cloud Storage bucket, and I've got a cloud function listening on that bucket. Um, so that cloud function is triggered any time a new video is added. It's going to make sure it's a video file, and then if it is, we will send it to the Video Intelligence API for processing. Uh, and the Video API lets you pass it in the request parameters, the URL of a different cloud storage bucket where you'd like it to write the annotations to. So once it's done annotating the video, it's going to write all my annotations to a separate cloud storage bucket. My front end um, is a Node.js app that's running on Google App Engine, which is our platform as a service tool. And so the front end isn't calling the video API directly. All it's doing is getting the video from one cloud storage bucket and then the associated metadata from another. This is what the response looks like for label detection. Um, so here we have a video that has a scene of bird's eye view. And we get this locations data. So it's going to tell us the start and end time in microseconds uh, that this label occurs in our video. And then if, if it occurred more than once, I'd have more than one object in my segment part of my response. And we also get a confidence score. How confident is it that it correctly labeled the scene of our video? So that's all I've got for the APIs. Um, I encourage you to try them all out in the browser. Um, so as I mentioned for the Vision API, um, I showed you how you can try that in the browser. You can actually do that for all of our machine learning APIs. Um, you can use your own audio, text, video, try it out, see the API response. Um, and then if you want to find the code for most of the demos that I showed you today, it's available in the two repos listed there. So I'll let you all get a picture of that slide real quick. And thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Finally, if you, have, if you have feedback, I'd love to hear it. So uh, just go to this link or follow the QR code to fill out a feedback form. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Ask Firebase Show. Can I you? This is a long question. Oh, it's go. It is go. That's correct. Next question. We've been working hard to build the improvements and enhancements you've been asking for. I'm going to use cloud functions for Firebase to respond to authentication events. Magic. Firebase! Sure enough, there's that exception. Are you going to start using a helmet when you skateboard? <laughs>
I sat in front of the computer, I felt like I had superpowers, but people told me I was just wasting my time. When I turned seven, I got asked to build a computer with my dad. It was mind-blowing for me. And, you know, something that I built came to life. When I graduated high school, my parents just told me that I need to do something that can lend me a job. I didn't really know where to go anymore. I gave up on my dreams of pursuing computer science and eventually I got into business school. I felt like I was out of place. I felt like it wasn't a good fit and I knew it wasn't a good fit. Dropping out felt really risky because I was afraid that I'm gonna make the same mistake again. Since my parents didn't graduate high school, they didn't know what was right for me. I found Udacity was a good way to learn about different areas of computer science before I start my studies again. Online learning is really good at reflecting the market's needs and you can start with something like web development and work yourself up to self-driving Can you hear me? All right. I'm, I'm Dan Galpin, and Lisa Ray and I will be giving you a tour of the highlights of the latest platform and support library updates. And we've got so much to cover, so I'm just going to jump right into it. So one of the biggest changes to know is we added adaptive launcher icons. And this is a big deal, because if you have any of these phones from these lovely OEMs, you saw they were using their own custom launchers with custom icon shapes. And you know, Android icons, shapes and sizes are all random. And so what they would do, like with Chrome in the Play Store here, is they would shrink the icon and stamp on it a random color or shape that they choose. And we thought, you know, we can do something better for this. So um, what we did is we created adaptive icons. And to enable this kind of customization, your app provides icons in two layers, background and foreground. So if the OEM defines a rounded rectangle mask shape, the user will see this. And if they define a circular shape, it's going to look like this. And this is cool, and this goes every single way your place your icon appears in the system UI, such as inside the setting app list, the recents or overview title bar, and your shared sheet dialog. So to support wider ranges of icon sizes, because not every launcher makes the icons the same size, as you've also probably noticed, um, bigger than 48 dp, we now recommend that apps contain an icon asset of at least 72 dp in size with a visible area. So if an OEM or third-party launcher wants to render icons in 60 dp, it will not be super sampled. Now, the actual size of this foreground and background layer that we want apps to update to is 108 dp. And we recommend that both the foreground and background layers are actually padded with 25% of an extra image around each side. And the reason we do this is because we want to use it to add delightful animations, such as parallax and pulsing. And this is just an example. No, we haven't actually added this to a shipping launcher, but someday we might. Um, so you can now control how your brand is going to look, no matter what icon shape your OEM chooses, while integrating well into their visual design. So this is actually important. And so here's what we've done. We've added this adaptive icon drawable class to Oreo, and it supports a foreground and a background inner tag that supports one drawable attribute. And also as a vote to help this out, um, we added this fractional inset value. And, uh, so this, and this means your inset can now be density invariant, um, which is really, really cool. Um, so as it turns out, 18 over 8 is 16%. Uh, so if you use this value to pad your 72 dp launcher icon, there will be no APK size increase from a non-adaptive icon that's big enough. Um, but better yet, the really cool thing is that because these are only used in O, in Android N, the vector drawable became expressive enough to support most of the SVG format. So you can actually now make vector icons, which is really cool. Um, so once again, O made a bunch of critical changes to other areas, too. Not just adaptive icons, we made critical changes to notifications. Now, in previous releases of Android, the user could only block all the notifications for an app for sending a spammy notification. But in Android O, of course, we introduced notification channels, which are named categories of notifications that share the same behavior so users can control them. And the user can also click here to see all the categories, and clicking on a category reveals per category things like vibration and sound, et cetera. 
And of course, we also added these dots in the launcher, which are a low stress way to see if apps have notifications. I don't have to look how many numbers there are. All long pressing the icon also reveals the notification. And widgets can also really be installed easily in this way, which is so cool because people don't have to like stress and figure out how to install them. Um, all right, and all the stuff you use to customize per notifications now applies to the whole channel. So this is pretty cool. You can set all this stuff on a channel. Um, okay, I do have a bullet point slide here. I'm sorry. But seriously, um, don't overwhelm your users with channels. Uh, you know, make the distinctions between them make sense. Give them reasonable defaults. And of course, you can use notification compat to set channel information. And remember that if you don't use channels and you're targeting Oreo, um, your notifications aren't going to show up. All right, let's talk about shortcuts and app widgets. So way back in Android 7.1, um, we added these nifty launcher shortcuts, and users can drag them and pin them to the launcher, and apps can request that a shortcut gets pinned, but there was no indication to the app that it actually worked, and the user wasn't notified that it was happening, which wasn't really great for users or developers, and it doesn't work anymore if you're targeting O. Uh, so we now have the new way with Shortcut Manager, and it, it has an API, and it takes the same shortcut info as we use in Android 7.1, but the launcher will now ask the user whether to add the shortcut and where to place it. So the app can now update, and the app also has the ability to actually update the shortcut, uh, shortcut icon later as well with this. And uh, custom shortcuts were also in 7.1. Um, it allowed shortcuts to be added from the widget tray with an optional configuration screen. And the Oreo API is an improvement there as well. Um, as before, you, add the, you, you register the custom shortcut activity with the create shortcut intent filter. And in 7.1, it would return the shortcut as intent extras directly to the activity return, which is OK. But now we wrap all of that functionality, which also allows the app to update the shortcut. So again, just making the launcher better. And this has been a really long time coming. <laughs> but we actually have a way for you to surface your app widgets in your app. <laughs> like, like, you don't no longer have to beg the user to find it in the launcher. You can say, hey, I've got an app widget. Please install it on your behalf. And they get prompted, and they get added to the home screen. It's just awesome. I can't believe it took us this long. All right, let's talk about autofill. All right, so apps that use standard views automatically work with autofill. But you can help it do a better job by providing hints, like postal address. Um, you can also mark fields that autofill should ignore. Um, you can also request, uh, you can integrate it more deeply. So you can actually request autofill in your, in your app. And uh, you can use autofill on completely custom views, such as those that are drawn that are with OpenGL or Vulkan, um, by providing a, an autofill virtual structure. And no matter how you build your apps, you should really consider doing this. Um, and this is kind of cool. Uh, if you have a website, the Google autofill provider can actually share um, credential information between your web and your app if you create a digital asset link. And this is pretty straightforward. Um, you've got to put something on your, on your server, some JSON here, um, which allows you to define that you want to share your login credentials between your website and your app. And then you go and modify your manifest and you got to, which, with this string that points to a similar JSON resource that contains a list of web targets and permissions, just like what you've hosted on your website. And that's it. With these two steps, you can share credentials between your website. And this works for autofill. And it's also the first step in uh, implementing Smart Lock. So you might want to do that also, which just lets your users automatically sign in. But if you don't want to go all the way to Smart Lock, this is a really cool way of leveraging that credential information between your mobile app and your website. So another st O stuff, we added a whole bunch more cool strict mode behavior, which is great. We now actually, uh, and this is great for finding bad app behaviors. Um, we can detect unbuffered I.O. Uh, with thread policy, and VM policy allows you to detect untagged sockets, as well as when a content URI is sent that doesn't grant the calling app read or write permission, because it's not very useful to have a call. Yeah. And we've also added seekable file descriptors from document providers, so you can use this for large remote sources, such as big audio and video files. OK, another thing we did is we actually added proper support for caching. So the quota here can change depending on how frequently the user actually interacts with your app uh, and, the amount used, um, uh, and the amount used, while the allocate actually takes you know, deletable cache into account. So pretty slick. And there's tons of more stuff in O. I'm not going to go through it all here. Most of you have seen a lot of this stuff. But we have ex enhancements to accessibility, including the ability for users to add an accessibility button on devices that have soft navigation, something else for that bar, uh, paging and content providers, a bunch of great stuff to make the runtime faster, as I mentioned before, such as a concurrent copy and collector, and a whole bunch of changes in media. All right, but let's get into the support library. 
So you know what I'm going to say here, um, which is devices that are running le SDKs less than 14 comprise less than 1% of the Play Store active users. So we've updated the support libraries and minimum SDK level. And as you might have guessed, we got rid of these two guys. We'll be fo focusing on the SDK versions that most developers are actually targeting. So the minimum version is now 14. And Google Play Services also recently dropped that support in version 10.2. However, you can still use an older version of the support library if you really, really, really want to still target Gmail Brother Honeycomb. Uh, and dropping API 14 gives us a bunch of benefits. Uh, we removed over 1,400 methods. And remember, we still have a 65K method dex limit on APIs less than 21. And there's more to go in later versions. Um, our public AC API surface reduced by 30 classes and 400 methods. And what you need to do now is you can, you, know, you can still use a lot of these things as they are, but you should start actually getting rid of the deprecated stuff because we're actually going to get rid of it to even uh, make things smaller. And of course, we're using the Google Maven repository for this, which you can specify in your build Gradle. This is on uh, Android Studio 2.3. Uh, and if you're using uh, 3.0 plugins, you can actually just say Google, which is kind of sweet. All right, text and fonts, um, which is one of my favorite things. I love fonts. Um, in the old world, how many people actually did custom fonts on, on their Android app? Yeah, a lot of you. You know how much it, how, how it kind of sucked. You had to load typeface into constructor, and then you, you could go and use this custom text view everywhere, and you know, yeah. So, but now we have a new resource type, with ex which both accepts single font files as well as families. And font files get a resource ID. And you can also make these families, which are groups of fonts, that are together. So you can define them and say, like, I want normal to be this font, and I want bold to be this font, and, and you know, et cetera. Very, very sweet. And this one generates r.font.myfont. And this is super easy to use in XML. The text view font family attribute is, is used. And it can handle families, which is even better. So you just get to use the same thing you've been using all the time. Um, both textile um, attributes as well as style spans are supported, which is really great. Um, and you can also define them in styles as usual. You can use them in, in code by resources compat. And most importantly, it's supported on API 14 and above with the support library. So go out there and make and use more fonts. And uh, the only problem, of course, is that fonts actually bloat the size of your app. So we had to think about this. The top 25 uh, fonts in Google Fonts actually uh, average 500 kilobytes or more. And they're not optimized for mobile necessarily. So we're like, what do we do? How do we fix this? So of course, we added downloadable fonts. And, this, and the font provider fetches and service fonts to your app. So most importantly, you don't have to bundle them anymore. And this is really cool, too, because this font provider is actually shared between apps. So it gives you memory, it gives you network, it gives you space savings. And with Google Play Services and Google Fonts, you get 800, over 800 fonts. So it's, it's really nice. Um, and in code, you can request these fonts using a font request, which, which contains things like authority and package and certs for security and callbacks for success or failure now exist. Um, uh, and then you, or, and of course, you, you just use uh, fonts contract compat, and, uh, and you do control what thread this runs on, so don't run it on a UI thread. Um, and, uh, and this, you can also throw it in XML. So this is really easy to use. The certs is actually a string, a string array. And um, it actually is pretty cool. So we've also done full integration in Android Studio. It looks like this. We have some boring text in the layout. And we go and select more fonts. You see we've got Google Fonts here. We've got this beautiful selection of fonts, but it's so many, I'm just going to search for one. Um, there we are. Yesteryear, we say a downloadable font. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to show up in the layout editor. And then it's going to add this beautiful file, actually two files, to the project. So pretty sweet. So check out the sample app, the Google Fonts docs, and the guide on developer.android.com for all the info. And best of all, downloadable fonts are also supported in API 14 plus. All right. So there's nothing worse than when someone sends you a message and you get a box which provides no information. We call this tofu because it's box. So it's time to get rid of this because, you know, it's, because and this is there because the system has always bundled the emoji font. And Unicode keeps adding new emoji. And it's impossible for us to keep up unless we can make it show up in older versions. So the support library has access to this new font. And it checks per glyph if it can be rendered or, or replaces this with these emoji spans if it can't, which is great. Um, there are two ways for you to use it in your app. Um, the download configuration just happens to integrate with downloadable fonts. So you just add your dependencies, um, you make your font request, and you initialize it in your application on Create. Very simple. It means you don't have to actually bundle the emoji font with your app. Um, but you can. Uh, if, you're, if you're targeting a non-GMS devices, you can, you can do that. It's, it'll add a, about 7 megabytes. And you configure it in a similar way, again, with uh, just bundled emoji pat, confat 
config. So very straightforward. Um, again, you can just, uh, you, you have to use these emoji text views uh, instead of text view, and you can use emoji edit text and emoji button instead of edit text and button. And you don't, and you don't have to use these, but you, if you don't use them, you have to integrate it into your own custom views yourself. So we do supply these uh, to help you out. And so now, tacos and unicorns both exist. Uh, important things for us to get across. So check out the sample uh, and, and on DAC. There's more information. Now, one caveat here, we didn't actually backport this all the way to KitKat. This does require API 19 plus. So that's the, the, one, the one minor caveat here. But again, so you'll get tofu on some older devices um, if, if you try to set this up to use it both ways. Um, text view auto sizing. This is a feature I've wanted to add. How many people have built their own text view auto sizer? Yes. I've been wanting this feature forever. So I'm so happy that it's finally here in the platform. Um, it text actually resizes to fill in its container. I, I can't tell you how excited I was when we built this thing. Um, um, so you use the auto text, size tep uh, auto size text type uniform. And uh, use an, you can use, use an array of preset sizes or an array of values. Or set a min and max size with a step. So it's really easy. And once again, we brought this to API 14 plus. Uh, we bring we bring improvements to vector drawable, and this gives it uh, feature parity with support for fill types. So if, if it looks like this in Android Studio, uh, and and you you shove this in, you, this might be what you get before because you get these weird artifacts because uh, we're using these even odd fill rules, and um, and we didn't support that. There was a big TBD in the source code if you went and looked. Um, <coughs> Uh, so a fill role defines how this renderer designs which of the regions are inside and which are outside, and we added support for this in uh, define and we uh, which which we actually fixed finally in SDK 24, and we backported it to 14 plus. So this is really cool. It means your vectors are more likely to work, which if you've ever had to deal with, you know how you know how awesome this is that we finally fixed it. Um, we also did uh, uh, ported uh, the stuff from uh, animated uh, 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 drawable compat for path data morphing. And this is really cool. This is an example of using Shapeshifter, Alex Lockwood's tool, to generate compatible images with matching path formats. And so let's look at what's going on here at the XML level. We start with our vector, defining our, our starting image, a buffalo. We've extracted the path data. And uh, for the buffalo, hippo, and elephant, so string resources. And then we use an object animator, pretty sweet. So again, uh, we're specifying the path values to, to morph a buffalo to a hippo. And once again, we tie it all together in an animated vector XML. Now, we can actually do stuff with bundle XML formats to make this even cleaner. So again, um, we can actually use an attr element here that inlines the XML from the buffalo drawable. And then we can do the same with the animation attribute. And so we have a bundle package that actually includes the entire vector drawable animation, which is really cool. Um, we also have a path interpolator, once again, as parity. So um, this one's kind of complicated, but we can take a simple example and show how it works. So if a UX designer it wants to shrink a, uh, you know, a sound of square, but they want it to have an interesting acceleration curve as it shrinks, we can use a path interpolator. And uh, this is kind of cool. We can make a curve that, that drops off quickly, and snaps back a small amount, and slowly tapers off. Here's our morph animation, and we'll set the interpolator to be our path interpolator. So once again, we can bundle it in a single file using these atters, and this results in this cool slightly more cool animation, um, still just a rectangle. OK, final thing I'm going to talk about is transition support library. Um, so if, you, if, you've, if you've noticed that we actually added some additional transition type in Lollipop and above, uh, things like path motion and propagation, and all of this is available in the transition library. So when you use the transition XML with the support library, you have to specify this dash dash no dash version transitions as an AAPT option. And after that, uh, you can use all the same transition XMLs that you use for platform transition API on API 14 and above. And the reason I'm talking so fast is because I want to get my amazing collaborator on here, who is really the star of the show. I'm just the opening act. Uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Lisa Ray, who's going to talk about some amazing animation features. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I only have one thing to talk about. And that's physics-based animations. So we've known for a long time that motion is mater important in material design. Natural movement inspired by forces in the real world. And I've tried. I really have. But it hasn't always been easy. So the support library has now introduced two implementations of physics-based animation, not approximations of motion with a stock interpolator, 
but motion based on natural forces. Could you have done this before? Maybe, but it wouldn't have been easy. With dynamic animation, these ideas are now central to the way we can animate. So my hope is to make this type of motion easy for you to think about and easy for you to use in your app. Some things that are easy now that were hard before, responding to user animation, uh, user interaction, by which I just mean a touch, chaining animations, modifying them on the fly, getting great natural movement with much less visual jank. So I'm going to step through the mechanics of the two dynamic animations we have right now, and then we'll mix it up. So the first, a fling animation. It starts with an initial velocity, it slows down, and it ends gradually. So every time that color changes, it's starting a new fling. And here's the simplest fling that you can possibly make. Ball is a view, translation y is the property we're changing, and its velocity is pixels per second. I discovered while making this that pixels are a lot smaller than I thought. Everything else is default. And so that's what you just saw. You can customize a fling by changing its friction, the factor by which it slows down. So here's an example of friction. So from left, you have high friction to low friction on the right. So the less friction that you have, the more distance your view will travel for a given velocity. And here's a spring animation. And it looks just like what we'd imagine from the motion of a physical spring. It exerts a force back to the end point of the spring. And you can even get a bounce. So every time the color changes, that is a new spring animation. And here's the simplest spring you can possibly make. Ball is a view. Translation y is the property we're changing. And zero is where it's going to stop, which is its final translation at equilibrium and its velocity is pixels per second. And everything else is default, and it just goes. So to customize this, you can call get spring on your animation, and that gives you its internal spring force object. And that has a damping ratio, a stiffness, and you can set the final position. Damping is the ratio by which the size of your bounce is reduced over time. And the default is medium bouncy. In general, the lower the number, the more oscillation you'll see, AKA bouncing, before the force is gonna reach equilibrium. At one, you get critical damping, which means no bounce. And at zero, you get no damping, which means infinite bounce. Don't do that. In general, please do not under damp your views. Uh, this crazy bouncing is what made me think at first, why on earth would you ever want to do this to a view? So try little or no bounce, and I think you'll be surprised how useful this animation can be. Stiffness is like the stiffness of a physical spring. So for a given starting velocity, how far will it travel from the endpoint and how fast will it be pulled, be pulled back? This example has no bounce uh, so that you can see the difference in the stiffness better. The lowest stiffness is on the left, so it's traveling further. The highest stiffness is on the right. And you can also create your own external spring force in order to share it among multiple animations. We'll see why you might want to do that in a moment. So one thing you might want to do with these animations is allow user input. So Velocity Tracker is one option to handle this. It's an older but a goodie. Uh, this class has been around since API 1. Uh, it does what it says on the tin. It tracks velocity from a user's touch. Uh, you can also use Gesture Detector if you only care what the end state of the fling is uh, because its fling callback has velocity. So how would you use this? We're gonna go with Velocity Tracker for now. You'd use it in a touch listener on the parent of the view you want to track. Parent is important. Call VelocityTracker.obtain to get an instance of the tracker. Then you can feed in the user's touch events, starting with down and continuing with move. Then in action up, you'll call compute current velocity and it will compute a nice velocity for you. After you're done, make sure to clear it. That velocity is going to come in two components, x and y. Then you're going to start two dynamic animations at the same time, one for the x velocity and one for the y velocity. This would be a good reason to share a spring force. They're going to run simultaneously. And as you can see, this is enough. This gives you a smoothly moving, interactive, two-dimensional animation. And as you can see, it works pretty well. 
Just be careful when you fling, because they do not automatically stay on the screen. And when they're gone, they do not come back. Just like other animations you're familiar with, dynamic animation also has end and update listeners. So that's how I was chaining them in my earlier demonstration and changing the ball colors to repeat over and over again. So let's chain to fling animation. We're going to fling just as we did before using the velocity from our drag listener and velocity tracker. And we're going to create two fling animations at the same time, one for x and one for y, to get natural movement. Then we're going to stop the first animation at the edge and create a new one in a different direction, giving the impression the ball has bounced. This time, we'll add an update listener and an end listener to each of our flings. On each update, we'll check to see if the ball has slipped outside the bounds of its parent. There's probably a better way to do this, but that's an exercise for the reader. <laughs> if it did go outside, we'll cancel the animation. That means we'll get a call back to on animation end. If we canceled it, meaning it hit the edge, then fling it back. As you can see, I made an extension function on view here because I got tired of typing. We'll use the velocity passed here, which is the remaining velocity from the canceled animation. And we'll use it in the opposite direction, which is the minus sign you'll see there. Of course, it's not exactly this simple. What this does is it flings the ball straight back at you because it reverses both of its velocities, x and y. So what we really want is natural reflection. We want it to only reverse its velocity on one axis, but continue on the other. And that's what will give us this 90 degree bounce angle. So it's not too hard. It looks like this. If it's hitting the horizontal edge, reverse x. Otherwise, reverse y. And we get a nice reflection or bounce. And it also works with different animations. Um, ever seen something like this? There's an app that keeps trying to do this on my home screen. I don't know why I'm encouraging you to do this, but uh, it's interesting because it's quite simple. And it's sort of a sticky effect, where if you fling it to the edge, it sticks there and absorbs the extra mo momentum with a spring bounce. So to do this, it's going to look something like this. The thing to note here is that we're using the ball's current translation value as its end value for the spring. So we're going to fling, as before, put an end listener, and then when we get the call back, go ahead and oscillate until you reach equilibrium, dissipating the remaining velocity. Chaining springs. There was a really cool demo in the Google I.O. talk I went to of three balls connected with springs. I'm not going to explain that here because I did a great job already in that talk. So if you want, go look it up and then come back. So here's a real layout in a, from an Android app using the same effect. This is inspired by a screen in the Plaid app by Nick Butcher. Sorry, Nick. Uh, where as part of the screen transition, there's several on-screen components that translate up subtly one after another. So in that effect, the distance translated, the delay of each element, and the interpolation used to simulate acceleration and deceleration are all hard-coded by hand. That's a pain in the butt. Here, it's all done with the same chained spring we just saw with the balls. I'll go through how that works. So what's actually going on here? These two strings are almost exactly the same effect. Obviously, the top ball, the blue ball, is the lead. The yellow ball follows it. And the green ball follows the yellow ball, almost as if they're chained together with bouncy springs. Uh, in the actual app example, the lead view is the headline and icons. The next view, the paragraphs, follow it. And finally, the fab is following the paragraphs. And you can see here that there's no, uh, there's no rule that these views actually have to be in a line in terms of position. They can be anywhere. What matters is the propagation of effects from one animation to the next. So how do I do this? Instead of a touch listener, I started with a fixed spring animation on the headline. The thing to notice here is that instead of giving it a velocity, I gave it a start value. Basically, I said, pull the spring back this far and start it there. And I gave it an update listener, which we've seen before. Then I made a spring animation for the paragraphs exact same thing. In the listener getting callbacks from the headline, I call animate to final position on the paragraph animation. 
Um, this is an, a really important and useful method. So it's going to do two things. One, it sets the new final position of the paragraph spring to the current position of the headline animation. And two, it starts the paragraph animation if it hasn't yet. And then finally, we'll do the same thing for the fab. We'll set an update listener on the paragraph and chain a spring animation to that. And that's how chaining works. The difference here from what we were doing before with flings is that those animations were subsequent, one after another, and these are actually happening simultaneously. You might also notice, if you're looking very closely, that I also used a spring on the alphas of the views and on the scale of the fab. So what else can you animate? And you can animate a lot of built-in properties. Certainly everything I can think of flinging or springing off the top of my head. You can animate alpha, translation, rotation, scroll, scale, and x, y, and z, which are absolute positions, including translation. But if you want to animate something even crazier or just make a custom property that groups a couple of these, um, you just make an instance of float property compact. You also need to set the minimum visible change so the animation knows when to stop and doesn't keep on animating tiny, tiny bits forever. You can also start every dynamic animation at a particular start value, give them a minimum and maximum. And finally, cancel your animations because if your user quits the activity while they're running, your app will crash. So cancel them. These APIs are available from Jellybean and above. And I'm sure you got all of that. But if you didn't, all the code for every one of these demos is on my GitHub, Lisa Ray slash physics dash playground. So my takeaway here that I want is physics animate physics based animations. They're not toys and they're not just for games. They're way more than bouncing balls. They are a great way to bring natural motion and interaction to your current UI. So I look forward to seeing what you make with them. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. We started is on our living room couch, and we really started because of the problem that we had, which was asking the same question to our closest friends, where are you, what are you doing? We were baffled by the fact that there wasn't a solution that solved this problem, and we felt like we could build one that was better. The value that is drives for all users is knowing which of your friends are nearby. So if you look around where we are right now, an arena, how many times have people gone to a basketball game, hockey game, or a concert and found out the next day that they had friends who were at the same event? And think about all those moments that are missed because they didn't know they had friends there. So what we're solving is letting people know who's nearby and making those moments matter. My name is Diesel Peltz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Is. I'm Mark French, co-founder of Is. We felt there was no reason users should manually go fetch data. When I get a text message, there's no reason for me to tap refresh. And we felt, why should it be different from anything else? And Firebase let us solve that. Firebase really allowed us to enhance user experience by making it real time, simplify the UI by not having a refresh button, and cut down on development time. Like any startup, the most valuable asset that you have is your team and your time. And what Firebase has allowed us to do is save 50% in terms of time by moving that much quicker with a product. It's a game changer. We're using eight features from Firebase right now. They're analytics, remote config, dynamic links, the real-time database, and more. Traditionally, that would have been in eight different places. And now we go to one place, which is the Firebase console. We're eager to launch this product in a big way. We're seeing how people are using the product and how they're inviting more and more friends that we're concerned. We're growing very, very quickly. So we sleep a lot easier at night knowing that we got Firebase that's really there to build that infrastructure.
If you're a developer, use it. We love it, and it's enabled us to focus on developing the user experience and not have to worry about the things in the background that should be there. Raise Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Raise Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Raise Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class, and we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. The Google Developer Agency program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and which touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. The comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. 
And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one, and nine times out of ten, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links, and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least, that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behaved very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase Dynamic Links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, you can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing, too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase Analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about Dynamic Links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away! Does this symbol look familiar to you? And how about this screen right here? Waiting for things to load is part of everyone's mobile app experience, but it's never a good experience for your users. And how would you even know what that experience is? Your users are on a wide variety of devices, on a wide variety of networks, in a wide variety of locations all over the world. If you want to optimize the performance of your app, you need metrics that tell you exactly what's happening during the critical moments of your app's use. And you need that information to come directly from your users. Now, you can get it using Firebase Performance Monitoring. By integrating the SDK into your app, and without writing any code, your performance dashboard in the Firebase console will collect information about your app's performance as seen by your users. You'll get data about your app's startup time and details about its HTTP transactions. 
And using the provided API, you can instrument your app to measure those critical moments that you want to understand and improve. Then in the dashboard, you can break down the data by country, device type, app version, and OS level. So try out the Firebase Performance Monitoring SDK at no cost for iOS and Android to gain insights into your user experience today. And to learn more about Firebase Performance Monitoring, check out the documentation right here. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tom. I'm one of the technical leads over on our VR and AR efforts at Google. Um, my team specializes in developer productivity tools. Um, I'm really excited just one week after announcing AR Core to stand here today and talk to you all about the AR, uh, AR Core SDK preview and how you can really easily add AR capabilities to your Android apps. Um, so just a quick run through of what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna talk about AR and its really closely related cousin VR. We're going to talk about the concepts that underpin AR Core. We're going to have a walk through the API. We're going to talk through all the options that we have to build our AR content. And we're going to talk about all the options for building your code as well. So before we get into the technical details, uh, I really want to start with what immersive computing means, uh, where we've come from, and what can it do for you? So I'm always asked, like, you know, why AR and VR? You know, we have these mobile devices and it's all great. Why should we go and do these other things? So with Cardboard, Daydream, and Tango, we've been investing in this space for quite some time. And we really believe that interacting with your data in a more natural way is the future. Immersive computing removes a lot of those abstractions between you and your computing. 
So I want to take a minute just discussing these technologies before we jump into some code. So we think of AR and VR as being points on a spectrum of immersive computing. On the far left, you have reality, which is the world as we know it and we're sat in today. If we start to add digital content into our reality, then we start to augment it, and that is hence augmented reality. And if we completely replace that reality uh, with the virtual, we have virtual reality. And so AR can bring any of your digital content to you and in your world, such as this guy posing with the dog. Um, so some of the benefits of AR, you can see objects at real size and scale in your world. Imagine being able to buy furniture and being able to see if it actually fits in your house before you buy it. You can also see things in context. Again, imagine buying that furniture and making sure that it matches with all of your other decor in your house. And being able to, imagine being able to like annotate the real world with like post-it notes without actually causing a real physical mess. And it also adds the ability for uh, natural input for 3D scenes. So if ever you've used digital content creation and modeling tools, it's actually really hard to control that camera uh, in your scene. With augmented reality, you just hold your phone and you just look at it, and anyone can do it. And then if you replace everything in your world with the virtual, uh, with digital content, you've got virtual reality. It allows you to go to places and uh, visit worlds in an instant. And some benefits of this are you get complete immersion. You really feel like you've been transported to another place. And there's some really, really huge innovations in input uh, that really lets you work naturally in your world. Both VR and AR enable to us experience computing more like we experience the real world. And both take advantage of a lot of the same technologies. So back in 2014, we started with the idea that your devices should be able to understand more of the world. So with dedicated hardware, Tango allowed us to understand the depth and allowed us to build some really great applications from being able to measure your world, being able to map and share your house, and to be able to play some games on your tabletop with your friends. We built two consumer devices with Asus and Lenovo, and developers created more than 100 applications for Tango. We learned a lot. And now we can do more with software than we could three years ago. And we don't have to rely on custom sensors, which leads us today and last week's announcement with AR Core. So last week we announced AR Core. It's a preview SDK that allows you to get up and running. We're building AR applications right now. AR Core takes everything we learned from Tango and it makes AR available on the phone you have today. No depth cameras or custom special sensors required. AL Core is currently in preview, and we're looking to developers like you to give us feedback on how to make this SDK work for you. And with 2 billion devices out there, we have a huge potential audience for this technology. With AL Core so far running on the Pixel, Pixel XL, and the Galaxy S8, we currently run on millions of devices already. And we're working with manufacturers like Samsung, Huawei, LG, Asus, and others, so that at the end of the preview, we anticipate that we're going to run on 100 million devices. And we're working with these hardware vendors to make this possible with a really consistent bar uh, for quality and high performance in the same way that we did with Daydream. And so before we get into the code, I think it's really, really helpful to understand some of the fundamental concepts behind AR just so you know how AR Core is working under the hood. So there are three main concepts to think about. One is motion tracking. Two is environmental understanding. And three is light estimation. So let's go through them in a little bit of detail now. So to render AR content, you need a virtual camera that matches your physical camera. You render the virtual scene, you composite it with your camera, and you're done. This sounds simple. It's actually really, really hard. Whilst your phone gyroscope is really, really great for rotation, it can drift over time. And whilst your accelerometer is great for those instantaneous inputs, it's not so great to figure out an actual position. So the really hard part of getting AR right is to figure out this translation and rotation of your device in real time 
so that you can render digital objects with the same virtual camera as your physical camera. If you get this wrong, objects in the world will be misaligned with their virtual equivalents. They will swim and jump, and they won't appear properly rooted in the world. And you can see how effective we've done this with AR Core because of this scarecrow who looks just like everyone else queuing for tacos. So to do this, AR Core uses the device's camera and inertial measuring unit uh, to track exactly where your device is in the world using a process called concurrent odometry and mapping, also known as COM. It looks for visually distinct features that can track over successive frames and builds up a point cloud so it can uh, localize against that point cloud. This, combined with that high-frequency IMU data, gives you rotation and translation in the world so you can render your virtual content in exactly the right place. This is over and above other AI experiences you may have tried, which only uses the gyroscope to get a rotation, which has the problem of content sliding around your world and you can't move in closer for a better look. Uh, this is really, really key for anchoring your digital content over the real world. So this illustration is an example of the device tracking feature points in your world and creating a point cloud. But when it does it for real, there's actually a lot more points than just four. So on top of motion tracking, which is really important, uh, environment understanding is also super important. Uh, rendering content isn't actually that interesting by itself. Uh, you need to be able to interact with your world as well. So AR Core is looking for clusters of those feature points that appear to lie on common horizontal surfaces. Uh, and it makes these surfaces available to your app as planes. Since planes are mathematically infinite, uh, AR Core also provides the bounds of these surfaces as a polygon. And you can use this information to place objects in your world like this uh, Android guy here. So planes are detected on horizontal surfaces, such as the floor, tables, kitchen countertops, benches, chairs, you name it. However, because AR Core uses feature points to detect these surfaces, flat surfaces without any texture or highly reflective surfaces might not be detected properly. And then finally, light estimation. So AR Core is able to detect information about the current environment's lighting and gives you a value representing that average intensity of a given camera image. Uh, this information lets you light your scene and your virtual objects under the same conditions as the environment, which increases that sense of realism. If you don't do this, your digital objects will stand out and not appear to be a part of that world, which is really, really key to realistic rendering. And it lets you some really fun effects, like have this lion who gets scared when you turn out the lights. And it might seem frivolous, uh, but it's actually really important. If you've ever taken your camera and just looked at a light source or pointed it out the window, the auto exposure of your camera actually changes that range pretty hugely. So it can be really um, not so great if you don't take this into account. So now we've gone through the main concepts of AirCore, let's jump into some code and see what it takes to build a, an AR application in Java. So this is how I think of the API. You create a session, which represents the AR session that you're running. Once you've got this, you update the session, and it gives you a frame. Once you have a frame, that represents your camera and all the metadata that goes alongside that. Uh, you get planes. And once you have planes, you're able to create anchors. With anchors, you're able to place content in your real world. And our Hello AR app exercises all of those parts on the of uh, the API and is on GitHub and is great to get up and running with this. So going through the code, it's really, really easy to start an AR core session. Just start a session. Uh, we provide a default configuration file, which basically turns on every part of the API, motion tracking, plane finding, light estimation. Simple way to check if your device does not support AR core. And when we come to render our application, uh, first thing we do is clear the frame. And then we simply call session.update. Uh, one of the key concepts to understand here is when you created your session, one of the things you might want to change within your config is whether it's using blocking or latest camera image. If it uses blocking, it basically gives you a frame at the rate at which your camera runs, which 
kind of makes sense. You don't want to render any faster than you have to. Uh, you want to make sure that every pose aligns with every frame. But for some of your applications where you want a really smooth update, you have animations, you might want to just render as fast as you possibly can and at the expense of power and performance. So once you have a frame, we have this helper function, hit test, which helps us to cast a ray into the world based on a touch location and see if you have touched one of these planes. If it collided and the tap was within the bounds of that detected plane, then we create an anchor. And we'll go into anchors in a little bit more detail later. So we also have to see if the, the frame was actually tracking. You know, if you have put your hand in front of the camera or something and you're not tracking, then you want to make sure that your, your intersections are correct. And then you query the frame for all the data that you need to render your objects. And don't worry if you haven't used projection matrices before and you don't know what a view matrix is, that's okay. Uh, as mentioned earlier, to render this AR content, you have to match the field of view of your virtual camera with the field of view of the real camera. The projection matrix contains all of those properties that you need, uh, and you just query AR core to the AR core session to get access to those. And in this example, we set uh, the range of objects that you will render from 10 centimeters to 100 meters. And then the view matrix is what contains all of the information for motion tracking. Uh, that actually contains the pose where the camera is in the world. And then finally, just getting access to the lighting estimation uh, is just a simple accessor call. Once you've got that value, you can either use it for some logic or you can use it to affect your rendering or your lighting. And then finally, we loop over all of our anchors that we've placed in the world, and if they're being tracked, we render those objects. So if the road projection matrix contained the camera properties and the view mat matrix contained the camera location, the model matrix contains the location of that anchor within the world. And with that combined model view projection matrix, you have everything you need to put the pixels on the right place in the screen, properly overlaid on top of your uh, camera feed. So talking about anchors, um, why do we need anchors? What is this concept of an anchor? So you might think, well, it's three-dimensional space. Um, why don't we just call where you start the application, the origin, and place your objects relative to that? So it turns out there's actually some error in the poses you get back from motion tracking. Motion tracking is constantly updating its understanding of the world. And if you use anchors, as this understanding of the world updates, the pose of your models will update as well. A good example where you want to use anchors is imagine walking around a building in a loop. When you get back to where you started, that drift will have accumulated over time, and you really want to use anchors to make sure that that all stays correct. And so if you place an anchor in the world, you should also make sure that you place the digital object on top of that anchor as well. So anytime there is error in that rotation, then the further away that your object is from that anchor, you'll end up with this lever arm effect where like, you're rotating around a pivot that is in the center of the object and it translates off from where it wants to be. And then really think about these anchors uh, are there to root your digital objects to your physical objects in the world. If I was going to place um, an object on a chair, I want to create one anchor for the chair and place the object on the chair. If I want to put 10 objects on my desk, I don't need to create 10 anchors. I should just create one and place them all relative to it. And then, just again, avoid using those global coordinate systems. You'll, you'll have a bad time if you uh, use those. So we kind of skipped over this. Um, apart from clearing the screen, we didn't really talk about rendering 3D. Uh, rendering 3D is actually a really big topic that I couldn't possibly cover in a 30-minute talk here today. But to give you something to um, look at, there are a few options. You can use OpenGL ES directly, and we actually have some great tutorials on how to get started with this on our uh, developer.android.com. Or you can use frameworks such as Rajawali, which does a lot of that heavy lifting for you. Or you can take a look at our Hello AR sample, which actually uh, contains some model loading code and model rendering code as well if you just want to place some objects in your world. So 
not only does AR Core work with Java, it also works with Unity and Unreal, and we've done a lot of work uh, to make sure that it integrates really well. Common game engines like these, they remove a lot of the complexity from managing a complex 3D scene so that you can focus on actually building your application. So we've ported Hello AR into Unity. You can see it there. It exercises all of those same APIs. And we've designed it so that you can easily get up to speed, use those scripts and prefabs in your own application, and it comes as part of the SDK when you download it. And similarly, we have the same for Unreal as well. We've done everything to make building your AR applications really easy using the tools that you're most familiar with. So another option is WebXR. So real web standards for AR don't exist yet. But these prototypes allow web developers to start building augmented reality web experiences today. Their experiments will teach us all what AR on the web could look like, which will hopefully make the real web standards arrive faster and be better designed. These capabilities are built on top of WebVR. So if you're familiar with that, it's really easy to get up and running with WebXR. And this demo that you can see here also works in uh, experimental versions of Chrome for uh, AR Kit as well on iOS. And so we've talked a lot about building AR applications, but the really hard part is how do I get content? We all know how to create content for 2D. We know how to get images, we know how to get text, fonts, videos. We know how to create them, and we know how to use them in our applications. So Google have been working in AR and VR for quite some time, and we've made creating this content really, really easy, which is why we created Blocks. So Blocks lets you build 3D content in VR really quickly, and even if you don't have a VR headset, take a look at our library. Any content tagged as remixable is available for download. So let's take a quick look at some of the content that's, that our creators have built for blocks. So if you want this guy, a ramen chef in your kitchen, that power is now open to you. And if you want this guy to watch over you at night on your bedside table, you can live that dream. It's really, really impressive what people have made using blocks, and it's a super easy way to get 3D content into your application. So I encourage you all to head to our Blocks website, download it, and give it a play. It's really, really fun building this content in VR. So before we finish, I'd love to give you a taster of some of the things that we built in AR Core. So this has been a whirlwind tour of the capabilities of AR Core, and all the information you need to get started is there today on our website. So we've talked about the fundamentals of AR, we've talked about the options you have to build your AR applications, and we've talked about how to build content for those applications. We're actively seeking feedback from developers such as yourselves through this preview phase, and we'll be monitoring our GitHub, GitHub issues and our other channels closely so that we're building a platform that works for what you want to build. So you can see that AR marks the next big shift in what's possible with mobile devices. Get started with the AR Core preview today, 
we really can't wait to see what you build. Thank you.